Aranya, Loho Enagar, that is, give us back the silver past, take away today's cities. So, in order to promote and derive benefits of out of biodiversity, wholesome knowledge on plant biodiversity is essential. On this auspicious day, let us reaffirm our solemn commitment for a sustainable future by protecting nature and its rich resources and the simplest way to protect our nature. The age old Indian civilization is well known for the indigenous knowledge and practices of utilizing the plant resources. So, we also need to conserve, which provides us the scope to understand the plant human interaction. However, no conservation is possible or complete without an inventory of all the species we have amongst us. We know that we have to conserve. What happens when we don't know what to conserve? This is where the Botanical Survey of India plays a pivotal role. Keeping all these in our conscious, in the eve of 75 years of our independence, this national webinar has been organized to retrospect about our past, evaluate the present, and prepare for the future. In these two days' webinar, a series of lectures will be deliberated, for which I am certain we will update our knowledge about the role of BSR in the forestic survey and research and its contribution to the nation. On these notes, May I please welcome all our dignitaries of today's occasion, Professor C. R. Babu, Professor S. K. Barik, Director of NVRI, Professor Jawaharlal Fariyadu, Ex Director NDPGR, Professor S. R. Yadav. We also welcome all the head of officers and scientists staff of various regional centers who already connected with us in this work workshop virtually. I also extend a hearty welcome to all those who have joined with us in the auditorium of CNH BSI physically. Now, may I call upon Dr. Ethel Dash to welcome all our guests and elaborate on today's importance of the webinar, that is, touristic resource in India, contribution of BSI to the nation, present and future. Thank you, Dr. Thai. Thank you for this nice background. Thank you for the nice background for today's function. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the national seminar. This is Forestry Research in India. Contribution of BSI to the nation, the present and future. That is organized by Botanicals of India. In a meeting, uh, it is my extreme pleasure to be here and part of the celebration of 133 Foundation Day of Botanical South India, the Apex Taxonomic uh, Research Institute of the country, under the aegis of uh, Ministry of Forest and Climate Change. Since the last century, the survey is doing an excellent job in the field of plant exploration, taxonomic research, conservation of endangered species, and maintaining of germplasm in its well-defined botanical gardens spread throughout the country. The credits of introduction of uh, tea, cinchona, mayogani, indigo, cotton, or many other highly commercial products of this country is goes to our organization. Many European gardens are highly benefited by this survey since the colonial period. In the past, 75 years of independence, scientists of the survey has discovered more than 1800 new species, new to science, and added a considerable number of species as new record to India. 60 volumes of 25, 25 uh, state floras and 300 books dealing with the various floristic structures of different fragile ecosystems. The entire checklist of vascular plants, the entire checklist of endemic plants of India, the 13 volumes of flora of India have already been published and many more in the pipelines. I am very happy to announce that more than 20 lakhs people visited our website in the last one year for seeking scientific information. This volume speaks itself what this organization means to the scientific fraternity. I understand listing of achievements of this organization is often questionably a Herculean task and cannot be easily quantified. In the last 25, 
in, in, in the 21st century as a witness a paradigm of change in the, in, in the concept of scientific learning, the applied taxonomy, which includes the data from the all sources that includes biogeography, ecology, molecular science, traditional knowledge, and study of the taxonomy become an interdisciplinary subject in first of economic and ecological potentials of plant or on the product development. Any all these contemporary issues, it remains our constant endeavor to accomplish, accomplish the commitment of, of the nation's aspiration and to provide all updated information of holistic diversity. Today, on the occasion of 133 Foundation Day and on the eve of the 75 years of our post independence, we all have congregated here to have a various brainstorming sessions on the role of BSI in a floristic survey and what we look forward to. Very well known figures of botanical fraternity who have to be with us, who will give us a way or help us, help us to pave a path for the futuristic research. On behalf of Optical South India, it is a proud privilege to extend hearty welcome and express sincere gratitude to Professor C. R. Babu, Professor Emeritus and the Founder Director of the Center of Environment Management of Degraded Ecosystem and School of Environmental Studies, University of Delhi, for accepting our invitation as guest of honor in spite of his ill health. Sir, your participation has not only boosted our moral but will act as a catalyst for us to strive to do better in expand our capacity to pursuit of excellence. On behalf of the entire congregation, I welcome Professor Asar Yadav, Sivan University Kolapur, for accepting our invitation to give a keynote address, sir, your constant support and keen interest on the well-being of this organization have well taken and well noted and you always encourage us. I extend my hearty welcome to Professor Jawan Lal Khyayadu, former coordinator Asian Pacific Consortium of Agriculture Biotechnology, the former director in charge of the ICR NPPGR New Delhi for dressing this inaugural ceremony for the national seminar today. We always be inspired with his words of wisdom and indebted to uh, your continuous knowledge, sharing and guidance. I welcome Professor S.K. Bari, Director, CSI and BRI, for agreeing to deliver lead lecture in the technical session in spite of which schedule. Your association has always been eventful, enriching and empowering with experiences. Your exemplary character of unassuming nature and ex expertise have always shown and guided us. I welcome Professor A.K. Pandey, Vice Chancellor and former Professor Delhi University, Mansur Global University, Bhopal, who readily agreed to deliver lead lecture in the technical session of tomorrow's uh, event. Sir, your vast experience in the field of plant taxonomy, floristics, evolutionary biology, more particularly knowledge sharing in the phylogeny needs no adoration. I also welcome all the head of the offices of Botanical South India, and the regional centers, the scientists, staffs of the regional centers who are virtually connected with us in the seminar. I also welcome to all the speakers, participants from universities, students to this national seminar. I hope their participation, thoughtful, insight will be a hallmark as the day will progress. Ladies and gentlemen, and my dear friends, once again on behalf of DSI, I welcome you all. I am sure we all are going to enrich ourselves a lot in the seminar where learning combines with sharing experience and knowledge. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your kind words. Now, I would like to request our director, sir, to speak a few words and brief the occasion of 133rd Foundation Day of Botanical Survey of India. It's a happy birthday to BSI. You see, as Dr. Das has already introduced the purpose of this two days seminar, national seminar, I have also the 
we are also celebrating the 133 publishing day of botanical survey of, it, of India. We all know the importance of botanical survey of, it, of India. I am really happy that today our well wishes that of which Professor Artis uh, Dr. Das has read out the names of the professor and all the guests who have joined with us and when we requested them, you were ready to participate and give a talk on the role of BSI for the coming years. You see, already we know that we are BSI has been existing for 133 years. And after independence day, it is already uh, independence after independence of India, it is already 75 years. It's a long time now. And if we look back and examine or really introspect ourselves, what we have achieved so far today, and what are the things to do? still to be done. This is what we wanted to discuss about me in this two days of lesson seminar. And I'm sure all the presenters will be in line with it for the future plan. You see, I what I feel is that we can do it so many things together. What is happening is that somewhere we have in the management, and it, and it, frankly speaking, I must admit that we have been a bit weak in the management. That is why we could not put our house in order. And that is the reason so many things we could not achieve, which we should have achieved. This is what I, though this is a two-day seminar, I'm just talking about the things which we have the weakness also and we have the strength. You see, we have the highest number of trained taxonomists in the country. Or not only in the country, in the whole world also maybe as a department. That is our strength. But we also have the weakness in our own department. What is the weakness is that, I mean, Many of us, who I feel, many do not feel the ownership or the accountability of what you are doing. What you are doing. We do. Many of us do not have the accountability or ownership for the department. That is the reason why we will not achieve our target in many ways. Therefore, I would like to request all the scientists that we should have. Uh, let us look back and take it that this is our department, that we should have an ownership and accountability for whatever we are doing. I feel we can do it because in the last three years, what we have achieved, if I'm to say, of course that is not achieved in the last three years alone. That is the work done in the last 75 years or 133 years in that culmination of that accumulation of all that work, we have been able to put up in the last three years also you can see just uh, we have brought out the, the whole checklist of flora of India that is understood which is one of the great achievements because in that, the total adjustment flora has been now it is available in the website also, as well as in a, uh, this uh, hard bound book also. So, which is a very a great achievement. And then also, you see, just uh, Dr. Das has also mentioned about the website. The website today, that also is a great achievement, I could say. We should have been done long time back, but of course we have done now. I'm very happy that is not that we have, uh, uh, not that we may have uh, somebody has done, but that is with the cooperation of all of 
all of you. If kids were able to put into proper shape, and we were able to achieve, and we were able to light our website in a proper way. I'm not saying that we have not done it earlier. Earlier also the website has been prepared, but now I think that is far better, and it is now up to the standard, I can say. And only uh, this looking at the visitors to the website, I'm extremely very happy to see because last year 2020, 2021 itself, about uh, 20 lakhs people have visited, which is a really big number. And then also just see last month in January itself, one lakh five thousand or more people have visited which shows that our website is very popular. So that is what that is, is a very great achievement. I know also, if you look at the other thing which we have put up in the website now, the digital flora, uh, this uh, flora is coming, these uh, flora we have put up, that is what about the flora of India published, the nine volume is already there in the flora. Then the checklist is already there. Then the uh, Biasa archive in the in, uh, paintings, then, uh, that is the botanical illustration, natural dyes, then textile design, and all these are there. And now I have been receiving a lot of appreciation, a lot of letters, uh, a lot of email. People are commenting on the, on the uh, this website, especially the e archive, and the I mean, they appreciate it so much. So that gave us really, I mean, it's really happy to with that. So therefore, here now, we have only the plan to complete the flora of India, all the volumes, by 2023. I mean, 2023, yes. That is now only next year we are supposed to complete. Of course, I think it is not uh, difficult, will be able to be, because most of the manuscript has come to us, and now the, we, our team of editors are already working hard and editing, and now it is almost completing. So many of these will be going to press soon, then the story we, we plan by this year, by March, we are expecting to complete at least few volumes of pub uh, published, but there are some uh, technical problem is that that is a, uh, a drop, I mean that is the thing which we are trying to work out, uh, but otherwise it is uh, almost ready. And then also, what I would like to do is that once we complete the floor of India, that is not it. Oh, that, oh, then many people are asking me, what will we do? And somebody, some of the people are scared. Then we have have nothing to do. Then what? Uh, then uh, the importance of the uh, office of uh, Biasa will come down. I don't think that is right. You see, we have more and more responsibilities. After the, you know, after the coming assignment of the CBD. Conference on biodiversity, uh, the same. You have seen that more responsibility has come to CSR. We need to do a lot of things. And now we have documented all these things based on the data which we have got 75 years ago, or the that 133 years of collection. And, but this many of this data need to be reassessed. We need to revise or we need to revisit all those data and find out the exact status of this or all the plan. Now, many of these plans, whether they are still available or what is the status in the population, all this we need to do reassessment of all our biodiversity or the plant diversity in the country. Therefore, so much work is there. Right now, we have put up in the e flora checklist for unjust farm, 21,000 plus. 
But whether they are all there or not, that also we need to assess. Or if we assess properly, I'm sure it will go up also. So that is why all these things are need to be done. Then again, many of the plants, the status, many of these rare endangered or RED species, what we call it, these need to be reassessed or we should uh, assess the rare status, the proper status. Otherwise, right now, we do not know exactly the status of many of these plants. And then also about the economic plan. Many of the medicinal plant or wild economic plants, here also we have to collect and conserve. Exit to conservation will be one of the most important role to be played by BSI. That also we have to see into it. Because conservation is, I mean, conservation is very important now. We have seen the climate change and one of all the, in recent years, so many things happening like wild forest fire, gel flood, and then all the pandemic like the COVID 19. So many things are there. Therefore, it is our duty and it is our. Uh, we are. We have to work hard to conserve our plant resources of our biodiversity in the country for the future use. That's why we have a lot of role to play in that. And also, we need to look into the distribution of all this uh, all, of all the plants in our country. Right now, the distribution status. I think we have not worked much properly. We need to work on that, that thing also. Then we also need to apply the modern uh, tools, especially molecular taxonomy or molecular tools for our taxonomic studies also. Right now, mostly we are doing with that own conventional method, but uh, we need to complement with this uh, the, with the modern technology also, so that we can make a better understanding of our this, uh, uh, plant resources. So and especially also this um, the astronomical status, because many are control there are a lot of controversies there, a lot of difficulties uh, in understanding or identifying. So this thing we need to use the modern tools to edit a, uh, a better picture and understanding of these plants. You see, I would like to request from all my scientists of my staff from Botanical Survey of India. We need to work together. We need to understand each other and work together. I know there are some difficulties because we all are not the same. Everybody has a different view, everybody has a different thought, maybe like that. But as a department, we should work as a team. What I have observed in, the, uh, in recent time is that we have, from our, among ourselves also, we have a lot of differences and a lot of, lot of controversies are arising among our own uh, people. So that should not be the case. We should try to understand each other, work together, and then work out the problem, whatever problem we have uh, together, so that we don't face that kind of criticism from each other or it should not go out from the department because it gives a bad name for the department as well. So that's why I would like to request all of you that let us work for the betterment of the department and also for the country so that we can contribute maximum for the benefit of our people, for our country. So this is what I would like to say or just to you or in this, uh, in my address, I would like to just remind you all this thing. So that, uh, thank you so much for giving me time. And now, I would like to read out the uh, Professor Sierra Babu's uh, address for today's meeting. You see, I must thank Professor Sierra Babu so, for his constant support to botanical surveys of, of India. He is one of the 
well wisher of their side, I every time, whenever I meet him, he always talk about BSI and he always speak about BSI and he tells what we should do and what is the progress today where within our department is very much uh, concerned about the department and always willing to contribute for the benefit of the country. So, I, I mean, he understands the importance of this botanical survey in India. The role played by botanical survey of India. So that's why he has a very close attachment to our department. Um, I'm sorry that if he could not uh, present his speech due to ill health, we wish him get well soon so that we can, uh, I mean, in the next meeting or so, he can be with us and let's all pray for him. So, I'll just read his uh, address or the, his message for us today. See, he has put the uh, thing he has put fast in the question. What we expect BSI to become in 2035 or 2047? So that is the question he uh, he has put forward. Let us let us all think of it. Let, uh, what we expect BSI to become in 2025, probably 2047, because our next uh, that vision plan up to 2047 is given. So, but that, that is why he has uh, given this talk. Let us think about it. BSI is a premier research and development organization in the country and is perhaps perhaps one of the oldest scientific organizations of the British colonial time. Realizing the enormous land resources of the country, the British officers started inventorying land resources which formed the basis of economic development of the subcontinent. The, pro uh, the byproduct of the activities of, of these activities are huge database on plant resources of the country, development of harboring, and taxonomy of Indian plant. You see, many times, I think many of us do not understand this, but the Britishers understand the value of these plant resources. So when they came, you know, they have come not just to help us, they came to acquire or accumulate wealth or resources from this country and take back to uh, this European, uh, you are to back to England. But then, they have not just come just to take over whatever is available, but they have with a long term vision, they okay? came not for 10 years, 20 years, but they planned for 100, 200 years. So that they, when they came, they did all this, because of that they started this, uh, uh, collecting all this, uh, I mean, this uh, activities they started. So that's why today we are having because of them, all these things. So that Sir Robert Kidd was the founder, director of, uh, founder of BSI, and was established in the year 1890, that we all know about it. After independence, the then Prime Minister of, of India, Jawaharlal Nehru, brought Dr. Janaki Amal from Cambridge University to reorganize the BSI, and she became the officer on special duty of, of, for BSI. The reorganized BSI has made strong foundation for R&D in taxonomic research, discovered many new taxa, brought out, uh, brought out local district and state floras and floras of India has taken up. Besides applied providing inventors to research and experimental taxonomic approach, which of course this uh, Dr. Uh, das has already highlighted in, the, in his uh, uh, this uh, introduction 
what he has already done in the flora, uh, floristic world. With the signing of International Convention on Biological Diversity, the BSS role has become more widened and interested to it the job of capacity building in taxonomy link uh, conservation of biological diversity. The present BSI is under the Ministry of Environment and Forest and Climate Change, Government of India, and providing the necessary data based on plant resources for sustainable utilization, undertaking activities needed for meeting the international convention and capacity building in taxonomic link conservation. So, here in this, you all understand, you all know the importance of BSI has widened. Why? Because for any conservation, without under, understanding the taxonomy, without understanding the component of what plants are there in that uh, particular area, how can you conserve? How can you do the sustainable development or sustainable uh, thing? So that is why the role of our department becomes very important. We need to uh, work hard and to fulfill, uh, we need to work hard to fulfill this uh, a task given to us by the government of India. So that is the thing which is uh, required. So what will, of uh, what BSM will do by 2025 or 2047? Does it continue with the present activities? Should we continue like what we are doing today, or should we change? That is what he uh, is asking. Does it shape some of the activities that met this target? See, some of the target we have already achieved, where we say. So should we keep it away, or do it away and uh, not uh, work uh, on, on it? That is the thing which we should do. Uh, does it take up uh, does it take up new responsibilities? Should we stop or should we keep away those uh, the one the activity or which we have already achieved or which we have been doing and take up a new responsibility? That is we have to decide what is the best for the department and for the country. So that is what he's, uh, he is uh, he has put the question. What kind of new responsibilities? It will take up. So, what should we take up? What kind of new responsibility? That is what he, uh, uh, he has put for this question. And then he has given some suggestions like uh, the following suggestions. I suggest the following for BSI to meet the challenges ahead. One, taxonomy and taxonomies are critical in identification and classification of organisms that are continue to change and evolve to adapt to ever-changing environment. For example, the identification and classification of different variants of COVID-19 is the best example, what he has said. So therefore, that's what the role of taxonomy is very important. Many people don't understand and they say, what is taxonomy? What is, uh, this is nothing. But it is not. This is the most important or the basic uh, thing which one should understand first. Then only we can understand the other thing. Without knowing this basic thing, all the data or best baseline data, we cannot uh, go ahead. That is what. So that uh, and also without identification, how can you go about? This is what you need to see. So, the BSI should continue to uphold the key for continuous updating of the data on plant resources. This would not only help in sustainable utilization of resources, their conservation, and fulfill and also fulfill countries' obligation for international convention. You see, that is why we sometimes some people think that we should. So, I mean, if we complete the flora of India, what will we do? This is what you mean to say that the, the documentation or the study of flora is, is not an, uh, is a never ending 
Yeah. It is good. It will go on. Because we need to keep on updating. We need to keep on the updating the status, the population, everything. You see the human due to human activities, the ecosystem or the environment is changing so much. And, and under this condition, plants of the biodiversity is affected so much. And that is why we should be responsible for looking into all aspects and keeping updates for the country and inform the policy makers and for all for the public uh, so that proper conservation measures can be taken. Otherwise, if we don't do that, how will people know which, which is to be conserved, which is to be taken care? So that is the inclusion of he is trying to say that. We have said continue to provide leaders in, in capacity building in taxonomy and conservation of biodiversity. So that is our role again. Today, of course, we are doing this taxonomy uh, capacity building, we are giving training to students, researchers, and all the We need to do this thing. Because we, if we don't do this, who will do? You see, in our country, many of the universities or others, they are not teaching taxonomy, or they don't have any botany as a subject also. And uh, many, uh, we don't see many uh, university offering of taxonomy or training taxonomies. So we are supposed to be responsible. We should take up this task uh, the responsibility and we should try to continue uh, training youngsters because in the coming years, so if we don't train today, who will train and how will they become expert in taxonomy? That's what is, uh, this is very important for us. Set up centers that will have molecular tools and best expert for assessing species complexes and understanding of evolutionary, evolutionary trade in major taxonomy group. And this is what, of course, we are also going for. So we are also setting up molecular lab already. Here in series also we are setting up. And then also, uh, also these uh, other places, Shillong, we have set up already. Then you know, this, um, uh, Western Regional Center in uh, Pune also already started. So again, other, so other regional centers also will do that. But we need to have a strong unit in one place, one center of excellence for this purpose. And you see, our main focus will be on the taxonomy, molecular taxonomy, not on a other aspect. Because here, the, the species complex need to be resolved with using molecular tools. This is what is very important. And today, what many new species and you know, that lot of confusion and uh, uh, all this thing, it can be in many ways resolved by these molecular molecular tools because which we cannot resolve by this morphology or the or this classical. Uh, Taxonomy. So that is why very important. And also, it will give us a better understanding of the evolution of the plant group. So that is why this is uh, very important. So which we have to go over it. Mapping of plant resources at the landscape level using drone technology. The drone technology is useful in monitoring the biodiversity at the uh, landscape level. And this is again very important for us. We should also uh, we have to take up this thing because when we are surveying plant in a particular area or in an area, we cannot many times we cannot see the whole or uh, visit the whole area and see the whole thing. So that way, this strong technology by uh, this thing, it is going to be very useful. But uh, this will complement. It will be a complementary to our uh, survey work, field work. So that will be very, at least we need to look into it and we need to do that. We need to take up. So uh, it is a use of computational biology for predicting the biomolecules that can be useful as drug. See, uh, Piazza has been documenting the ethnobotany of the medicinal plant for the last so many years. But we have just only published, or we have just Documented. But now we need to go, go a further far, far step by doing all these things or, or this uh, uh, 
biomolecules or this bioprospecting, we need to take up this thing also. I then, of course, we may not go for that um, drugs making, but then we can um, do this, and that can be um, the people, the pharmaceutical company, or the research, uh, other research unit can make use of the result. Use of ecological models for predicting the distribution pattern of plant resources. That is that needs modeling, modeling of this thing is become today it is very important in ecosystem study or ecology studies. And uh, many of these RT species, this is going to be very helpful because it, uh, the predictive, uh, uh, predicting of the distribution based on these uh, data. That is going to be very important and we need to do because in our uh, this uh, RT species or IUCN or whatever we are going to study. This is going to be very useful. So we have to adopt this. Of course, we have already started, our people have already started working with it, but we need to scale up in a larger scale. And this is what is what we need to be done in the coming years. Then only our data, our uh, information will be up to date and will be at par with the, uh, this international level also. So, and the last thing which he suggests is conservation of threatened plants and ecosystem by establishing botanic garden and biodiversity park, but also genomic and uh, public DNA plus gene libraries. This we need to also establish. So of course we have the conservation of this uh, uh, plant, uh, plant, threatened plant in garden, botanic garden, and we have uh, the ministry has the ABG scheme is there, which we need to uh, uh, scale up, that is uh, the, right now the, uh, the, uh, the scheme is very small, but it need to be in, uh, uh, make it bigger, scheme, uh, larger, so that we can, we can take a more, uh, I mean, conservation of RET plant, and of course, uh, ecosystem uh, that is uh, the, the ministry with the data with the conservation in situ, uh, we can play a role in the ex situ conservation of all of these plant species. And then also this, uh, uh, of course, this once we have the uh, DNA molecular lab, proper lab, we can go for this genomic and DNA libraries and all those things, which can, we can, our people can uh, collaborate and establish this as a team. This is what he look forward for BSI in the coming years, 2025 or 2047. BSI should do work on this aspect. This is what he has, uh, 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 I mean, it, that is his vision plan for our uh, for botanical survey of India. Once again, I thank Professor Sierra Babu for sparing his valuable time to put into writing about uh, uh, the future plan of botanical survey of India. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for your kind words. I will also thank Professor Sia Babu to deliver, to convey his message on the key note, what we expect from BSI in 2035 the mission of speedy recovery. Now, well, let me invite our next guest of honor, Professor Esai Yadav, who is currently Professor at the Department of Botany, Shivaji University, Kolhapur. He has been awarded 17 awards, including E.K. Janati Amal Award, Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. Six species of plant names are named in his honor. He has described 64 new taxa. He is also a member of IAAP, DSP, SCRB, BNHS, IUCN, and various other professional bodies or societies. I would now like to request Professor S. R. Yadav to enrich us with his valuable lecture on this occasion. Thank you very much for a brief introduction, and uh, we should concentrate on our uh, main job. First of all, I am thankful to Dr. Mao, Dr. Dash for organizing this function. And secondly, the speakers, Professor C.R. Babu, Barik, and uh, our uh, Karuhal, 
who are very well learned people who will be ta- uh, already we have listened about what professor babu wants us to do and uh, uh, i mean bsi uh, i take bsi as a you know temple for me since i am a student from that time i have for me what is a temple bsi is temple for me and probably every for every student of botany bsi becomes a temple and you know bsi what is a bsi bsi is our highest organization which provides leadership in taxonomy and its role in nation building is a great role i need not to emphasize what is the role it has played already played already lot of work has been done and uh, it is a department which is a service providing department you know for the entire country and biodiversity is a probably the most essential part of our life and bsi is the especially plants and bsi which does many kinds of work so it is a multi dimensional work which bsi is doing one thing exploration our bsi scientists with like this they explore they document they compile and that way that their contribution for uh, contributing to the documentation of biodiversity and uh, another uh, this uh, conservation in various ways they have played an important role in conservation especially you know all botanical gardens which are now supported in the country bsi has taken responsibility to support them and that way ex situ conservation of especially those plants which need ex situ conservation that care is also taken by bsi with the help of other organizations it does not work isolated it works with universities colleges and other organizations and that way try to see that maximum biodiversity is con- uh, conserved uh, similarly bsi has made significant contributions in you know they published uh, initially that is a uh, uh, i mean uh, uh, red plants uh, endangered plant species that book which become basis for all other workers and then only people started working on endemic endangered and threatened species so there that original contribution which made the entire country to work i mean universities and colleges they have lot of great strength of students and bsi becomes a leader for us to go ahead with our work similarly the documentation of our traditional uses of plants in that also bsi has done significant contributions and uh, capacity building you know i am also a part of that uh, program and i know bsi has tried to uh which is a need of the time to build capacity in taxonomy you know field identifications or classical taxonomy is a service providing taxonomy other things are of academic interest see evolutionary trees phylogenetic trees they are not of much use to the common man common man needs country needs basic knowledge about plants where they grow how they grow what are their uses and this is the provided by bsi it is services i never underestimate that role of bsi which is done by uh, this then another global strategy for plant conservation in that also our bsi has done wonderful contributions and if we want to implement cbd articles without by i mean data created by taxonomist and especially bsi we cannot go ahead so i can talk lot about the contributions made by bsi in the past presently also they are contributing significantly but sometimes some people you know underestimate bsi which is not a right thing it is our national organization which is doing wonderful work now i will go to my presentation that in addition to whatever professor babu has said in next i mean people have said i know there was a discussion once bsi publishes flora what work they will do they have tremendous amount of work to be done it is not the end publishing flora is not the end of work and there are many new avenues which will open for bsi after publishing our floras 
and one of that avenue i will be discussing today of course there are other speakers who can who will be contributing there are there is a molecular biology there is a ethnobotany there are so many modern branches of botany so those uh, i think uh, i may be allowed to uh, present now okay so i don't know whether uh, is it uh, visible my slides are visible hello hello no no sir uh, some no, something i have to do no sir it's not visible not visible no? ha present now entire screen then uh, share 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 no it does not come share does not come Once again, I will do. Even the entire screen, sir. The entire screen, yes. 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 Ah, uh, now is it a? Uh, uh, yes, coming, coming. Ah, yes, coming. No? Right, very well, right. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. uh, now it is seen. So I will be giving one small aspect, which uh, I I feel that there is a great uh, scope in this field of uh, this in this branch. now you know biosystematics in our country we we go for molecular studies we try to understand species but really if you want to understand species it will not be possible with only dna sequences studying species in nature it's a behavior it's a i mean a crossability that gives a real picture of any species and from that angle although we have tremendous amount of plant diversity we have not done much work or almost there is no work on this branch so biosystematics much neglected most needed discipline in systematics which our botanical survey of india with the help of other organizations like universities colleges they can take up and really understand species now aim of biosystematics is to delimit the natural biological units now you know many people publish new species uh and you know uh i ask them what is a species you please tell me what is species most of the workers they are not able to answer my question when they are describing new species without knowing what is a new species how they justify their statement or their new species this is my question as a teacher and uh, then uh, many students phd doing phds and publishing eight ten new species and when i ask them basic question what is species they get trembled they don't they are not able to uh, answer the question because they have not read about what is species some variations you know in population some variations they find and they describe species does it stand as a distinct species and that kind of training we need to give to our students and to our taxonomists so to delimit the natural biological units is one important part another was to apply these units to the task of conveying precise information regarding their defined limits relationships variability and dynamic structure thus the critical data from comparative morphology it needs classical studies cytology today in india almost cytology very few people are seen then genetics and ecology when applied to organic evolution make biosystematics but these are time consuming processes but they really they give you right idea about species and that's why i have selected this topic for our today's uh, what bsi should do in next uh, next 10 or 20 years so bio bio systematic uses the group concept based on reproductive isolation of course we are a taxonomist 
and uh, reproductive isolation has given more importance in cytology but it is equally important for taxonomies because unless there is a reproductive isolation morphological discontinuity cannot exist and therefore these aspects have to be understood by our students uh, structure but does not attempt to name groups in the formal taxonomic unit biosystematics is regarded as further extension of class classical taxonomies and you know i love classical taxonomies and that is a real service providing uh, branch of biology so methods simple methods one is you know our uh, methods in biosystematics that structural information or morphology another one is the cytology third one is the genetics where we do hybridization experiment and fourth one is cultivating these plants under same climatic conditions now these are the four things one has to do but really if we want to understand species there is no absolutely there is no other way than biosystematics now you see we have biosystematic categories like ecofins environmental conditions make uh, same species it shows different morphology but genetically they are same ecotype now many ecotypes are described as a new species in our uh, area because some some character which is fixed genetically and that is maintained under cultivation also or that is maintained but they freely cross and they produce fully fertile hybrids we don't consider ecotypes as a species unfortunately many such species are described then eco species is equivalent to species which have some capacity to hybridize but they hybrids are partially sterile or they are sterile so that is an eco sino species is a up to uh, approximately genus where process do not take place so this is what uh, is the background and uh, cytology in relation to taxonomy we are doing database on chromosome numbers on uh, archegoniate and vascular plants of our country a dbt project and you know you all will surprise even 40% plant only in 40% plants chromosome numbers are reported 60% plant species are the chromosome number is yet to be reported so you can see the tremendous amount of uh, work in cytology which cytologists need to do but that data is not and that gives a real you know evolutionary they are of great evolutionary significance if you want to understand limitation i mean limits to delimit genera genera family and so on so these they exist in huge number species now question is what is species one thing species is a concept and a product of each individual's judgment so we have to be very sound if i make some statement please don't take it other way uh, many times such a paper species are published and then we get bad name at international level so we have to be very serious about our own work you have to be very confident about your own work why species are so important they exist in huge number is not important that can each species differ from all others in morphology and other characters and finally the most important they represent an important level of integration in living nature and therefore species are very important it is a basic unit in taxonomy and an inventory of species of animals and plants of the world is the baseline for further research in biology why it is so important every biologist works with species or part of species so this is a thing uh, linnaeus believed in constancy of species while darwin believes in variations or overlapping and ever changing nature of species and that way you know you get confused and uh, darwin already has said one sentence in determining whether a form should be ranked as a species or a variety the opinion of naturalist having sound judgment and wide experience seems the only guide to follow see this is a very important a variety i mean opinion of naturalist having sound judgment and wide experience seems 
the only guide to follow. Now our uh, researchers, especially in universities, when they go to the field, they have little experience of variations, populations, and they find some difference, little difference, and go for new species. Of course, describing new species is a, a predictable, but when it is merged, really it is not a, a, a good thing. So species concept, it is a concept. There are several concepts of species, and we have typological concept of species or morphological concept of species, which is based on discontinuity of the characters. And another is biological concept, which we cannot test in the nature. We cannot describe species based on biological concept. We have to use that practical approach of typological concept of species. And both, really speaking, they overlap with each other. Now, now cytological character, chromosome numbers, morphology of chromosome, behavior of chromosomes during meiosis, accessory chromosomes, crossability, species delimitation. These are important characters. And during my 35 years of uh, work, I have done some little work. I am not a cytologist. I am a, really speaking, I'm a taxonomist, field taxonomist, that too. And, you know, some examples I am giving where these things one can understand very easily. For example, you know, uh, Ledborea, Lediboria, then Dremia, Dipcadi, Epigenia, Aponegeton, Chlorophyton, Glyco, Glypocloa, Pancratium, Amorphopolis, and number of other species, uh, genera I can tell you, but let us go to one genus, that is Ledborea, which has only, uh, which has 59 species world over. Now, how many species are there in India? Right from my student life, I am greatly confused with taxonomic literature. Now, you know, from India, this uh, Ledborea viridis, which was described, Ledborea carnaticensis, recently described, Ledborea hyderabadensis, Ledborea regulata. Now, this is, a, you know, exactly when I go to the nature, when I see in various parts of the country these populations, I see tremendous diversity in them. Tremendous diversity within population. Then, now, now we have come to the conclusion, I mean, it is concluded by some foreigner that in India there is only one species which exists, that is Ledborea rehulata. Now, why it happened? And then we should be very careful. You see, these are the names. And definitely any students, MSc student, PhD student, will get confused with this. Sila hyacinthiana, Sila viridis, Sila viridis, Sila uh, Ledborea viridis, Ledborea junarensis, Ledborea carnaticensis, Ledborea hyderabadensis. Now you tell me so many names are there that to for one taxa, sometimes they are recognized, sometimes they are not recognized in some pluras and students get confused with this. Let us see this case and now, now I am showing you, you know, Ledborea, uh, these are the polymorphism in Ledborea regulata. I am going to show you my field observations, our field observations, and you will realize where we, we need to concentrate. First of all, when we go to cytology, in this Ledborea, which occurs in India, there are four cytotypes, at least 30, 45, 60, and 90. So these are the cytotypes. They are usually atopolyploidy we see in this, and uh, Ledborea rehulata, uh, we have bulbils, uh, propagation through bilbils, propagation to seeds, and there are many other things we can. Now you tell me, this is a slide, you can see, and you tell me, I can describe each form as one distinct species, because there are so many differences on this vegetative character. You see this blotching, non blotching pattern and say uh, I mean size of the variants you know local populations within populations also we get so much variations you see this this all I have grown at my house and then only I am telling you what is the truth some leaves are one feet long some leaves are only uh, some five centimeter in length some leaves are very broad some leaves are very narrow now if student 
sees it, definitely he will be tempted to describe as a new species. Does they stand as a new species? What are they? Then question comes, what are they? Right, now you see this whole, uh, uh, this one. Now I will tell you, a Ledboria rihulata, which has 2n is equal to 30, which is a diploid species, which produces seeds, it grows in plains, and you can see this profuse flowering. So this is Ledboria leaf. Then, uh, it produces seeds, nice seeds. Then, this is Ledboria rihulata. See the leaves. This is from Panjigani Plateau. You see the, all of them have 2n is equal to 30 and they reproduce by seeds. Then, this is Lenturia rihulata uh, uh, population. You see this, you can see the bunch of leaves, I mean the bunch of plants. Definitely they are through vegetative propagation. You see these leaf tips, they are with bulbils. And you see the chromosome 2n is equal to 45. It is a triploid. And on this triploid we find many tubers. Now if somebody feels they flower also, they will describe it as a new species which has already happened by even a well-known taxonomist. Uh, see Ledboria, you can see these bulbils, right? And now you see Ledboria regulata which has 2n is equal to 45. It is a triploid, autotetra, a triploid. So many things we can. Now, Rajapur, we collected one population which reproduces by bulbils also and leaves are about 1 feet in length. So these are ecological, uh, not ecological, variation, population variations. So this I have shown you. And now you see third form. This, you know, um, uh, Divaghat, we collected this population and you see this blocking pattern, but it has 2n is equal to 60. And it produces some seeds, some seeds. So this is a 60. And then you see this Badami, in the same population, you get triploids and tetraploids. You see the leaves, okay, and uh, variations within. And now you see this Badami population. Leaves are very narrow, almost only 2-3 millimeter in width. And that way you get great variations. Now, if I want, I can publish this as a new species, okay, because narrow leaves and other characters. But I never... My mind, my conscious never said that it stands as a distinct species. Okay. So you see, this is from Badami and chromosome 2n is equal to 45. Also, we get 2n is equal to 60. So this is a, uh, these are the things which I have shown. And this is Ledboria Rivulata from Junnari area. This has very long leaves and chromosome number is 90. 2n is equal to 90. So I have shown you in Ledboria how much variations within population within the entire peninsular India occur. And each population seems to be very distinct. Then what are those? So these, I take them as a local races. Okay, in speciation or in biosystematics, uh, this local, uh, this is, they are specializing. When we grow them under cultivation, also, they maintain the differences, but we have, at least I have not done hybridization experiment and that way, these should be treated, you know, see this Rivulata, 45, 30, 60, 90, these are the chromosomes which we have seen and uh, even meiosis we studied, meiotic abnormalities we studied, of course, we need a very good cytologist who can really interpret the things, right? And if they are auto ploids. So anyway, cytology data, I will not go. Now you see, when I try to correlate how they grow, I mean, see, this is the Western hearts if you take. So these populations, usually they are tetra, uh, triploids, 2n is equal to 45. When you come to plains, you get 2n is equal to 30. This is a diploid. And when you go to extreme dry regions in central Maharashtra or peninsular India, we get 60 chromosomes, we get 90 chromosomes also in these western hearts. So these populations are adapted to different climatic zones, okay, and they just represent variants of 
single species that is uh, uh, lead boria regulata. This is my conclusion of 30 years. It takes long time, but really real understanding of uh, any species takes long time. Now let us go to genus Dipcadi. Now Dipcadi is another genus which originated in Africa. And if you want to identify Dipcadi, I challenge anyone. It will be very difficult to identify some of the species or distinguish some of the species from each other. Of course, there are few, like you see, uh, Dipcadi concanens has very long white flowers you can very easily identify. Dipcadi govens also you can very easily identify. But Dipcadi saxorum, serotinum, minor, then our uh, Montana, then our Ursuli, they, the characters overlap. And we get confused with reference to identity of the species. So these are bulbous plant. You see now these chromosomes. There is one series which has 2 n is equal to 12, 12, 12. This uh, concanens, govens, saxorum, serotinum. They have chromosome 2 n is equal to 12. Minor, ursuli, montana. These have chromosome numbers 20. Now evolution of this species also, this chromosome data, chromosome morphology and hybridization experiment will help us. And you see this sub-metacentric chromosomes are found only in this uh, species which have 2n is equal to 20. Okay, 2n is equal to 20, they have these chromosomes. Now this uh, Dipcadi erythrium, which, is, which grows in Rajasthan, which has 22 chromosomes. We have tested it for not less than 20 times from uh, collecting them from Rajasthan and these chromosome remains constant. Now the question is, see this, we can see the in Indian uh, Dipcadis, we can see uh, three uh, cyt uh, cytotypes, uh, not cytotypes, chro base, uh, chromosome numbers, concanens, govens, saxorum, serotinum, these have two, 2 n is equal to 12. Minor, Montanum and Ursuli have 20. They are found in Maharashtra and Vinvestana. Erythrium is found in Rajasthan, it has 22. Okay, this is a distribution. Now, question is, Serotinum is also described from Europe. It is also reported from India. Really, do you, uh, really whether Dipcadi Serotinum occurs in India? This is a question for us. Serotinum, whatever world reports we have seen, in that chromosome number is reported 16. Our serotinum, which we collected from Delhi side, it has 12. So does it occur in India? It is reported. So I am confused. People have reported, but I am confused whether that serotinum is a distinct species or it is only a saxorum. We don't know. Similarly, these populations remain isolated or uh, reproductively isolated in nature, you can see some plants, some species have fragrant, fragrant flowers, some species have foul smell, and some species have mild fragrant, some species are odorless. That means in nature, stratification of pollinators takes place and therefore these populations remain isolated. If probably if we cross them, they may cross and produce fertile hybrids, we don't know. So this is about, I wanted to tell you about genus uh, Dipcadi. You can see this Dipcadi genus and the chromosome series. Saxorum and Serotinum, this, there are no morphological differences I have seen. One population is in uh, Delhi, another is in Western Ghat, Canary Caves. But you know, this Saxorum uh, flowers in uh, July, August, or a serotinum flowers now, February, March, in Delhi region. So, at least reproductively, temporal isolation is seen in that. Okay, now, uh, if we take this Dipcadi distribution, this is uh, our erythrium, this is what we call serotinum, may not be serotinum, and most of the species are concentrated in this uh, 
वेस्टर्न घाट स्पेशली नॉर्दर्न वेस्टर्न घाट विच सीम टू बी सेंटर फॉर डाइवर्सिफिकेशन ऑफ ट्राइब सीली और हाई सिंथेसि इन इंडिया सो दीज आर दंक्लूजन्स वी डिव एंड दैट वे वन शुड डू सो आउट ऑफ एट स्पेसिंग of dipkadi four are endemic to this region and uh, 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 neighboring region and maharashtrensis which was described which does not stand as a distinct species now i come to another interesting story all of you i think bsi people must be knowing this story genus dripmia in india uh, how much confusions we made now you see this first species which is described by hooker dremia polyphyla now dremia polyphyla i i searched for 35 years was because i was doing some cytology i could not locate it does you uh, does it mean that it became extinct answer i don't know in 100 years where it can become extinct and when with this modern tools like our databases and you know internet when this uh, type specimens are available to observe when we critically observed this type of dremia polyphyla we came to know it is not dremia it is a dipkadi so unfortunately or uh, by mistake it was named as dremia polyphyla you know pedicel shorter than brax it is actually species of dremia sorry dipkadi uh, dipkadi and therefore this species does not exist still it is in our literature we keep on repeating it in all floras okay so this is one thing now second thing uh, this dremia congesta this congesta is there in literature i have also made lot of mistakes because i will be referring only literature and in this you see this congesta and one day fine day i was told the dremia congesta does not exist in india it is a african species then what we were doing for so many years why this confusion all papers published on cytology other aspects of this all you know we have given wrong information so we have to be very critical when we describe uh, when we uh, i mean uh, uh, report any species so critical observations reveal that it is a new species dremia rausebeki and dremia congesta is a african species it does not exist in india so see how much confusion with small genus with eight nine species we have made then what's about coromandeliana what's about govindapi what's about raji what is about nagarjuni and these species so this was whole confusion for me uh, for me at least if now you see this is dremia coromandeliana which has to n equal to 40 and see the uh, flowers then this is a, a dremia govindapi which has to n equal to 20 described from bangalore dremia indica which is a common species throughout india to n equal to 20 also we have triploids along sea shores and this is dremia nagarjuni see the wonderful species which i was trying to locate for so many years finally we could locate dremia polyantha and this is a dremia um, dremia raujebiki dremia raji and this is dremia whitei so these these to resolve this complex of dremia on classical methods classical methodology and uh, biotech uh, biosystematic methodologies we took about 30 years and now picture is more or less clear about dremia okay see this now you can see this is a population with twin is equal to 30 which grows along the sea shores then this is a govindapi this is a rausebiki then this is a raji with needle like leaves polyantha then you can see this uh, rausebiki nagarjuni see this nagarjuni is like a agave plant very huge plant and it was not i mean i was uh, nobody was able to give me locality rausebiki raujebiki and you see this uh, can, uh this one is a now also i feel i mean this is a uh, raujebiki now whitey whitey we collected only 4 5 years before you can see leaves and flowers are together 
it is a Sinantha species. And you know, Congesta was described as a Hysteranthus. So, so many confusions were there in the past literature. And now you see this is a Dremia pite. Sometimes you may get confused with Dremia raujibiki. But always leaves and flowers are together and you can see. This is some kind of education for us that how things happen. And this is the raujibiki. So, clear. It was a clear differences. And within same populations, we get so much variations in the population, within same population. See this Dremia Nagarjuna, wonderful species from our country, right? Uh, see the bulbs, very large bulbs, very large leaves, very this one. Now such a species, if we know, can't we go for conservation of such a species which are known only from two localities in India? So this also makes deep sense. When we see this Dremia, uh, you can see majority of Dremia endemic species are restricted to peninsular India. Again, it is a center for diversification of tribe Sili or high synthesis. So this is Dremia indica, which is widely distributed and Dremia coromandelena, which has, uh, which is a tetraploid. It is considered. So chromosomes and all this we have studied that we will not go in a details, but what I want to say that we have to spend, you know, now today, trend is we want to increase number of research papers okay uh, but we do don't give real consideration because we are a scientist we want to know create knowledge it is not for paper publishing but creating knowledge once you create that should be made available to the public that is true but it is not only publishing papers so see this chromosomes and all this now you see the in dremia there are a number of other things I could learn. And this Dinia polyphyla is a species of Dipcadi, I told. Now these are the things, I will not go to those things also. And now you see, we did crosses, crosses. And you see this, there are two groups. This is one night blooming group. Indica, Govindapi, Coromandeliana, their flowers open in the night. While other species like Polyantha, Raji, Poly, polyphyla does not occur, Dremia species, uh, then uh, uh, Nagarjuni day, day blooming, flowers open in the morning, close by 4 o'clock. So there are two groups, night blooming and day blooming, and they are reproductively isolated because there is no question of no pollination between night blooming and day blooming species. So this is one thing which we understand. And uh, Sinanthus and Hysteranthus species, that is said, only Dremia whitei is a Sinanthus species. All of them. Hello? Some sound? So, again, these species are restricted to uh, this Maharashtra and Northern Western Ghat, and this is the center for diversification of Sili. So these all things took a lot of time for understanding. Now I come to very interesting thing which I want to share with all of you. Right? So some students. Hello? 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 Somebody should unmute. There is some sound. Yes, sir. Ah, uh, somebody, some sound. So anyway. Uh, this is a very interesting thing which I am doing for last 30 years and all these, uh, not Dipcadi, sorry, this is a Pancratium, I should have written, Pancratium species which are here. Uh, yesterday I have made this slide, for, unfortunately it is written Dipcadi, but Pancratium. Now some student, he wanted to publish two new species in Pancratium. Papers came to me, two times I rejected for two journals. Finally, he saw that those species are described. So students are inclined to publish, whether they stand or not, they are not bothered. Last 30 years experience, I was doing experiment with uh, this, uh, 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 our Pancratium, Pancratium donaldi. This is Pancratium longiflorum, Pancratium nairi, Pancratium parvum, Pancratium 
our sand mary pancreasium triflorum pancreasium uh, vericundum and pancreasium gelanicum so far i could not collect pancreasium biflorum uh, i don't know i have tried my level best but so far i have not so these are the species which we are we have in our uh, area and each one has some flowers are 15 16 cm long and some flowers are only 4 to 5 cm long that means they have different pollinators uh, they have different lengths of uh, this perian tubes and uh, there is a stratification pollinator stratification and they are night blooming and day blooming two groups are there so uh, this is a fact now you if you see these are the things which you can see from this the corona petals perian tube length stamen stamen filament length and uh, you can see this they are funny in this and finally when we see all the variations you get most confused and for that we need some biosystematic studies okay so you can see this coronas different coronas in this different populations which we have seen so here it is a clear by photographs only you can understand the diversity in corona of uh, pancreasium these are the chromosomes all have 22 chromosomes except uh, uh, pancreasium triflorum and pancreasium gelanicum other we where where we get triploids also now this meiosis was studied and then what we did i did i tried to cross them in our my house and you see except pancreasium longiflorum only uh, i mean two three crosses were successful others were not successful all the other species cross with each other and they have produce fully fertile hybrids in chromosomes there is no much difference number there is no much difference morphology there is no difference but flowers are different and their lengths their uh, distribution they, they are different and they cross with each other and if you ask me biologically in india only one species exist of pancreasium but taxonomically we recognize about nine species in india but reality that means whether we should call all this uh, what we call species as a local races adapted to different climatic zones and but they are not reproductively isolated so in this pancreasium we have leaf size anther order of flower flower perian tube length form of staminal column stamen filaments these are of taxonomic value they remain consistent but interspecific hybridization uh, in, in indicates that their <coughs> interspecific hybridization is common and reproductive barriers are not yet to develop in these populations so this is a conclusion and to understand you know plant sciences or biological sciences are wonderful sciences there is no end for research and bhi bhi should not feel or other people who feel that once flora is done what is there to do in uh, plants there is lot of work to be done in this plants so i told you story about pancreasium now let us go for uh, one genus that is a uh, chlorophytum our one student work around revision of chlorophytum and you know again it is a great confusing genus you can see arundanaceum uh, belgamens brevicaspum glaucum glycardus glagotnens malbaricum nimoni borolianum heni baruchi colapurens tuberosum lagzum and this is our um, uh, uh, this is our uh, gotnens and so on so these are the species and now i will go to you chromosome numbers also i have given let us see what uh, this there are two groups of species wild species of chlorophytums in india one has base chromosome number 2n is sorry x is equal to 8 and we have four species baruchi colapurens laxum tuberosum 
with 2n is equal to 16. Definitely these are closely related species. Sorry. Then, uh, then another is another group is C. This is x is equal to 7. So these species are with uh, base chromosome number 7, and in that we have Chlorophytum hyni, which is a uh, found in Kerala in a deep forest, in deep uh, evergreen forest. And this hyni is very closely related to African species Philippendum. They have very close to n equal to 14. Now, then we have Borolianum and Chromosome. Chromosome is not uh, introduced, but Borolianum 2n is equal to 22, double of the 14. And then we have a group of species, Arundanaceum, Belgamens, Brevis capum, 2n is equal to 42. And then Atuniatum, which has 2n is equal to 42 and 84. Then in the northern in India, we have Cassianum, Nepalensis, and Macrophile, these two species, which has 2n is equal to 56. Now, what these just numbers tell us, right? So, see, these are the chromosomes, beautiful chromosomes we have, which can be a good cytological material. And uh, then, when we thought of probable evolution of chlorophytum, the hypothetical ancestor probably had 2n equal to 8, which diploid chromosome 2n equal to 16, and we have Baruchi, Colapurens, Laxam, and Tuberosum. Their morphology is more or less similar. Then somehow some something happened to number less. So what uh, uh, rearrangements of chromosomes to class we don't know. 2n is equal to 14. We have Chlorophytum Heni with 2,000 diploid number 2, 2 is equal to 14. Then we have 2n is equal to 28, Borolianum and Chromosome. And then in northern uh, India, we have Cassianum and Nepalens with 2n is equal to 56. How chromosome number can help us to confirm identity, okay, in addition to region. Then this 21 became 42, 6x, and we have this a large chunk of species in Western Ghats which have deployed chromosome number 42. Arundanaceum, Belgamens, Bivicaspum, Glaucom, Glaucom, Gotnens, and so on. And finally, we have one in Nilgiri region, Chlorophytum indicum with 2n is equal to 84, 84, 12x. Now, this gives you a lot of idea about species and their evolution. And thus, uh, biosystematics is one part, and there is a limitless scope in Indian taxa because we have great biodiversity. BSI can think of, you know, star, uh, uh, after flora is over, and that is the best decision taken by BSI that first of all they will publish flora of India, and then many new avenues, especially you can see. Uh, that uh, molecular tools, modern tools in taxonomy, then SEM studies, TEM studies, all that will help us to improve taxonomy and really BSI. One thing I have to request to BSI that, you know, BSI is an organization, but universities and colleges have great strength of enthusiastic students and your guidance, your cooperation is a very important for real development of taxonomy in India. Okay. We, I think BSI should organize, should continue the program of capacity building in taxonomy and uh, they should support, of course they are supporting, see that how botanical gardens can play an important role, especially in conservation of critically endangered species. Then as our director has said, the Whatever we have uh, field status of species, many species which are reported to be critically endangered at many places, they are common, or some species which are threatened to be uh, considered to be common, they are very, very rare in nature, and therefore we need real students who will work in the field and not in laboratories. Then only we can do significant contributions in conservation of our biodiversity, especially endemic and endangered species of Western Ghats. And that way, BSI can help us 
help universities and other research organizations in giving leadership in taxonomy okay so these are some chromosomes and uh, of course i have uh, some other examples but i will not go to those examples because uh, uh, because of time limit uh, i have to be restricted and uh, i think if there are some questions i will be uh, taking them need for biosystematic studies on indian taxa especially some problematic taxa not that every time we have to go to very expensive research where you know uh, the sequencing i cannot offer to go for sequencing and spend uh, lakhs of rupees to get sequences and then interpret our own field data field observations will give us tremendous information with these words i thank botanical survey of india and i also say very very happy birthday for bsi and again we will start the new thank you very much myself dr sir i will i need to uh, Uh, clear one of my doubt uh, regarding my plant pedicularis uh, through your uh, all this uh, lecture which i heard so little bit of encouragement i got sir in pedicularis normally there is one galea but when i went to sikkim himalayas i found uh, three species which were having double galea so uh, but this double galea species are not uh, uh, they have not established a population it's a small population maybe of four or five uh, uh, this uh, plants in a single habit so i have i was really tempted to take uh, to uh, take that plant and bring it to lab and uh, make it a new species or something like that but since there was only this one one single single population i was i restricted myself i restrained myself i didn't take the specimen i just took colored photograph because i thought maybe some sort of evolution is going on and i should not disturb the nature just for the sake of uh, making a new species so would it be a new species or would it be some sort of an evolutionary process bringing some e cards or some uh, variants in between this question is there in my mind sir uh, see it needs a uh, experimental work in the yes. sense that suppose if that uh, double uh, what you said double galia Yeah, uh, Galia. That if we are able to cross, and if it produces fertile hybrid, that means it does not, it is not reproductively isolated. It should be treated as the same species. It could be a ecotype, okay, and that character may be fixed by genes. So we can call it as ecotype, or you can go for variety, describing variety. So it needs some further work. Immediate, uh, neither I I have experience with that genus. so i cannot comment but you need further field observations wait for some time make more observations and come to conclusion and you know you are the right judge to say what you because you are experienced taxonomist okay? yes. so that is what my advice to you okay sir thank you sir thank you sir your work was highly encouraging for us now i request dr dk agarwal sir to conclude the inaugural session Very good afternoon to one and all, respected dignitaries, intellectual uh, minds attending this webinar, students, friends, and colleagues. I congratulate all of you and the people of India for having a dedicated uh, institute uh, working for holistic research and survey. So uh, today is the auspicious auspicious occasion of uh, one hundredth. Uh, foundation day of bsi and uh, when we uh, look back uh, at this occasion when we introspect and look back uh, we can see our glorious past uh, we uh, uh, we could able to explore many of the accessible areas and most important thing is we could able to document many of the plant uh, diversity so far but this occasion today uh, it compels us to introspect uh, what we are actually in present what are the challenges what we had in the past and what we are going to do in the future 
So, uh, my duty is to summarize the inaugural session. I, uh, uh, to start with, uh, the inaugural session was started with uh, uh, the welcome address by Dr. S. S. Das. He put very well highlighted uh, the achievements of BSI so far, what we have achieved, what volumes we have published, and what we are going to do in the near future. And I must say, uh, the present is more challenging. What actually uh, we have today. Uh, of late, uh, we all must realize uh, this. Uh, our focus is being shifted, rather, the user demand is now shifted towards the quick publication, pictorial guides, and uh, more of you know, working list and all. And uh, probably somewhere we are compromising with the hardcore region, what Professor Jadav, Professor Jadav has highlighted. And uh, uh, we must look into those aspects uh, once we uh, get our program of India published. And uh, then we can take up uh, the regional studies, species specific studies, and complex uh, specific studies. Then probably that will solve uh, the future goal of accessing our biodiversity in a proper uh, you know, number. Then another important challenge what we have now is probably uh, maybe uh, we are. Uh, not so interested in describing a plan. What I observed in the last so many years, uh, earlier we used to write state for us and the regional for us and we used to collect specimens and describe them by using our own specimen. But off late now, uh, this is the trend happening. Uh, uh, the competition is how good we can copy from the other available descriptions. The more uh, smartly we can do it, more smartly we can produce the result. So that, that trend, we, that is a challenge uh, that we need to actually, uh, means uh, eradicate entirely from the future students, otherwise uh, that will lead to the disaster. Because when a person writing a flora one by by phytogeographical zone is copying the description of maybe, for example, flora of Kerala, one Kerala is writing and copying the description from flora of China. So this is the disaster you must realize. So uh, these are all, and again, uh, people are now more inclined towards publishing electrophysification of one known species. Uh, because of this digital era, we are able to um, access the type specimen, digitized type specimens of worldwide herbariums, and this leads us to you know access the types and. Uh, people are more uh, easily getting material for publishing prototypes or unknown species. So more uh, numbers are getting published. So these are all challenges, and uh, maybe our teacher is very bright. And uh, Mauser has uh, told he has motivated us to work together. People are different, and uh, uh, yeah, obviously we all have to work together for a common goal. And uh, uh, we, we, we have to have a right access of our biodiversity and its use, uh, use of its component. And uh, we are really grateful to Professor Sia Babu, who, despite being unwell, he uh, sent the right message read out by Mausa, uh, and he emphasized our, he, he, he could see where BSI should be in forthcoming days, maybe in 2035 or maybe 2047. And uh, really, uh, the most important and uh, eye opener, uh, Professor Yadav's uh, lecture, what uh, actually he, he has thrown insight on Dipkadi, Brignia, Pensgretum, Vedibularia. Uh, there are a few examples, as he said, there are a number of such examples we, we will come across, and we are coming across during our course of research. So, overall, these two days, uh, what actually we are going to experience. ESI is blessed to have expertise in all the plant groups, right from LD, freshwater LD, marine LD, microfungi, microfungi, bryophytes, lichens, teratophytes, uh, higher plants, angiosperms, gymnosperms. Even in angiosperms, there are many expertise in many families. So, uh, these two years, uh, these two days, the coming two days will definitely uh, throw some light, and the uh, students who have joined, uh, they will learn what actually is the status of diversity in these particular fields and uh, they will be able to, uh, they, they, they may be, you know, able to motivated to take up some research on these, uh, these aspects. 
So I wish these two days uh, will be will bring a lot of fruitful you know presentations and deliberations. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, let me start with uh, congratulating all the VSA family members. Uh, uh, Dr. Mao, the director, uh, Professor Yadav, uh, the keynote speaker of the function, uh, Professor Karyalu, mm -hmm. Professor Arun Pandey, uh, Dr. Das, and all other distinguished uh, uh, participants and the colleagues from BSI. Uh, Yes, I thought that uh, what to speak. Uh, let me thank you first uh, for inviting me to this uh, August day. One thirty third Foundation Day is not a small day. Uh, very few organizations survive that long. So for that, I congratulated each one of you. Whether you are the past employee or you are a research scholar or you are a present employee or the director or a senior scientist, all of you deserve congratulations. Because the achievement what we have today at BSI, it is the cumulative impact as Dr. Mao said rightly. Yes, you are the torch bearer for us, uh, particularly to know our plants, starting from the lower to higher groups of plants. And uh, for that, we express as an outsider of BSI. Of course, I am not 100% outsider. Uh, in several programs, I'm involved with you, but still, uh, as an outsider, I must congratulate each one of you and for the uh, spectacular, uh, spectacular achievements that you have done during the past years. Well, I thought what to speak, so I thought that unfinished task for India, Indian flora. So, because it is the all of us, we are developing the futuristic pathway for our respective organizations. I'm sure BSI must be doing that also because there is the government's directive. So I thought that let me put something which is which might help you uh, to really shape your future programs. So I titled it Unfinished Task for Indian Fora. It's always very tough to talk after Dr. Yadav's uh, talk. And uh, he has uh, demonstrated the particularly the after the Fora, Fora of India, what next by CSI, by uh, our BSI scientists, uh, which the director himself said that people have a, uh, you know, apprehension that once we complete the fora of India, what next? So I think Dr. Yadav has extensively discussed the possibilities of the cytotaxonomy or the in totality biosystematics how it can be useful and what we should do for that. 
So I will just give many, might be some things are also repetitive, but I will try to give some of the, uh, my experiences and my vision of that. So next slide, please. Uh, 133 years of glorious journey of BSI. Congratulations to each member of BSI, present and past, for completing glorious 133 years of dedicated service to the nation. Led, uh, some of the achievements which, you know, a common man also understands and all of us in the scientific fraternity we recognize, led the plant exploration in India. Not that only BSI does, yes, university people also do, other organizations they also do, but no comparison with the contribution by the uh, BSI scientists who have led this plant exploration movement over the decades since its establishment in India, discovered many new species, described more than 21,600 angiosperm species, revisionary and monographic studies, several, completion of Flora of India. I must congratulate Dr. Mao for that because works were going on. But uh, you know, the last mile run is always important. I think it was waiting Dr. Mao to complete. I think we know that tremendous progress during the last two, three years and resolving nomenclature issues. They have been successfully doing this. And this is the core tex uh, taxonomic work. So they have done it par excellence, no denial about that. Given the complexity of this country. Maintained the largest herbarium of the nation and identification service provided not only to our country, but also across the globe. Multiplication of threatened plants and ex situ conservation in botany gardens, which uh, Professor Yadav touched upon. Maintaining the largest botany garden of the country, actually the Sivos Botany Garden in Howrah, Calcutta, and establishing the botany garden of Indian Republic. Yes, they are. Uh, steering our botany garden program of this country but i think they are these two gardens one is just new and the other one is the oldest and the largest in the country i think for that we should give them the due credit and it is a herculean task to maintain over the you know you can say century now they have passed so it is several decades they have been maintaining it yes uh, Professor Babu's talk also uh, addressed in the in his message also it was there, Human Resource Development in Plant Taxonomy. They have been doing this task and they have been giving the scientists, research scholars to the entire country, whether a university or to a research organizations like our CSIR. Universities are also contributing, but I think their contribution is well recognized. I feel that as a common man, as an outsider, these are the, some of the milestones which they have achieved and we must celebrate that because of these, these contributions. Uh, next please. Next slide. Unfinished tasks. So unfinished tasks are many. Uh, Professor Babu has uh, listed a number of them. Uh, I am also listing a few of them. There will be some overlap. Uh, but uh, I will say after reading out this, so what is my opinion after that? Accelerating forestic survey in underexplored areas. Uh, Professor Yadav also knows this for last five years, I have been always advocating to, BS, to our NBRA scientists as well. This is nothing new, but why we are not able to complete? Why certain areas are there from where you will find almost all the new species are coming every year? So that means there are areas which, not that we have not surveyed, yes, we have crossed each and every corner of the country through its regional centers, through its headquarters, and also other university people, other states, central universities, national institutions, they have been also doing their bit. Yet, as you know, a roughly estimated more than 30% or around 30% of the geographical area is really to be explored in great detail. It has been explored, but I think that is underexplored. So what we should do now, we cannot keep on telling this. Uh, even after my all my efforts, hardly might be 1% of the area they are trying to do it. So I think now BSI should take a lead. It should take up as a, I think Dr. Mao is hearing, uh, listening to me, and uh, we must take up as a mission mode now. And it should be from the BSI should lead it, identify first the areas, based upon our all the past experiences, 
which are the areas where there is a possibility or which are under explored let us identify those areas and design in such a manner that we complete in a mission mode by 2023 not more than that say one year or two years maximum and involve all wherever the expertise lies whether it is shivaji university or it is the delhi university or it is what wherever we are throughout the country we know where are the expertise lies so let us try to bring them all one on one platform and assign the areas develop a group where the expertise from different groups of plants will be there and try to complete it in a mode so that yes we can say that yes and whatever support you need at least from csr side i will prov we will provide from csr side whatever for uh, four five labs we should be able to at least complete because this work unless you complete you see we will keep on moving like that only so let us try to finish and we can say that yes at least 90% of the inventory work is over might be if i say 2 years is very short maximum 3 years not more than that let us do it next is iucn protocol based head classification with quantitative population data so even dr mao said everybody said it so how do we go about it as you know that we have listed i will just come to that 2700 odds in certain species but many of the species which have been listed whether our dr shastri and nayar bsi is red data book or till today whatever we have done all seven eight documents many of the species those who are really threatened they are they have not got place in that they are waiting still to be to get a place in the red data book and many of the species which are there in the red data book they are really not threatened the reason is many of them are based upon the field trip and herbarium data and you know which is not possible to complete everything so based upon that erroneous classification is in a you know it is obvious so let us try to address that issue so if we address based on the population data iusn protocol based at least the threat classification will be correct and accordingly you can design the conservation strategy so this is again another urgent thing which i think we must do it and the number is it stands now 2700 odd species but even if we add or delete something it should not exceed 3000 rough estimate if you take the endangered critically endangered and vulnerable these three categories into consideration and we must take this thing into classification but this classification must base upon 100% population data i am not saying that you do all a b c d e of the iucn protocol at least b c d where the population data is there and it will be fairly okay so once we complete this task at least whether our botanical garden program where the threatened species are allocated but it has to be not in the just ex situ conservation it has to go to the field also so those things we will discuss little bit later so resolving taxonomic ambiguity delimitation of the taxa in indian flora for the global list of accepted species so what dr professor yadav was talking this is about that and as you know the main culprit is culprit is the definition of the species so even the biological species when the definition came which professor yadav extensively talked about that reproductive isolation that is also not no more valid so a lot of divergent views have come so what is happening instead of converging about the concept of the species the global scientists are still diverging a lot and today as on today we have 26 definitions of the species so if 26 definitions of the species it's not possible for the taxonomists it is not audible audible sir is it 
हेलो प्लीज हाँ मैं कि सो एम आई ऑडिबल ना यस सो द रिजल्टिंग टेक्सोनोमिक एम्बिगुटी और डी लिमिटेशन ऑफ द टेक्स इन इंडियन फोरा दैट इज रिक्वायर्ड एंड फॉर दैट I will talk more details about this about the global list of accepted species based upon our recent experience with the global group, and for that the introduction has been given already by Professor Sariyado. But as I said, species definition is the main culprit, and we are diverging rather than the converging, and that is natural because of the definition. And definition since Darwin's time. we have been giving as i said 26 definitions are there naturally the delimitation will be further difficult so i will talk about that little bit later one india digital herbarium you see today we are saying that this is a new species because the digital herbarium is available globally so that we can compare whether it is so it is always useful but that doesn't mean that if you want to use it misuse the things as rightly said by professor yadav then there is no end to it but yes digital herbarium helps and rightly uh, your bsi has already started work on that and even say for example in csr also we are trying to make one csr herbarium completely digital it is in the process uh, so we would like to say that the bsi should take the lead to connect all the university in fact all the indexed herbaria on one digital platform all those herbaria should be connected and one portal we should provide for the one india digital herbarium so there should be one of the long term goal also uh, led to be led by bsi and all the other university or the csir or anybody we can be partner to that and all our resources could be put there also and the last one i will be talking about the basic science uh, always it has been said that taxonomy either it is the new species it is the revision or it is the delimitation but i think is time has come now since we have achieved something during the last so many years 130 years or 133 years now it is the time to go to the high science level and what is that i thought to put it unraveling evolutionary trend among the taxa so this evolutionary trend to dis to decipher it it's not a task or not the task of a single scientist or a single organization so what we should do now because ecology evolution taxonomy genetics all these things actually come together when you try to unravel the evolutionary trend we just end up saying this is an old taxa or this is an old family this is a primitive family this is a new family the evolutionary trend is from here it has originated and it has gone in that line that is not enough say for example even within a genus say for example whether it is aconitum or it is what or impatiens or balsams or anything you take it within that you will find that there is a variations in the morphological characters forget about the genetics in the morphological characters itself so which way which direction the evolution is taking place and can we unravel that and of course the phylogenetic relationship and of course ultimately whether it is the cytological or it is the chemical you see we have been talking about the chemotaxonomy we have been taking or talking about the cytotaxonomy molecular taxonomy but really are we resolving or making it more complicated at times why i am telling this say for example in panax bipinnatifidus based upon the leaf and when we did the profiling of targeting a particular gene or a marker the bipinnatifidus is no more bipinnatifidus it is pseudogynous so you see even the bipinnate leaf which is the main character or the major attribute major character even we are not able to really resolve because the molecular based upon a particular gene Uh, that uh, you know the tree is saying something different so we have to take care of this we have to do all this but really how to resolve it rather than diverging or creating uh, more confusion so i think we must at the apex level that's why i said 
for the global list of accepted species or the settling this species delimitation, we must have an apex body, a think tank of the taxonomists or of the molecular taxonomists or chemical taxonomists or cytologists together so that all these things we develop a protocol how to real say for example we are saying that if the 97 percent similarity is there uh, or lower then we should go for the new species similar type of this is an example i'm not saying that no value judgment whether that is correct or wrong but in the tree if we say that 97 percent is the threshold limit similar things we should devise when we are taking different approaches, all these approaches, so how do we really develop a consensus value, then we can all uh, agree together and we can say yes, beyond this, this is the new species, whether in a morphological term or it is the, you know, even the molecular basis or the cytology basis, so we have to develop a consensus, otherwise this type of new species description, even if they are an ecotype or an ecard, or even simply a variety or a subspecies. So all these problems will continue. I think we have to think the problem is not that simple or it is not that easy as I am describing. I'm just giving a hint, at least we can think of. And for that, this evolutionary trend among the TEXA, basic science and a high level of basic science, which can not only be, not only of the, it can be published even in the nature for the, the amount of diversity we have, the amount of really, ecotopic variations we have, the amount of speciation that it is taking place in India because of this varied geographic and climatic uh, regions, I think no other country can have it. But if they are studying very high level science using this approach, why shouldn't we? I think the time has come, but that doesn't mean that all the expertise has to be within BSI or everybody. We can have the, like as I said, come create the platforms and identify the partner organizations. And otherwise, if you want to develop expertise, infrastructure, it will take again another decades to come up the BSI, the level of which we are expecting. So let us try to uh, do this type of uh, uh, facilities so that existing facilities in this nation can be utilized and we can fasten our activities. Next, please. I'll go now faster. You know, first, uh, out of all these things, I will talk about those two things. One is the threatened species, the need, and the second one is the global list of species. So that I can give some hints for the future. So this is the, you know, that one million species face extinction. And you can see that human activities threaten ecosystems around the world. So you can see this is the publication uh, from nature. And uh, all of us, we know, but uh, public, you know, in the highlighting the issue, and giving some uh, reliable evidences is important. Next, please. Next slide. So similarly, we'll see that has the Earth sixth mass extinction already arrived? I think yes. We can say biologists now suggest that the sixth mass extinction is underway, and we all agree with that. Next, please. So this is again from Nature. So you will see that uh, here in Science, you can see study finds 10% of tree species are under threat. So uh, in 98, this was published in Science. So the importance uh, is uh, repeatedly highlighted, yes, uh, species uh, extinction is a major problem now. And I think if VSI doesn't address, who will address it? Next, please. Uh, this is our work, which you, VSI was also partner, where you can see that, yes, we found that, uh, next, please, the geographic distribution. And you can see 2,704 threatened plants. We compiled it based upon the available literature, and we found Orchidaceae uh, having 650, 44 have the highest number of species under threat. Uh, Fabaceae 185, Poaceae 154, Rubiaceae 103, Astraceae 88, and so on and so forth. And 13% of the estimated vascular plant diversity of India, they are threatened. Next, please. And most of them, you can see that one less than 1% of threatened species had wide distribution range, as indicated by their presence in 10 to 23 states of India, only 1%. So you will see that 62% of the listed certain plants of India had restricted distribution range, that is, they were reported from only one state. So each and every state has a role to play. 62% of listed certain plants, uh, they have only distribution restricted to one state. So you will see that whatever threat status, that is all we understand, that the threat status, which because based upon the herbarium, because of the perception of the scientists, and all these things we know, so inconsistencies in the threat status reported by the different sources, whether it is the Red Book of India, 
or IUCN or NBS or NBA, National Biodiversity Authority notifications, that means including the State Biodiversity Board notifications, or the CAMP workshop or the Schedule 6 of the Wildlife Protection Act, or to that matter, CITES also appendices. So you will find that there is no consistency in the threatened species. So we have to work much harder for that also because this is the you know application potential or application if you want to really conserve first you have to resolve this the threat status because India is a not a resourceful country like uh, uh, Americans or Europeans so we have to see that our resources we have to put so we have to prioritize the species and for prioritization we must correctly assess the threat status so the existing threat status are inconsistent and also they are not based upon as we in the beginning and everybody has been telling that yes we need to reassess it and that has to be quantitatively next please you will see that here the critically endangered endangered and vulnerable these are the three we must consider other things now let us for the time being whether it is near threatened or least concern don't bother about that so at least these three categories we must take and most priority we should give to the critically cr and en categories and you know for Population reduction is fine. A data you can do it. Restricted geographical range B also you can do. Small population size and decline also that you can do easily. C D very small or restricted population no issue. But extinction probability analysis might be difficult for many of you. So forget about E for the time being. But if you have the meta population modeling software, you can do this also. So at least A B C D on basis of this and the quantitative population data if you collect. They can be correctly categorized what category of threats they are facing. And that will rectify our, even whatever at that point of time, suppose a particular scientist documented it, whether Dr. Sastri or Dr. Nayar, but also a lot of developmental activities are happening. So, in the process, the population which was there that time might have vanished today. So, even they are correct at that point of time. But after passing up 50 years, 60 years, the status will change. So it needs to be re-examined and it is a Herculean task. We know that. And for that, as rightly said by Dr. Uh, Babu, Professor Babu, that yes, we should use the extensively the models, ecological niche models. And we have proved that in our that DBT project that it is 100% if once the model predicts, you will find the species there. If not, there will be cryptic species or there will be sister species. And you will find that even those species if a particular genus, the sister species are usually also their threatened category, mostly. So that will also help us in discovering new species as well as getting the population data for the so uh, for the cryptic species or sister species. But doesn't matter, uh, the ENM use will help us in fastening the process of inventory and we should do it, whatever tools are available to us, we should deploy them in the field now instead of randomly going and searching. Next please. Uh, you see, this is an example. These are the sources, as I told you, the data, 2,700 odd species. So these are the data. You can see IUCN, Red Data Book, CAMP, NBA, Schedule 6, CITES, and NBS. So the, the two, two, four, three, seven. So the compilation of these seven documents, that is the result of that 2,704. So that can work as a best document for all of you. And you know that this is available in the current science in 19, uh, 2018. February 10 issue. So the complete list is there and that is not, that is compiled from all the sources, secondary sources was available. Next please. Uh, you see this is the summary. Uh, we have around 2641 angiosperms, 23 gymnosperms, 44 pteridophytes and 14% of the estimated vascular plant, 13 point something actually. So it was written there 13 and here it is 14 of the vascular plant diversity in India. So you have to see that we have a strategic plan for addressing this issue. And already protocol, next please, if you see the protocol already you tried and only so far 156 species only. So because you have to remember that only multiplying and conserving in the botanic garden does not serve the purpose because the natural population is still impoverished unless we strengthen the natural populations in C2, the population is not going to be self-sustaining and it will be, keep, you keep on planting, they will keep on dying. So the Threat, uh, threat category or threat status or the threat to, to the species populations will never go. So we have to devise what we are trying to do now. Most of us, we are just getting the species, multiplying it, developing its macro progression methodology or micro progression methodology. After that, we multiply 1,000, 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, 100, depending upon the success and the resources in our hand. Then mostly we either distribute it or you plant somewhere but in a very sporadic way. But we have to now 
develop a plan for intensive plantation in the natural that also enm predicted habitats so that the success rate is high and forest departments or the community leaders who are the custodian of the forest land or wherever the habitat lies they have to be taken into confidence so that really the natural populations rejuvenate and we can say really they are if they are not out of the data book at least they have from critical endangered they have really improved to the endangered and if endangered they improve to the vulnerable or vulnerable they will go to the least concerned something like that we have to plan it properly and problem is huge you know our scientific manpower is comparing the country's size and the problem of the and the you know the dimension of the problem it is nothing so we have to be very carefully design it and also you have to take up it in mission mode and i think who will be the best organization other than bsi so i know that i am giving a lot of task to bsi but yes you are saying that what next after that after that even i will say that even in taxonomy also it will never end by you know publishing the flora of india doesn't mean that the taxonomy is static it is always a dynamic subject and you will see that you have to again as i said you have to update it in new species as i said they have to be added and of course as we improve in the technology naturally the delimitation and species definitions based upon that now we are more aware of those things so we can rectify our past mistakes so always revisions will continue okay next please so this is the only 156 species some new works have been done so we took the demographic approaches as the genetic approaches both so usually we emphasize on the demographic approaches because population what is the demographic approaches we try to increase the population size so that the population size is mitigated and the genetic drift is avoided simply because the variability will be maintained within the populations and the genetically viable that population will be genetic viable so genetic drift can be avoided but it is always says that uh, and uh, genetic approaches if you see some of the species they need really very close attention because the genetic base is so narrow when we have analyzed the genetic diversity you will find thank god that we have some technologies now in hand and if you find that those are genetically very impoverished so you need more money for that more time for that more focus for that so for those species you will take the genetic approaches so while classifying the species unless you have the population data and also some of them if we have the genetic basis genetic base diversity base how much it is then we can plan for these species also that how to really conserve them so both democratic approaches and genetic approaches we have to take out next please so conservation protocol for achieving scale and sustainability so the issue is that once we do it yes for we did for 100 species for under the dbt program including gsi our partners but that is not enough the scale has to be high that is a small you can say that a model or example we have done but it has to be for all these species as i say it could be estimated 3000 or more species and also have to ensure their sustainability so the scale and sustainability have to ensure and it is a herculean task so population inventory characterization mapping using ecological niche modeling meta population modeling for selected species that is for that viable population that is the e category for if you want to category strictly as for iucn so for this is the e so identification of factors responsible for depleting species populations and developing a species specific recovery strategy molecular characterization of the selected species population to identify the populations with greater diversity for genetic enrichment based sourcing concept characterization of active principles in selected species in different habitats populations next please so these are the uh, five and these are the another five standardization of the macro micro person techniques reproductive biology production of planting material reintroduction in the enm areas Arborium, establishment of field gene banks, MOU with the forest department community. So that these 10 protocols, if we follow, yes, we can say that the species can be returned from the brink of extinction, at least to the next conservation status. So it is a Herculean task to do all these things, expensive also. So we have to have a strategy and it cannot be done overnight. Next 20 years also, if we can really do, that will be a great target. But I think it is not the only BSI can do with its limited manpower. We have to include much more manpower, including the universities, other such institutions. So together, we have to address this issue. Next, please. Uh, 
Next slide. Yeah, so this is the story of Armosia Ravosta, where Dr. Mao and uh, myself and our students were working together. You can see that only three populations, Pasighat, Itanagar, Balpakram, when we started working on the one individual in Itanagar. So now at least with the, that project and with the effort of that student, Nila Sina, we have been able to restore to some extent. Next, please. You see, these are the, some of the examples which we tried to really uh, recover them, which are all the threatened species. Next, please. I will not, uh, yeah, but the most important thing is when we try to really classify them, when we are talking that, yes, it has to be correctly classified, that classification, the basic thing is this AO and EO. So for that, usually people feel that it is a very difficult task, it is not so. So reports area, or you can do it. And we have trained many people, extent of occurrence, how to do it, area of occupancy, how to do it, subpopulations, and you can do it easily. So once you get the AO, EO, your classification problem is solved. If you can run the metapopulation models, nothing like that. I mean, all A, B, C, D, E category, you can do that under IUCN. So that possible, so what I'm telling that, all these things is easily possible to learn within one hour, two hours, everything. Next, please. So the classification should be correct. These are the ENM models in that, pro in that project, in that correct science paper in Jammu Kashmir, Northeast, you can see. Next, please. Uh, this is the improved threat assessment. You can see that after the project, we did it. So you can see many of the species, they were never assessed, not assessed, not assessed, not assessed. You can see in the current IUCN status, this, this column. And you see after the study, we have classified them. And you can see that many of them have been classified like this. So if we have to do this exercise, so again, a mission approach you have to take because it is a high scale because many of the species you have to take up now. So next please, so this is an example I said. So now I'm coming that uh, yes, uh, I'm sure Professor Arun Pandey is there. He will be talking and might be Dr. Karihalu also, he will be touching on that. You see the molecular uh, basis when we talk, uh, that is essential to delimit the species. But we know that even if they are conserved, but it is not a foolproof. So for example, while we were working on the Panax, even up to 5.8 rRNA, 5.8 S ribosome, we have to go down. Then we found the differences. So I was telling you at what polyploidy level, at what cytological level, or at what level of molecular diagnosis, at what level of morphological diagnostic analysis, you will define a species. It is a very million dollar question. It's not that easy to address. So I rightly said that yes, it depends upon the experience, field experience, depends upon the your experience on the tools. It is a combination of many things. So that's what I was telling. So let us have a task force type of situation where at least for our Indian fora, we can develop some parameters that based on this, we can really say a species, yes, no, or it is an ecotype or a variety, or it is a subspecies and so on and so forth. So this is an example now, even those conserved regions, now they are outdated. No, very few papers are being published because acceptability is low. So people have started now shifting towards the full genome sequencing, including the, uh, you know, draft genomes and the reference genomes. So biogenome for studying phylogeny and evolution. So if you are going to unravel the evolutionary studies, so naturally the full genome sequencing or at least the draft genome has to be there. So this is an example of what we are doing at NBRI, the full genome sequencing of Google. We have our own platform on which we did it. So you can see these are the steps. It is possible, but yes, if you feel that, it is not possible or you do not have the infrastructure, always you can collaborate. Next please, this is the Comifera waiting, the draft genome, which we have done it already, it is under publication. So like that, we are trying to do under the Earth Biogenome Project, I think many of you know, 1000 species we are trying to do with a DVT project, around 500 core, but it is not yet uh, finally approved. But yes, if not, we will take up our own, but it has to be done if you want to study the any evolutionary aspect. And for that also you have to prioritize because Yes, it is costly, but it is possible. So those species where there is a lot of delimitation issue, where there is a species complex, all the or we will get very good insight into the evolutionary trends, those species we should identify and go for the full genome sequencing, and it is possible now. And uh, next, please. So this is the example of the Google. So now I am going to the next part that and global also, when we are working for our country, whether exploring the areas, describing the new species, delimiting more perfect way, categorizing the threatened species in a more scientific way or based on population data, 
while all these efforts will go on but we also cannot forget the global requirement all the global scientists are doing because they have already done their work long back say for example australia or it is to that matter even uk or any european countries small countries small areas and they have more resource persons i mean more scientific men power so they have completed their task but given the very uh, diverse topographic conditions difficult terrain and less number of uh, trained taxonomists in this country we have those things we have to continue but we cannot also be left behind why the, what they are doing now so one of the areas where all of us are trying to do including the the developed countries that is can we have a uh, you know globally accepted a uh, list of species so it is not the nomenclature only no nomenclature not at all it is the species delimitation you know same species what is the need a common man will ask why should we have a common uh, global list of species you see what happens it is not that only from the taxonomic point of view or from the nomenclature of view or classification point of view it is a lot of application problem say for example a threatened species we identified today and they have cites they have put it in their appendix and suddenly the species is renamed and the delimitation whatever way you a scientist has done he has published it so now that species is something else so that species once you have renamed it or you have said that that species is not x this is the y now so the cites or any regulatory organized bodies they do not change overnight so by the time they change that species or incorporate your new name or new species whatever you do or dividing or a, suppose that was a sub species under a particular threatened category which was in the cites list suddenly that sub species you have taken out and you have made it as a new species independent species so that independent species also has a lot of uh, phytochemist um, phytochemical important phytochemicals and that is suddenly vanished from the earth so these are the consequences so we should have a globally accepted species list and there are many examples where we face we face the problem so now the globally scientists we are working on why we should not have a global list of species so whether a species or any other taxon is included on a list may affect as i said conservation by affecting investment in certain species so we suppose it is renamed or it is found that it is a new species not the species which has been listed in the regulatory or documents uh, but once you take it out conservation is affected nobody is giving money to conserve the species similarly trade for the convention on international trade in endangered species cites and listing as an invasive pest so that you know the livelihood is also affected because if you list that as an invasive pest so, so all these problems are there and development also if there is a threatened species you found and suddenly the development project is halted but in the if the list is not very sure and if you keep on changing the name or whatever the reason may be uh, then you will find that that threatened species has completely stalled the developmental project or the other way once you take out the species from the threatened category that species population is completely vanished so local livelihoods also is affected through species specific conservation program ecotourism evolutionary and ecological research diversification analysis macroecological studies so that is also going to be affected because that fundamental is the list so that's how we need a list which is universally required <clears throat> and for that also i think we all have to work together because this is a herculean task unless the species delimitation is logically concluded you cannot go for this next please uh, next slide you can see the negative consequences of lack of unified list some of the world's named species are effectively invisible to those who lack the resources to assess or navigate specialist taxonomic literature so many of the named species they are invisible because we don't know we don't get the literature the lack of unified list means that scientific contributions towards improving the quality of taxonomy and nomenclature knowledge are scattered and can often be missed so at least repetition or duplication or unnecessary work and doing again a, a same work and different two opinions creating more those things can be really taken care of it forces other users who may lack relevant taxonomic expertise to choose between the competing lists and taxonomic treatments of groups even though they rarely understand the rational why competing list of exists and are confused by the difference between the alternate taxonomic concepts so this is also another thing we should have a unified list the users may follow regional or other species identification guides 
or lease without realizing that they are outdated and should be checked against the authoritative sources. That's how the world is feeling now. We should have a unified for all the across the you know the kingdom, whether it is the microbes, it is the animal, or it is the virus, or it is the bacteria, or it is the plants. All should have a unified thing. and multiple leaks should be avoided. Next, please. And next. So this is the more important, I guess, because global list of accepted species are foundational to managing biodiversity in the era of accelerating global change. So taxonomy energy, these all these things have come from a nature paper when the taxonomy energy hampers conservation and the science-based taxonomy still needs better governance. Because of this confusion, we need a better governance system, but there is no chance of really tempering the taxonomy science. That is fundamental, that is unchangeable. What that is required so that the list of accepted species. That's how. Next, please. Next slide. So that's why we. Uh, next slide, please. Huh. So you can see that. No, no. Please go back. So if you see that, what are the challenges in creating a unified global list of accepted species? So I have been talking to Dr. Mao and also Dr. Das that we should have this. What are the challenges? That is that we have talked circumscription of a taxonomy of a taxon, not fully objective decision. That objectivity is missing, so we have to see that how to circumscribe the taxon. Then a judgment as to whether a set of specimens or populations is best regarded as one or more than that one species. Different taxonomists may legitimately judge the limits of taxa differently, even when using the same data. There are many alternative sources of data and methods for delimiting taxa. For example, molecular or morphological phylogenetics, morphometric. Ecological or uh, physiological uh, <coughs> physiological traits. When there are differences in opinion about species validity, there is no formal rule of for dispute resolution or frameworks within which the difference can be managed. So this is the challenge. Next, please. Uh, you can see this. This is the one of our publications where. Uh, the experts from 12 countries we sat together three days we brainstormed and we tried to see a principle what are those principles which can be really helpful for a global list of all species so next please uh, this is the paper in the finally we all as we said that is as i said origin was from that nature paper that uh, why the uh, our we should have a unified list so after that uh, principles for creating a single authoritative list of the world species so next please so you will find that there are 10 principles. So these are the gaps you will find. So in the currently the individual taxonomists are working, class, family, reviews, checklist, world. So all these are there, the plant list, index uh, fungorum for fungus, world register of marine species. So all these things are there. And finally, you see the user agency there in the down, national legislators, technical users, international conventions, non-government organizations. So you know now catalog of life or encyclopedia of life, UOL and COL or global biodiversity investment facilities. So these are the uh, system now we are following. But we should have a regulatory, or you can say a facilitating body over above all, so that the confusions of the multiple lists which are existing, at least for India, we don't have many lists, but globally we'll find 176 uh, competing lists were there. And when uh, catalog of life was there, they were all unified. So that type of approach. Next, please. So for India at least, so these are the principles of, you can see the species list must be based on science and free from non-taxonomy consideration and interference. This is the principle one. So taxonomy is the basis and there will be no manipulation or no uh, debate on that. So taxonomists have been given the free hand, whatever they say that is the final. Governance of the species list must aim for community support and use. Community means the user agencies, whether international agency or government or industry or international organizations. So must we aim at community support and use. So it is not only that uh, we should have a combination of both taxonomists as well as the user agencies. All decisions about list composition must be transparent. The governance of validated list of species in separate from, from the governance of the naming of species. Naming of species, we are very strong. Whether it is the botanical nomenclature or it is the geological nomenclature or bacterial or virus, we are not strong, nothing to do. On that pattern also, the delimitation also should be there so that the disputes can be resolved. At least it cannot be completely done away with, but at least it can be minimized. Governance of lease of accepted species must not strain academic freedom, which I told also before. 
the set of criteria considered sufficient to recognize species boundaries this one i have, I have been talking so this can be done at the national level of course wherever the international level boundaries are already defined you can take the help of that but this is very important the set of criteria considered sufficient to recognize species boundaries may appropriately vary between different taxonomic groups certainly but should be consistent when possible if it is from fish to uh, plants to say for example birds but we have to see that at least within the group they are the those criteria should be at least same a global list must balance conflicting needs of currency and stability by having achieved versions archived versions so we should not have frequent changes on that also there has to be dynamism but stability should be there relative stability contributions need, need appropriate recognition naturally list content should be traceable from where it has come and the whatever the list is giving from which is the source a global listing process needs both to encompass the global diversity and also to respect the local knowledge at the local level so that should be the combination of these so these are the 10 principles based upon which the global list should be drawn so for that i think in india we have to do effort now to start at least we can contribute to a global list where our list indian list will be at least free from any dispute next please so these are the users you can see taxonomists ecologists citizens scientists data scientists and uh, you can see the biosecurity officers conservationists so they have their in the end this side if you see in this matrix you can see that species uh, identification studies collection and all so you will find that taxonomists they do all these things others are very their role is in different places so if you want to really give them the users these are the all user agencies so we have to see that the taxonomists they give the knowledge to them also so that they utilize it effectively and they don't face much problem so the global list will be a solution to that next please so these are the each principle we have now separated and segregated and detailed descriptions are there this is in the organisms diversity and evolution you will find those we around 14 scientists we are setting together for many, many for the last three years and these details have been described in these papers next please you will see that this is a white taxonomist why taxonomy is different? It's a very good uh, justification that yes, it is bound to be different of opinion. Taxonomical problems cannot be resolved. <coughs> you will see that that has to be there. That has been justified there. Independence and stakeholder inclusion. Next, please. So, like that, a series of papers are there. Overcoming fragmentation in the governance of taxonomic list. Next, please. Uh, series of papers. Devil is in detail. So, total details are here. Next, please and catalog of life checklist so you know that catalog of life is the today is the most very close to the uh, globally accepted species but it has also several drawbacks so that has been analyzed here next please so with this i conclude because these are the tasks which we had even if we publish the flora of india but many of the things you can see that we can still do and i will be basically uh, happy that if the bsi scientists still focus because you know we have the expertise from the other disciplines which we discussed whether the cytology although they are in danger but cytology or molecular biology or ecology uh, people are there but taxonomy will not find that in other organizations many taxonomists are there so i think i would like to see that bsi retains in strength in the basic taxonomy and then should be working as the model for all these activities and all the activities whether any discipline where you need the help or support to achieve what we discussed those things we can always do collaboration but yes minimum infrastructure you can develop but that capacity also you can keep on developing but that will take time minimum one decade to be a full fledged lab to achieve all these things so with this i say uh, we salute the bsi people bsi for really this glorious 133 years and uh, and uh, whatever support whatever collaboration we will be there always uh, to do that once again congratulations and thank you for inviting me thank you sir if anybody has any question to ask please ask Thank you, sir. Your words are highly encouraging for us. Well, let me introduce our next guest of honor, Dr. J. L. Khariyadu. Dr. J. L. Khariyadu joined ICR, that is, Indian Council of Agricultural Research, in 1978 as a scientist. As 
He worked in different capacities at ICAR, Grassland and Fodder Research Institute, Chhanti, ICAR, Indian Institute of Horticultural Research, Bangalore, and ICAR, National Bureau of Plant Genetic Resources, New Delhi. Dr. Raya Lu is a recipient of Rafi Anna Sidway Award of ICAR and Professor B. Puri Medal, Medal of Indian Botanical Society. He has been editor in chief. Indian Journal of Plant Genetic Resources and Vice President, Indian Society of Plant Genetic Resources. Presently, he also serves on the board of trustees of trust for advancement of agricultural sciences. I would now like to request Dr. J. L. Hariyaru to enrich us with his valuable lecture on this day. Thank you very much. Uh, I am trying to upload my uh, presentation. Uh, shall I my sharing the entire screen? Yes. Okay. Uh, shall I load the presentation? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Mao, for this opportunity. Uh, we had some excellent uh, presentations um, and advice. First by uh, Professor C. R. Babu, then uh, uh, excellent academic presentation uh, by uh, Dr. Yadav. Uh, and then Dr. Parekh, they uh, they have set the stage actually for what I'm what I will be uh, trying to present in my lecture. Um, as the title shows, uh, it is BSI Apex Taxonomic uh, Research Organization uh, fulfilling its role. I'll try to uh, uh, what I have tried to do in this presentation is. Uh, and uh, the way I will be presenting it is uh, give some achievements of BSI and other taxonomy plant centers. Uh, unfortunately, it will be a duplication uh, of what has been said by the previous learned uh, speakers. Uh, but in the present context, it is, uh, I think it is uh, legitimate to have uh, views from various uh, sources with respect to what uh, BSI has achieved so far. And seeing those achievements in the context of uh, unadvancing frontiers of taxonomy and its applications, uh, and, uh, the, and those applications uh, uh, provide us opportunities, provide opportunities for BSI uh, to respond uh, uh, in an appropriate way. Uh, so how the, uh, uh, the mandate of BSI has evolved or should evolve in response to those ad advancements. And based on uh, my perceptions about what BSI should be doing, uh, I suggest a roadmap uh, to fulfill its, uh, uh, its uh, stated role as the apex taxonomic uh, taxonomy research organization of the country. Actually, I got uh, uh, the feeling, the idea uh, of using this Apex Taxonomy Research Organization um, as the title uh, for my presentation uh, from some publications uh, of uh, BSI where, uh, and the ministry uh, where it is written as the Apex Taxonomic Research Organization of the country. Uh, this, is a, this is a wonderful statement and uh, a wonderful vision, uh, which uh, we have achieved, which uh, uh, the uh, BSI has achieved to an extent. Uh, but uh, as everybody has indicated, uh, it needs to move forward, uh, achieve something more uh, to reach this actual status. 
BSI has a rich legacy. And uh, again, um, uh, I would be repeating it. Um, uh, and a wonderful history uh, of 133 years. And uh, by the way, congratulations to the staff and everybody who is present here uh, on this occasion, on this, on this very happy occasion. Uh, which should lead us to further dedicate ourselves uh, to uh, to enhancing uh, the prestige of, of BSI in the coming future. Uh, herbarium uh, of 3 million specimens. I remember during my younger days when I was an MSc student, uh, the herbarium of uh, BSI was, and I'm sure it still is, as as regarded as uh, the last word uh, and uh, the word of the scientists of uh, BSI as the last word in identity and taxonomy of any plant. So any plant about which we, we needed a confirmation uh, about its identity and taxonomy, BSI was the last word. I am still sure it, it still is the last word. And it's this red data this about which uh, uh, Professor Barak uh, has elaborated uh, very well. New discoveries and uh, beautifully illustrated uh, um, uh, books on uh, specific genera. Uh, recently, when I had a, an opportunity to meet, uh, to uh, attend uh, the management committee meeting, research and advisory committee meeting, I was, uh, I uh, was handed over three copies, uh, or three volumes of the checklist, uh, which is a really uh, a landmark uh, uh, development in in uh, uh, in the contribution of BSI. So these uh, wonderful developments um, and achievements, I wanted to analyze uh, the contribution, um, uh, the achievements. Uh, of BSI and actually uh, the entire taxonomic uh, community of the country um, uh, more thoroughly and more, more critically so that I could uh, develop my ideas uh, of what should be done in future and, in, and for that purpose uh, the plant discoveries uh, from BSI again came, came very 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 handy. Here is a graph that you must be seeing uh, which uh, lists and gives the numbers of uh, plant and microbe uh, discoveries. That means new one is the new taxa and new distribution, as you would very well know it, what it means uh, from 2010 to 2020. And the new taxa, that means uh, new species, families that have been described from the country during these years. Obviously, it is evident that uh, uh, that work has been going on, uh, and some uh, at, in some years there have been wonderful achievements. There has been growth in the in both uh, the total reports as also the new species discovered. Uh, of course, uh, for the last one or two years, there has been a drop. Uh, that is. Uh, that is uh, perhaps more due to the conditions imposed by COVID rather than saturation of, of the data. Uh, there obviously is still a lot uh, to be discovered. But on the front of the discovery of species uh, 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 and other taxa, uh, 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 maybe just on the basis of morphological basis, um, morphotaxonomic basis, uh, we have been making a good progress. Uh, my next, uh, 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 my next concern was, how does it compare with the global discovery of species? And I could locate it to a 2019 uh, paper uh, on the new plant and fungal species reports that are that uh, have been compiled by the authors that are given here. For the year 2019, here is a status on, on a continental basis. And the map, as you would know, shows the size of the continents uh, 
in proportion to the number of species, new species that, that have been reported during 2019. And you would see Asia um, comes at the top of uh, the continents, uh, both with respect to the plants as respect to the fungi uh, that have been discovered, um, new uh, uh, species that have been discovered and uh, reported in 2019. If you take a country-wise uh, situation, uh, here is a country-wise list of the top 10 countries uh, from which most of the new species were described in 2019. Uh, with, uh, with new species published. Uh, and India has, in terms of plants, as also in terms of fungi, uh, the number of new species reported. Uh, India finds a place in the top 10. Obviously, uh, not only the richness, it is due to the richness of, of the plant diversity and some areas uh, which were previously less explored and where, where from a large number of species are being discovered. That means the, the Northeast, uh, the Western Himalayas, uh, uh, the the guards, uh, the western guards, uh, from where most of the new species are being are being discovered. Uh, it is also it also tells of the efforts of the Indian scientists, uh, including uh, this is a total data not only from BSI but from from all the scientists that uh, the BSI fortunately covers from all. Uh, the taxonomic, uh, you know, uh, organizations in India uh, from all the publications. So uh, this is a collective effort uh, of uh, of uh, the Indian taxonomists, and which is reflected among top ten in the world. So uh, while there have been for decades, there have been a number of reports. And, and great concerns about uh, uh, the perception that tex taxonomy is dying in India. Taxonomy is in its uh, vast, uh, in its honest lives. Uh, well, the data shows at least morphotaxonomy, at least description of new species, um, India is alive, and perhaps India is alive and kicking as well. So, um, let us take a pleasure from this fact uh, that at least in terms we have, we still have scientists like uh, Dr. Barak here and Dr. Pandey um, and uh, Dr. Yadav uh, who are contributing very diligently um, and the scientists of, of BSI who are contributing very um, uh, diligently towards advancing our taxonomic knowledge. And uh, the taxonomic information and the uh, knowledge uh, is fundamental to all biological sciences. In my last me uh, meeting when I attended, I uh, uh, showed this slide uh, there also, uh, because I find this is uh, uh, we must all taxonomists take, must take pride in the fact uh, that whatever others may say, the recognition should be there and at least with us the recognition should be there that taxonomy is fundamental to all biological scientific enterprise, whether it is uh, basic science, applied science, uh, without uh, taxonomy and systematics, uh, all other uh, sciences are meaningless. While uh, we take pride in the fact that uh, we are among the top countries that are making discoveries, uh, taxonomic discoveries, the, the science of taxonomy is evolving as uh, a glimpse of which have been, uh, has been provided by our uh, previous uh, uh, honored speakers, uh, it has been moving at a tremendous rate. Uh, the expansion is in terms of the source of taxonomic evidence, 
we now realize that uh, we uh, we cannot uh, uh, compartmentalize taxonomists cannot compartmentalize them, themselves into say a morpho taxonomy a cyto taxonomist numerical taxonomist chemo taxonomist molecular taxonomist and others every taxonomy every every uh, source of evidence or kind of evidence has an importance in ultimately uh, ultimate taxonomic uh, analysis some uh, at one time we were we were thinking that cyto taxonomy will replace all taxonomy numerical taxonomy will replace all taxonomy and during the uh, recent years we also had the perception that molecular taxonomy including DNA barcoding will replace all taxonomy that has not happened Dr. Barak has very correctly said that no uh, plants are far more complex than that plant reproductive systems are far more complex uh, than uh, than can be resolved by one or the other methods and we are moving more towards integration of evidence from different sources to reach some concrete conclusions about uh, the relationships, the systematics, the phylogeny of, of the plants. And ultimately, uh, their grouping into uh, some taxa which we call as a species, subspecies. You know, as uh, Dr. Barak has been saying, uh, despite, in spite of all our efforts, some components of taxonomy will remain as subject to uh, uh, subject to efforts, where the individual's perceptions uh, and individual's thinking will matter, and this will all this will remain so long as di differences in the people, in the thinking of the people, and the perceptions of the people uh, remain. But despite that, our effort has to be to reduce the uh, amount of disagreement uh, using different approaches and then reaching at a, con at a consensus that Dr. Barak says as uh, the agreed list of species, which uh, uh, when it comes uh, would be a really landmark achievement for taxonomy. Uh, the first one, uh, the slide I showed, is the evolution in in the taxonomic uh, uh, methods of uh, uh, methods. Uh, there has also been an increase. Again, this has been alluded to a tremendous increase in the depth and scale of taxonomic evidence. Not only uh, the number of techniques uh, have uh, uh, that are being adopted have have increased, have changed. But there are there has been a tremendous advancement in uh, the application of a particular technique in how we apply a, a, a particular methodology for taxonomic analysis. This is sometimes back we scoffed at, and morpho taxonomy uh, was regarded as uh, as a sort of an undi. Uh, as uh, a system which was an old system of taxon. But uh, look at the advancements that have been made even in morphological analysis of, of plants. They're due to tremendous advancements in instrumentation, uh, computational tools, and automation. Uh, microscopes can, ex can access from individual molecules to hold tissues and organisms and record millisecond events and produce uh, produce information in a wonderful detailed way which was not uh, ever possible uh, landscape level mapping is possible image analysis software can resolve complex shapes you know we we used to talk about the leaf of a, uh, the shape of a leaf just as a circular as ovate as linear but all those shapes can be resolved now uh, into components which can be quantitatively assessed and produce a data which is of which is a wonderful use uh, for taxonomic purposes dna based of course dna based uh, taxonomy has evolved 
from analysis of a few markers uh, to whole genome sequencing. So there have been progresses not only at, 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 in molecular taxonomy, but in all kinds of taxonomy, the advancements have been so great that we can reassess each and every plant again uh, using these uh, tools and uh, arrive at a wonderfully, um, you know, incisive uh, decisions. Some that we did on the Solanum melangena in Canum insanum complex, because we were more concerned uh, with the wild cultivated uh, plant species relationships uh, using a, a number of uh, methods. Uh, here we used, you see, uh, this, is, uh, this is a seed. On the left hand side, a seed that, that would appear in a simple, uh, uh, a simple binocular microscope. And uh, at one time, the the uh, the features that we used uh, for taxonomic purposes was just shape, uh, size, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, and very gross features of seeds and leaves. But as uh, in, as I said, as the instrumentation uh, and histochemistry tools improved. Uh, the availability of information for taxonomic purposes also has increased tremendously. Of course, microscopy has gone beyond this also now, and it is uh, wonderfully informative. Similarly, morphological analysis, uh, the methodology of analysis of data has also improved uh, very greatly and become automated again you have, have, so that very large sets of data can be can be analyzed which was which would have been impossible to uh, nearly 20 or 30 years back similarly chromosome analysis hybrid uh, meiosis uh, you know biological species determination all have have moved uh, from simple karyotypes uh, to chromosome painting where the source of of the chromosome, you can just locate uh, on a on a slide from which parent it ha it has come. Uh, this uh, the same can be uh, located. What I mean to say is uh, that in all the all the methodologies, uh, uh, there have been tremendous advances, and uh, which are uh, 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 which can be used. Uh, at different levels uh, to reassess, to assess or reassess the species uh, uh, complexes. Here, this was a, a chart we made out of the SSR grouping. And now, as we said, we have whole genome sequences available. So it has moved on. Uh, the, the technologies have moved on to a great, great extent. And it is here. Uh, that we have uh, we have to come forward and meet and plan accordingly. Just two examples, you know, one on morphology, uh, morphological data where where it has reached, and where we need not be shy of saying that we are using morphological data, but of course uh, an updated system of using. Here is a paper recently published. Uh, Comprehensive leaf size trait data, uh, just leaf size traits uh, using image, image analysis uh, uh, for seven plant species. You can see, and, and this is all from herbarium specimens, and you can see the amount of information that has been, been generated here. Uh, the number of images that have been analyzed and the leaf traits that have been extracted from, from an automated image, image analysis. Uh, it runs into thousands, and it covers uh, it covers uh, the entire global distribution of uh, this of the seven or eight species that have been analyzed for the authors. That is the volume of the evidence, the taxonomic evidence that is being generated these days. Similarly, look at uh, uh, the uh, the genome data that is being generated. Uh, you see, a, a, a paper of 2020 
uh, sequence 672 samples, 21 families, 142 genera, 530 named and proposed named species. Um, test also testing the efficiency of sequence information uh, for identifying plant uh, samples. You know, that is uh, the two points that I wanted to emphasize is the diversity of data that is uh, uh, being generated and the volume of data that is being generated to resolve taxonomic problems. Now, when you have such amount of taxonomic information available with you, uh, such huge amount, it has it has multiple applications. And again, my previous uh, uh, speakers have, have been very elaborate about it, that the utility of that information is, is also tremendous. It has a research utility, uh, the economic application, application in nature conservation, and application in public services. For example, research by systematics research, evolution research, research in ecology, climate change and natural products, then research in agriculture, medicine and industry, uh, uh, then uh, nature conservation, species inventorization, red list, protected areas determination, and public services like, uh, like citizen science, identification tools uh, and keys, and, uh, uh, and uh, recreation for recreation purposes. This information uh, is extremely useful. So uh, the importance of, the, of this information is very evident. I just wanted to know, uh, and uh, I, I went through uh, the uh, through the mandate of uh, BSI. Whether the mandate has also been evolving, uh, which would mean uh, that uh, the uh, that the Botanical Survey of India and uh, the very learned uh, managers. Uh, the learned uh, team of experts that are guiding its programs are taking into cognizance uh, these evolving opportunities that have been provided by, by new tools uh, and new methodologies uh, for the expansion of the program of BSI. And certainly, uh, I can say without hesitation, uh, that this has been, that these developments have been taken on board and these have been expressed in the mandate of BSI from time to time. You see, the BSI mandate in, uh, in 1954 was floristic survey, collection, identification, and distribution of material, and well-planned herbaria. And during the course of uh, 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 its, uh, you know, uh, development during the course of years. Uh, uh, its mandate has also uh, been been evolving uh, and obviously in response to the global developments that are that are taking place and uh, uh, in, uh, and including this includes the red data list, a species rich area, ex to conservation, database of Indian plants, documentation of invasive species, species restoration and rehabilitation, wild relatives of crop plants, economically important plants, high value medicinal and threatened plants, where we are more and more uh, moving towards uh, using this taxonomic information that is being generated for the development and social needs of the country, which is a, a very important step and would be appreciated. Uh, by all uh, the administrators and and, and planners. So here is uh, some more we continue capacity building, environmental impact assessment, uh, preparation of seed pollen and spore atlas of India, ecological niche model, uh, uh, modeling, uh, molecular databases, and providing assistance to government agencies. Uh, you know, um, uh, uh, and industry in, with respect uh, to biodiversity and bioresources related related issues. These expanding, as I said, evolving mandates 
uh, take uh, in note of the scientific developments uh, that are taking place uh, in the discipline of taxonomy as also the emerging opportunities uh, that these uh, 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 that taxonomic information provides vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the social and development needs of the country and this is uh, this is really a very happy development um, i tried to do a swot analysis i i really didn't do a swot analysis i am not uh, i am not in a position i am not capable of doing a swot analysis um, of uh, bsi uh, but i did see some reports where some weaknesses have been have been articulated shortage of scientific manpower a lack of expertise in modern techniques lack of exposure to current trends in taxonomy uh, research old and in inadequate infrastructure obviously these uh, have been um, uh, articulated from time to time and some of which uh, some of which were expressed some of which handicap every every uh, government department or every department faces and some of the which were expressed uh, during the last meeting which i had an opportunity to uh, uh, to attend so i thought uh, what what should be a, a, a road map for the next 20 years or um, uh, for um, uh, for uh, uh, bsi and to uh, a sort of a could we develop a perspective plan this is this is just uh, wild thinking and uh, i i am certainly not competent to do it but uh, given my given my little knowledge uh, and experience uh, working with um, uh, agricultural institutes uh, mostly dealing with uh, uh, biodiversity and by resources i thought uh, uh, what could be the plan for future and that was the theme that uh, uh, that i was uh, i was told uh, would be for for uh, this uh, for this seminar for, for this seminar. so um, a road map generally consists of the vision uh, what is the vision what is the mission these are uh, the levels at which uh, the plan is organized uh, the strategies, the goals, the objectives, and then the final action plan. So, could we think of, uh, and and this is just indicative. This is just my thinking. But ultimately, I hope uh, that uh, the uh, the institute uh, will work on this, uh, internal internalize this, and develop this through thorough uh, internal discussion and debate and come out with a document, I would be very happy uh, to see a, a, a vision document uh, which tells us what will, uh, BSI would be doing uh, in the next, next and how it will be doing in the next 20 years. This is just uh, an indicator what my perception is and I, again I would say uh, that this perception can be wrong uh, and but this is if it stimulates a discussion and a debate i think my job would be that what i have the vision of the bsi have um, uh, conceptualized is again uh, taking from what you have indicated um, in your documents to become the top plant and microbe taxonomy research and application organization of the country that that would be the vision and what is the mission? Uh, by 2040, BSI becomes the nation's premier center for plant and micro taxonomy research and application thereof in biodiversity and bioresource inventorization, conservation, and sustainable utilization. Please have a uh, have a thought at it and see if uh, we can move uh, in this direction. What are the strategies to, to achieve uh, this mission? Uh, I have listed eight strategies. Again, these strategies uh, are subject to discussion and these could change very drastically. 
But initially, uh, my strategy one would be survey collection and taxonomy, evaluation for economic traits, preservation. <coughs> uh, uh, that means herbarium specimens, archival material, and conservation, digitization and knowledge sharing, public engagement, capacity building, partnership, and uh, policy advocacy. And some of these strategies would be cross-cutting. That means across the previous other strategies uh, which I have mentioned. What would be uh, the goals uh, for each strategy? What are the goals? Why, why do we want to, to reach uh, in that in the uh, in the say 20 years from now by 2040 or 2030? Uh, where do we want to reach? Uh, uh, the goals would be survey collection of samples and related information from unexplored and underexplored areas of the country. Uh, this is uh, with respect to the survey collection and taxonomy. Survey and collection of all newly collected material. Taxonomic revision of selected groups. Integrative taxonomy based resolution of selected uh, species complexes. This is what I thought. Now, what would be the objectives for each goal? What would be the objectives? Uh, that means specific time frames, specific work and specific time frames, and, uh, and how that would be achieved. I have kept in view the paucity of, of resources uh, uh, that has been indicated, uh, and and which is true of all the all uh, the departments uh, and all the institutions. Uh, no institutions have everything that it wants. So how to how these could be materialized uh, th uh, through uh, through partnership, through collaboration? Uh, I, I have tried to indicate that out as well. So take, for example, goal one, we have said survey and collection of samples and related information from unexplored and underexplored areas of the country. What, what I noted during my past meeting and some of, some of, uh, uh, some of the speakers have also alluded to, uh, that there is a feeling that once we do uh, uh, a national flora, then what we don't do, uh, if we don't do state flora, uh, then what we do, uh, we do district flora, then we do sub-district flora, and then we do, uh, we repeat uh, the same at a, at a regular duration. But I think such types of collections have to be have to be data-based, have to be information-based, and have to be planned. Uh, because unplanned and uh, spur-of-the-moment decisions uh, would uh, 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 would give us, you know, limited returns, and and the returns on 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 such type of investment would go on reducing from from one. Uh, from one exploration to the other, other exploration, unless these are properly planned. So, so, my, uh, so the emphasis uh, when we are talking of unexplored and underexplored area is uh, we have to plan survey and collection areas based on past records, current state of collections, gap analysis based on biological richness uh, maps, and uh, disturbance indices about which Dr. Barik has, has said. So we must do before we uh, so we decide that uh, the, this state has to be has has to be explored again. Uh, this planning is very important, and uh, and this planning after this planning only an area where survey and collection expenditures uh, expeditions should be mounted. Otherwise, this will be. Uh, uh, the returns on, on that effort would go on reducing from year to year. Uh, with respect to survey and collection of rare and endangered species and crop-related wild species, again, 
planning is required planning survey and collection area based on past records again how much has been collected how much is actually present in our our herbaria and in our uh, our uh, uh, gene banks and gap analysis based on biological richness map disturbance indices and uh, ecological uh, niche modeling again would be an would be an important for with respect to specific species uh, ecological niche modeling would be a really an indicative of where is important for uh, for for um, collection for mounting collection missions and here again keeping in view uh, the limited resources available with that uh, it it may be it may be uh, fruitful uh, to have partnerships for these with area specific academic institutions and research organizations as potential partners in survey and collection for example in northeast why not university botany departments institute of bioresources i ibst uh, with uh, uh impal which is with the dbt and why some work on gbc and and orchids is is going on uh, similarly icr and bpjr shillong uh, where crop and crop uh, wild related work is going on uh, then center for bio resources and sustainable development uh, in arunachal pradesh they are also uh, mounting collection collection missions so why not develop uh, partnerships that develop mous uh, mous with the, these uh, organizations and uh, have joint exploration survey and exploration trips in fact i have talked to several of of these uh, these organizations where they have expressed their willingness to to collaborate and to cooperate with actively uh, with bsi uh to <clears throat> to launch uh, such collection missions uh, where they would be greatly benefited because <clears throat> the taxonomic expertise with these uh, organizations is limited uh, and they would be benefited uh, from the expertise available with uh, uh, with bsi so uh, in if these uh, activities are carried out in partnership Uh, i think there would be a a combined <clears throat> a multiplier effect uh, of of all the efforts uh, <clears throat> i am not uh, taking up all this all the strategies just for conservation no uh, uh, a, a, a strategy for conservation But what should be the goal uh, exit to conservation of rare and endangered species and crop related wild relatives in botanical gardens cv seed banks and in vitro banks and uh, i realized that dr parekh emphasized uh, in situ conservation um, yes that's a part of it uh, i didn't think that far because i thought uh, that is really uh, a, a challenging effort uh, but it is important it is the ultimate uh, test uh, of uh, the efforts towards conservation and if that also can be taken up uh, that would be a most welcome thing uh, then dna banks again uh, these should be the goals and for these again uh, <clears throat> uh, what should be the objective for say ex situ conservation uh, development of selected botanical gardens including greenhouses of bsi and other institutions located in diverse eco regions for field conservation of rare and endangered species and other selected plants uh, how many years we will take in that has to be indicated establishment of seed gene banks in vitro and dna banks or uh, <clears throat> or engagement in partnership with centers having these facilities development of species specific protocols for seed and in vitro conservation Uh, conserve all target species in one or more modes or in at duplicate locations again ears have to be given this in my opinion will be a complete will provide a complete spectrum of um, of technologies and the means uh, of uh, ex situ conservation of germplasm whether it is vegetative germplasm or seed germplasm uh, annual species 
or perennial species uh, at one or the other places, uh, the material, uh, whatever material you think would be uh, is most uh, important and deserves to be conserved for a for a long time, uh, would have opportunity to be conserved in one form or the other. And here again, I would this is this is again a huge and an expensive job. Establishment of gene banks, seed gene banks, um, is uh, is a very expensive uh, uh, enterprise. Uh, and uh, working in partnerships for research as also for application uh, would be uh, would be a, <clears throat> a recommended uh, strategy uh, to perform. For example, ICR and BPJR <clears throat> uh, could be sourced uh, for research purposes, standardization of seed storage, seed germination methods, in vitro conservation, development of seed and tissue uh, uh, cryopreservation protocols in which the BSI would be interested in, and the application. Uh, the facilities may be available or uh, could be discussed that if the facilities could be available uh, for long-term conservation of seed and, and selected species, seed of selected species, in vitro conservation and uh, cryopreservation. I am I am sure to have not taught uh, at NBPJR. Uh, the the institute should be very much interested uh, in crop wild relatives because it's the mandate of the of the institute is crops and crop wild relatives. So if wild relative species um, are the primary uh, are of interest to BSI, uh, then that would be the first. Uh, set of uh, plants and plant species uh, that NBPJR may be perhaps interested in, in in having and in having a partnership uh, with BSI. I know already you have an an MOU with uh, 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 with NBPJR, uh, but that MOU could be expanded and really made <clears throat> made workable for the benefit of of both uh, both the partners. <clears throat> Another uh, issue that I have taken is capacity building. Again, in terms of the, the scientific de developments that we know uh, that, uh, that have taken place uh, in the in uh, plant taxonomy um, methodologies and related um, uh, you know, conservation uh, and management and data and herbarium management uh, tools. Uh, the capacity building uh, is very important. And uh, our capacity building I have seen in two ways. Uh, the capacity building of BSI researchers and the capacity uh, building that BSI researchers can extend uh, to other institutes, uh, the universities and other centers that are involved in taxonomic research, taxonomy research and application. And that capacity building for BSI researchers uh, would be, of course, uh, modern integrative taxonomy, laboratory techniques, gap analysis, in vitro conservation and cryopreservation, and uh, digital information management. These are obviously, and, and uh, you as scientists of BSI would know uh, best uh, what advancements and what uh, <clears throat> capacity building uh, the researchers at BSI would, would require. But I, I am sure that uh, BSI has uh, has something, has a lot to offer uh, in by way of capacity building uh, of other institutes, of other centers involved in, uh, involved in taxonomy research and application. And in this regard, I would uh, I would like uh, to uh, to further strengthen the already All India Coordinated Project on Capacity Building in Taxonomy that uh, that you are running to really strengthen it and to make it uh, to make it <clears throat> as a tool of stimulating uh, taxonomy teaching and taxonomy research in the universities. And uh, I uh, would recommend. Uh, 
a very strong strengthening of this program in terms of uh, the monetary allocation uh, to the project as also the involvement uh, of not only the BSI scientists. BSI can uh, can be the, uh, the, uh, the center managing this uh, 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 this, uh, this uh, capacity building project, uh, but involving other experts uh, within this project to impart capacity uh, at uh, the uh, at the national level, uh, at the university level, at the college level, uh, uh, so that uh, the taxonomy uh, flourishes uh, there. And the feeling that we have that taxonomy is dying, and uh, uh, though taxonomy is not dying, but the relative attention that is being given to taxonomy teaching in the universities is uh, is comparatively low. We have done an analysis of that. Is comparatively low com compared uh, to biotechnology and other uh, and other such uh, fashionable sciences. Um, uh, and and uh, not only uh, an over average low level of uh, uh, low amount of uh, time is given to it uh, to teaching of taxonomy, uh, uh, but it is highly variable across university, uh, highly variable. So something has to be done towards towards that. And in that respect, uh, some points I have indicated here. Uh, promote taxonomy learning in universities through initiating a revision of syllabi, uh, special lectures by taxonomy researchers uh, on uh, by taxonomy uh, uh, research, um, uh, research and on rules uh, by experts, uh, students visits to BSI, support infrastructural development uh, for taxonomy research including herbaria, botanical gardens, digitization, and online access, support MSc and PhD taxonomy research on selected taxa and complexes. You see, these MSc and student and the PhD students will become instruments in furthering uh, the agenda of BSI if they are uh, if they are told that these and, and incentives are given that these are groups of plants on which we want uh, work to be done. From these areas, uh, we want to uh, work to be done. And this is how work needs to be done. So this becomes an additional working hand. And uh, while <clears throat> BSI may not be able to resolve all the problems within its laboratories, there will be laboratories that will be working on the agenda, on a national agenda of taxonomy development. Um, support intra-institutional integrated taxonomy projects on identified taxa and complexes. Again, BSI would take a lead in identifying uh, uh, the, uh, the groups of taxa, the complex, the, uh, the plant complexes that need to be resolved uh, and allocate these responsibilities uh, with a funding, with an attractive funding uh, support. Uh, to resolve these issues at different places. It's not necessary that all the work should be done by, by BSI, but it should it should know or it should somehow be in uh, in control uh, 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 of, uh, of what is being in done with respect, particularly with respect to taxonomic problems. What are the priority, pr priority genera and species that need to be resolved and, uh, and allocate these responsibilities to appropriate centers which will work both ways in developing capacities at the national level as also the uh, getting the work done uh, uh, work done that uh, bsi wants to be done and uh, public engagement uh, of course uh, 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 public engagement is extremely important for developing public support and public support means also political support uh, for your activity. So for that purpose, uh, increasing visibility, or uh, uh, I don't deny BSI gardens uh, have excellent visibility, but we need to do, there is a 
there is a scope of doing far more, yeah, improving the infrastructure of botanical gardens and museums, uh, not just for research, to enhance their public visibility and to ensure a pleasant experience of the visitors. Organize programs to familiarize the public about local vegetation and the needs for conservation. Increase facilities and material to support formal education at all levels. You know, these days, there is a slogan going on, plant blindness, that, uh, that even, even, they, even, even botanists, uh, experts in botany, uh, PhDs and MSCs in botany, are, are unaware, are blind to the plants that, that grow just around them. And we need to remove that, uh, address that plant blindness issue. Uh, and also create a public awareness and interest and a support group, uh, which becomes a support group uh, for realizing the, uh, uh, the need for, for government support to, uh, to botany and plant taxonomy. Again, uh, policy advocacy is again very important. Uh, advocate for government policies that promote education and research in plant taxonomy. And last time I also alluded to this. In US, uh, a botany bill was introduced some years back, though it has, uh, it has lapsed, it has been reintroduced. Uh, in 2019, we don't know what the situation about this botany bill is, but uh, it is a realization, it has come out of the realization that traditional botany uh, and traditional uh, and taxonomy is being neglected uh, at the cost of, you know, modern sciences, we don't say botany, we are shy of saying botany, we say plant sciences. So. Uh, genomics and all those, all those, then the, the botany is suffering. So, uh, to promote that, uh, in US, a bill was uh, placed: botanical science and native plants materials research restoration and promotions act, uh, with the purpose of promoting botanical research, uh, botanical science capacity, generating demand for native plant material authorization of federal native plant material and related activities so that the native plants and the information and research on these native plants uh, is promoted uh, through funding, through policy support. We need to do something something similar uh, to promote uh, botany, to promote taxonomy uh, in the country and support and obviously the support to BSI. I just towards the, towards the end, I just wanted to have a look. Uh, what is the funding support that is uh, being uh, that is available to BSI? Uh, that and as as you can see, the uh, the graph includes uh, the actual budget that has been uh, for the last over ten years. Uh, that has been given to uh, extend uh, uh, given and utilized actually uh, by BSI. Uh, also, it uh, carries a graph on the annual growth of the budget. Uh, that that would give an an indication how the, how the government is perceiving it, at least how the ministry is perceiving its importance. And what I can say, there are encouraging signs, though at this time um, to have a budget of over 80, say 86 crores or something is, is not big. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the thing is that, that from 2008 to 2009, uh, from nearly 2022 20, crores, the budget has increased to 86 crores. There is a decent increase in the budget, though it is not adequate to carry out all the activities. Uh, the budget has been increasing every year. Uh, also, in some years, there has been a substantial increase in the budget. If you look at the graph, uh, uh, the annual growth of the budget, and if you see it, at some places, the annual growth of the budget has been nearly 30%. There has not been, uh, 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 at only at some points, uh, in 2015 and 16, 
there has been actually a reduction in the budget. The annual growth rate has been in the negative below zero. Now, interesting fact in this is uh, look at the blue graph in which the, the ministry's budget growth, year on budget growth is indicated. And uh, you will see uh, by and large, as the ministry's budget has been increasing, the BSI budgets, uh, budget graph has also moved along with it. So it has impacted whatever allocation has been made to the ministry. It has impacted the budget uh, to BSI also. But very interesting fact and encouraging fact that I could note, I'm, I, I may be uh, reading wrong signals, uh, whereas there has been a negative growth in several years, there has been a negative growth in the budget of the ministry. There has not been such a negative growth in the budget allocation to the BSI. That means at some point, the ministry, uh, ministry realizes that BSI is playing an important role, has an important uh, role uh, in research, uh, in research and development. Of course, uh, you would uh, uh, be, uh, you would be championing for a far greater increase, given the opportunities available and the challenges given. You would be, uh, you, uh, you would uh, be championing for a much larger. Uh, growth in the budget, but let's take uh, uh, let us take comfort from the fact uh, that, uh, that so badly, so, uh, so badly, and with, with efforts of uh, 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 what I mentioned earlier of advocacy, public involvement, we can, uh, the BSI, and hopefully. Uh, 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 hopefully work towards uh, and justify a greater uh, a greater allocation of resources and improvements of its infrastructure and capacity. Thank you very much for this opportunity uh, 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 for this opportunity. Before I end, I would, I would like to I would like to record my uh, thanks to the uh, to Dr. Mao, uh, as also to the chairman of the committee, Professor A.K. Cole, with whom I shared my thoughts for this lecture and who gave me some very important insights for preparing this. Thank you all. Uh, my pleasure uh, being here with, with you. So I end my lecture uh, with this. Thank you very much. So, in technical section, um, we had two lead lectures given by Professor Bari and Professor Khayalu. On the topic, he highlighted the viewpoints of BSI and given his view for taking up unfinished work like Accelerating floristic survey of one product, one digital herbarium, resolving taxonomic ambiguity, and the study on threatened taxa. In second lecture, Professor Khariyalu on the topic BSI FX taxonomic research organization, fulfilling its role, he also appreciated the work and publication of BSI like flora of India, state flora, plant discovery, and emphasize the importance of conservation. Yeah. Sir, he has already taken up these work and will take up other work in coming years. I thank you very much, sir, for sharing valuable ideas for BSI point of view. Thank you so much. Okay, yeah, we we'll just will come back. Good afternoon, everyone. We welcome back everyone after the lunch session. We are now about to begin our second technical session of the day. <clears throat> While the session is uh, continues, everyone is requested to keep their microphones on mute. The reporters for this session are Dr. Umesh Kumar Tiwari. Scientist C, BSI Headquarters, 
Dr. Debashita Dutta Pramanik, Scientist C, ISIM Kolkata, and Dr. K. Avinash Bharti, Scientist C, BSI CNH Kaura. As we are already past our time scheduled, I request all the speakers to complete within their allotted time schedule. I would now like to request Dr. Kanat Das, Scientist E, CNH, a specialist in diversity and systematics of wild mushrooms to share his presentation on the topic entitled Reinvestigating Morphology of Wild Mushrooms in the Light of Molecular Phylogeny. Respected uh, Director of Botanical Survey of India, uh, distinguished delegates, eminent scientists, my fellow colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, you know, uh, myself, Konad, I'm in front of you virtually to uh, deliver a small talk on reinvestigating morphology of wild mushrooms in the light of molecular phylogeny. Uh, we will quickly pass through the immensely diverse world of wild mushrooms. Now, morphotaxonomical parameters used in macro and micro morphology for identification. A limitation of morphotaxonomical studies, and then resolving taxonomic issues with the molecular phylogenetic inferences, and finding key morphological features for easy separation in species complexes. We will now uh, go through the macromorphological diversity. Uh, 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 these are the uh, guild mushrooms. We, uh, you know, they uh, they are most common, and we have uh, nearly uh, over 400 genera and uh, 11,000 species in this group. Mm, similarly, we have uh, poroid, fleshy poroid mushrooms. We have nearly 75 genera and 1,100 species. Similarly, we have woody poroid uh, fungi, we have chanthrails and trumpets, we have tooth fungi, we have stomach fungi, we have clove fungi, we have uh, coral fungi, we have bird nest fungi, then jelly fungi, then skin cones, then carp and swasha fungi, then uh, earth tongues and jelly babies, then shadows then carbon and cushion fungi, and we have some other groups like morels, like spadularia, like wetidia, etc. And we have also have cauliflower fungus, shaving grass fungus, ER fungus, and uh, corticoid fungi. So, you know that e e these are the morpho basic morphological groups, and each and every group is further classified into several genera and numerous species. You know that our exploration, thorough exploration, followed by uh, a characterization, will be of no use if we do not um, go uh, morpho, if we do not do or do not carry on the macromorphological characterization, followed by micromorphological characterization in the laboratory. And we apply the golden formula that is more the morphological features, easier the identification process for us. And you know that this is in field, we, we use some uh, format and to record our morphological characteristics like pilias, like, you know, we record the gills, characteristics, features of gills, type, then flesh, then latex, then we used to take taste, then we note down odor, color of spore print, and then chemical spot Yes. We can see these are some, some of the uh, some features uh, 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 you can see. Uh, see, in case of cap, we, we used to record wetness, texture, hyphal association, like as you can see the squamules. Then uh, we may also have um, the uh, different patterns of hairs on the uh, cap. Then the marginal characteristics are very important for us. We have to note down the, the different features of uh, margin, cap margin. Similarly, you know that the gill attachment is one of the important features to identify the mushrooms. Uh, we, our gill may be free or it may be broadly attached. Mm, density of gill is also very important. Uh, you know that we may have distant gills or we may have very much crowded gills. Mm, similarly, we have to record the shape of the stive and again, in the spore preem, what I have already mentioned that the spore preem is sometimes very informative uh, to uh, decide the genera even. 
you know that the if you have white spot ring it, it you can say that you may have a, a russulacy members or if you have brown then you can say cotinariacy or etc and after coming back in the laboratory we used to take hundreds of sections uh, from our dry specimen and we used to record the characteristic features like hyphal arrangement like basidia and cystidia see these are from my drawings you can see these uh, these are the patterns of cystidia and these are the um, uh, ornamentations in spores and from my um, drawings you can also see how diverse the spore morphology may be so in spite of having all these macro and micro morphological features you know that we have still have to cross so many hurdles you know on one hand we have differently looking same species differently looking same species on on the other hand we have similar looking different species how can we identify all those uh, hurdles you know all those problems so these are the limitations you know, among the species in several genera there are a large number of overlapping characters often the delimitation in species are mainly based on variations that exist in cell level and only be observed under compound microscope after taking several sections and so many genera have cryptic species or species complex intercontinental lookalikes are quite common and most of the indian species are known after their european or american lookalikes so checking of conspecificity is a major concern for our mycologists and to find out key character or delimiting factor is another major issue so we started you know that these were the drawbacks of only if we apply morphology that is why we started applying molecular phylogeny and we have some challenges ahead that many traditionally used phenotypic characters in fungi do not necessarily predict phylogenetic relatedness multiple mor morphology based species bear same dna then multiple cryptic species that is lookalikes are called under same name then sequestered members means advanced members of a genus are treated under different genera and combined approach then so combined approach of molecular phylogeny and morphology to be applied to find out correct key characters or delimiting factors now let us see some example we we uncovered hidden diversity among cryptic species or species complex is species complex see you know uh, lactiflus volumus it was long back in, uh, discovered from europe and the, you know in, in, uh, gradually uh, in, uh, so many of its look alike so many of similar looking taxa started discover started discovering or started coming up and you know that people as people misapplied the name from all the continents these species were uh, these species were found from different continents and people started misapplying the name of lactiflus volumus to their counterpart right so we in india we we found four of this type of species see this was the five, first one where we have minute differences like you know the distantly gill uh, distant gills and in the second uh, second taxon we found slender type in the third taxon we found cracked pileus in the fourth one we found radially wrinkled pileus we observed micromorphology micromorphologically they all are same see these were our detailed micromorphological studies there was there was no difference almost then we observed further the cap cuticle and then we found that in case of species in third species in case of third one we found long hairs right so we ran our multi gene phylogeny and we found that see uh, and this is the or the the first clad is nothing but the clad of original european lactiflus volumus and mm, this is our third species that is lactiflus this is our third species lactiflus varsiformis this is third, this is our second species and this is our first species and when we again we work for our mm, fourth species then we again read and our phylogeny and now we know that in this complex we have nearly 19 species now from all over the world and you know that the first clad is for original lactiflus volumus from europe 
and this is our fourth one and then we started reinvest reinvestigating that where is the morphological difference then we found in case of four species we have bifurcate cystidia this is very important key feature for separating the species similarly you know that we resolved the blackening russulus you know that their blackening russula is one of the very interesting group of wild mushrooms you know in this mushroom the mushrooms initially they are white if you touch them if you handle them then it turns black quickly right in this group we have nearly uh, in this group you know you, uh, we have seven to eight species from europe russula nigricans adasta acrifolia densifolia etc albo niagara and so on from india we found these two okay it was white and it gradually turns black right it was collected from the in the uh, from my in the left uh, the species which is in the left it was collected from uh, 12000 feet and on my right this this was collected from uh, 8000 feet right we thought that whether they are same or they are the european species russula nigricans or something else we didn't know then we we observed micro morphology both are same then we ran our molecular phylogeny then we found see that mm, this is the clad for original russula nigricans a similar looking species and here is our first indian species russula ashivoi and here is our uh, second indian species russula indo niagara and now our based on our phylogeny only we found we know that we have around 15 blackening russula from all over the world and um, so uh, you know that uh, two from india three from you uh, north america and rest are from europe you see now we again started reinvestigating where is the morphological morphological differences then we found that yes in our first species we have that brown margin of the gills that is marginate gills right and in case of our second species we don't have any brown margin so that is very important feature for the uh, wild mushroom that whether the gills are marginate or emarginate we resolve the identity crisis of gyroporus castaneus uh, from asia you know that um, on my left this is the gyropor original gyroporus castaneus it was discovered long back from europe and it, it is a huge very large species and in Asia, in, including India, we find we find another species which is which is very same, very same, very similar looking, but very small. And we we started calling it as Gyroporus castaneus. You know, from Thailand it was called as Gyroporus castaneus. From China it was called as Gyroporus castaneus. And India we used to call it as castaneus right then we then we you know that uh, run our its phylogeny as well as lsu phylogeny and we found see this is the original gyroporus castania sensu stricto from europe this is the clad for that and here is our species right in case of our lsu phylogeny see this is gyroporus castania sensu stricto and here is our species and in this way we discovered the first asian gyroporus uh, guide for us from India, right? And then we started reinvestigating the morphological separation, how we can separate in from the European cast original castanias. Then we found that yes, the Indian or Asian species have reniform spores, but whereas in case of European species, we we do we don't have reniform spores, but and further in Asian Asian and in our Asian species, we have incrustation. You see the black spots incrustation on the hyphae so these are the micro morphological differences and in macro morphology our species is very very small in comparison to european mm, taxon we demystified asian lookalikes of north american russula compacta you know in 1918 one species russula compacta was discovered from us it was orange brown and if if we touch the gills it turns um, brownish orange right it, it used to turn brown brownish orange in india we got these two this this first one this is on my right this is the second one and you know that the first one was collected from uh, collected from uh, eleven thousand feet and 
the second one and under coniferous and on under coniferous tree and in, and the second one it was collected uh, in deciduous forest from quercus right so you know that we uh, it was very difficult because both are similar looking and you know if you touch both of them it will the white gill turn brownish immediately so you can't separate them we ran our molecular phylogeny two gene molecular phylogeny then we found see this yellowish part is actually nothing but the russula compacta complex and you know that this is the original american russula compacta and where you see this is our first species here is our first species and here is our second species russula pseudo compacta and then we then we again started finding out the morphological separation where our species really what is the difference there is there is there any difference or not then we found that in case of our second species we have forked gills you can see the forcation forked gills and in case of our first species we don't have any forcation in the gill rather we have short gills we we also observe the micromorphology is you can uh, from my drawing you can see that almost both are same the only thing is only different thing is that in case of our second species we have the incrustation uh, incrustation in this uh, uh, this parallel hyphae and in case of our first species the incrustation is present in the erect hyphae see now we saw the mystery of the sequestered milk cap from tropical this is very interesting you know uh, will you will you really believe that this species this species is uh, this is uh, 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 this species and this gill species belong to a same genus it is really very difficult and you know that we also didn't believe that but it happened with us you know that um, this is the sequestered form of a gilled a gilled mushroom sequestered means most advanced form uh, here the all the reproductive part is covered under uh, under a uh, under a cuticle and they are called as sequestered mushroom and you know that um, we ran our molecular <laughs> hello one more minute uh, please one more minute okay. Okay. Um, so you know that uh, we we read on our we read on our phylogeny and we found that see this is this uh, interesting species is well in we, uh, well inside the gild uh, gild mushroom genus lactaria see this is and, and we discovered our fast uh, Indian uh, sequestered mushroom uh, of uh, belong to Lactarias, that is Lactarias rajmahalensis. And see, this was our uh, molecule. Uh, this was our morphological characteristics. Characteristics. Finally, you know that you know uh, we identified uh, in this way. We identified several uh, several Asian taxa. And in case of the, this is another example. You know, we have uh, Europe, we have North uh, North American and European uh, Rompidius glutinosus. And in case in in India, we we have this right one, and uh, which is which is very small. And we started calling it also Gompidias glutinosus, but, but, but our phylogeny resolved the matter. And now we know that this is the um, Gompidias glutinosus, Gompidias glutinosus clad, and here is our species. So morphological characterization was indispensable earlier. Without proper characterization, it was not even possible to know any species, any species and place it to a proper taxonomic position or to establish conspecificity or to discover a novel species. Morphological characterization is still very important now because our poor or wrong characterization on a species will not only mislead the scientific community, but we will also be caught red-handed by another taxonomist who has the same specimen which displays different characters for me sequence from any biological material is meaningless until and unless you know its morphology thank you very much um, for giving me a chance to uh, share my presentation thank you to request dr shashil kumar singh scientist e and head of office at northern regional center Tarahun, 
a specialist in taxonomy of bryophytes, to present his lecture on the perspective of Indian biological studies and contribution of botanical survey of India. Good afternoon to all of you, respected directors, sir, senior scientists, uh, Dr. S. K. Srivastava, sir, my fellow colleague. Today is very auspicious day. This is foundation day we are celebrating. My talk is very simple, very, very, very simple. Just uh, simply some glimpses I am going to show you. Actually, what are bryophyte? Why, why they are important to us? Why we should study them? And why we should preserve them? See, they are the first colonizer of terrestrial habit. They are called land dwellers or amphibians of plant kingdom. Because so they are called land dwellers and amphibians of plant kingdom because of dependency of water for their sexual fertilization. They are also known as Lilliputian of plant kingdom because of their cryptic nature or very smaller size. They are an integral or essential part of ecosystem due to a high water holding capacity. They are having 400% more than any other group of plant that's why they make habit habitable to other group of plants they are the second largest group of green plant after the angiosperm their life cycle is important because they the gametophytic or haploid phase of life is dominant one uh, a comparative to other group of plant where the, the uh, main plant life is deployed. See here the life cycle here from where that are archegonial to the this archegonium formation this only this complete farm here it is haploid only from zygote to this Sita formation, this food, this Sita, this food formation only deployed. This phase from here to here, this up to his capsule formation is dependent on the gametophytic formation. Now, why they are so important? Because of that, they are used as fuel in Finland, Sweden, Germany, Poland, and other developing countries. They are used as fuel. The peat masses, they are source of fuel gases, etc. They are used as soil and chip peat because of water holding capacities. And peat is an important soil conditioner and is commonly, commonly used for the agriculture and agriculture purposes all around the world. Ornamental, it, it is used as ornamental and it is used in potting for several uh, flowers and other things garden soil for decorating uh, the gardens etc in industries moss industry is there in france sri lanka they used to sell the mosses for this uh, this uh, putting this uh, arcade and all those things for absorption of water for their protection of uh, their uh, body, uh, plant body. This Kakpot village in Bargeswar district in Western Himalaya, the houses, roof of houses is made up of mosses. This household insect replant is, uh, is storing of foods, the mosses are very useful. In China, they are also used in different kind of medicine, skin diseases, ringworm, insect bite, cut, burn, worm, cardiovascular diseases, bronchitis, cystis, all kind of diseases they have been used. And the recent reports also reports that these mosses are useful in this uh, 
polio and this uh, some other uh, chronic diseases also these are some ecological importance pioneer in land plant they useful in soil erosion uh, formation of peat soil development rock builder food tank center nutrients recycler indicator of acid rain pollution control the mosses especially the mosses are used for the reclamation of the soil modification of soil and they are also used in the pollution monitoring several project uh, have been run in not only uh, foreign countries but in india also this uh, pollution indicators and other things have been used now come to the diversity and distribution as far as bryophyte is concerned only eight bryogeographical territories are defined the eastern bryogeographical geographical territory is very rich in terms of bryophytic diversity followed by the western ghat all together the masses 1576 taxa belonging to 338 genera and 57 families are known to occur in india this data is adopted from jagdish lal 2005 the liver wart 891 taxa belonging to 134 genera and 56 families and harnwort 39 taxa 6 genera and 3 families reported from all these territories these are major habitat aquatic are very few only uh, rixia floater rixio carpus natan and rixia boensis are aquatic in nature and some mosses like fishy dens grandi frans also found under water riella aphenis is benthic in nature most of the hello liverworts are terrestrial and if we take majority of bryophyte are epiphytic either mosses or liverwort mosses and liverwort found in rain forest in especially in northeast india and the western ghats if we talk about the pioneer workers william mitten so montem and royal in illustration of Malen Botany in 1832 of Himalayan mountains. He mentioned few lines about mosses and liverwort, but a significant 1861, followed by the French Stefani, who have described 4,000 species across the world out of that 525 species from india belongs to liverworts and thereafter many species been reported but the main contributor professor shivram kashyap who was the founder secretary of the indian botanical society aptly known as father of indian biology who have reported 161 species from western himalaya in his in his monumental work the liverwort of western himalaya and punjab plains there after professor s k pande instituted a school of biology in lucknow university and published 32 articles in different journal and his student professor ram udar successfully Followed, followed the tradition and trained about eight student, prominent student professors, S. C. Srivastava, Dr. Dhirendra Kumar, 
डॉक्टर आदर्श कुमार डॉक्टर आशा गुप्ता एंड डॉक्टर डी के सिंह हु हैज सिग्निफिकेंटली कंट्रीब्यूटेड टू द इंडियन ब्रोलॉजी स्पेशली द लीवर वर्ल्ड एंड हार्मोनट ऑफ इंडिया दीज आर द मस्कोलॉजिस्ट हु हैव कंट्रीब्यूटेड ऑन मासेज ऑफ इंडिया हेडविक वेल नोन पब्लिकेशन स्पीसी मस्कोरम फंडोरम हु हैव पब्लिश सम स्पीसीज इंक्लूडिंग फ्रॉम इंडिया देयर आफ्टर मिटन इन एटीन फिफ्टी नाइन रिपोर्टेड सेवन सेवेंटी फाइव स्पीसीज from indian region an biologist in indian region first time reported 2417 species from indian region thereafter ganguly published three uh, eight fascicle in three volume 9990 species from in uh, mosses of eastern in india and adjacent region there after chopra 1975 the student of professor mehra he has published one book mosses of india and the mosses of western himalaya and from botanical survey of india dr j n bora significant significantly contributed the leskini of the himalayas published in records of botanical survey of india volume 24 and la la jagdish lal listed checklist published checklist list 1576 taxa from india the, they were main taxonomist who contributed on mosses now way forward what to be done what work has been done see these areas uh, seen by pink color under explored areas these areas if you can see these areas in western himalayas eastern himalayas and western ghat are partially explored and these areas punjab west rajasthan central india eastern ghat and well explored these are the contribution of botanical survey of india Eight PhD scholars, seven books, more than three hundred research papers, including these publication: Notochaelae of India, Nepal, published by D K Singh; Hepatitis and Anthocyanidae of Great Himalayan National Park, published by D K Singh and myself; Manual of Liverwort and Harnwort, by D K Singh and myself; Epiphyllum Liverwort and of Western Himalaya, by Mona Lisa and D.K. Singh, Liverwort of Hanu, Liverwort and Hanwort of India, and an updated checklist by D.K. Singh and ourselves, Leskini of the Himalayas by J.N. Bora, Potassi of India by Nihal Aziz and J.N. Bora, Liverwort and Hanwort of India, Sikkim, impressed by D.K. Singh, Liverwort Hanwort of Mizoram by me. Dinner Rixia in India by me, Liverworts and Harnwort by me. How I like century by Sri Padas, Liverworts and Harnworts of Punjab district by the Sri Sri Liverworts Harnwort by our uh, West Sian district by Anuradha uh, Pradesh by Siddharth Singh Deo, Masses of uh, Darjeeling district. These are PhD PhD thesis done by Botanical Survey of India. now at present there is no research scholar working so we need some strength and we need some funding so that at least the legacy can be maintained and the gap area can be fulfilled so that we can at least this group important group can be saved and can be well documented thank you very much Algae are the simple photosynthetic organism that lack embryogenesis. So algae are ubiquitous, means found everywhere. When light and moisture is there, algae will grow there. 
and here i am considering the fresh water forms actually in india so 7179 species reflected under 268 genera and uh, belonging to 200 families of the fresh water forms and if you categorize the fresh water forms the ph value is 4.8 to uh, 5.4 to 6.8 its ph value and if you further categorize the light intensity depth is also considered for while studying the fresh water forms so Uh, if you look the contributions out of these the green alga is dominating uh, among the other algae so if you go the green algae right from volocales to carels so all are the fledgling forms and carels is the Called stone worms, and node and inter node is also formed in this group. Next group. So in fresh water form, so dacans is the one of the important one constituent. So for the primary producer, so for study the dacans, so if proper cleaning is required. So these are the methods. Next row. So these are the belonging to the basilar phytic different group of dacans. Awesome. All are the dacans. In some countries, actually dacans basically divided into two: centric form and pentelic form. So all are the freshwater dacans. And these are the pimilaria. so taken from our own sem machine located in our in cnh so these are the centric dacans is it is also from our own machine ha uh, yes sir all photographs uh, taken by our sem so that time sir uh, one technician is also there sir and uh, dr oen moria sir coordinated the whole things so looking the sem things and arrange the very good one at technician sir they help like anything sir so particularly the all dacans emails i have taken from in our lab so this is the biochemical pathway see these are the another group of uh, algae called the dinoflagellates and in the member of particularly dinoflagellates Around 20 species inhabiting in the both the habitat, the freshwater forms as well in the marine form. So these are the perigonium of the member of dinoflagellates. Also, cerium is very common in the Ganga water, sir. Particularly, this Cerium species I have collected during my Jharkhand study. These some algae cause bloom also. So actually, bloom is the excessive growth of the algae, and that time only one species is growing. This is the Eugenia sanguinea, and for this photograph taken in the Pakur district of Jharkhand. and the another bloom is a macrocystis it is a blue green algae it also called bloom and it is a toxic uh, for a, it cause a, a fish death and in human also so it cause allergy so according to fish for taxonomic study the algae divided into 11 classes so rhodophyci theophyci basically inhabiting in the marine forms but betrocor uh, spermum is the only genus growing in the fresh water form uh, belonging to the rhodophyci and this uh, 
the cross parama is plenty available in uh, dehradun i have collected them so these are the economic importance in food industry in cosmetic industries nowadays i be using like anything that's a bike me pole to one thing was nahi the so these are some common algae so actually algae so so its common name is kai saval daldali also called so these are the member of green algae blue green bat algae and on the basis of pigmentation also you can also categorize the algae next yellow green algae like that golden algae pass karo last last sorry okay so this mm -hmm. so these are the member of thrysophytes so dinobran is a member of very common many algae so growing in the fresh water form in the form of planktonic forms so if you use the plankton net for collecting those algae so you will get the number of diversity also cyanura so these are the melomonas so these are the schizoclonium these are the habitats also what about also so these are the thermal spring forms you can also categorize the algae growing in the basis of temperature also so mesigo cladus only found in the hot spring water these are the data of this macro also macro so nahi nahi uska next sir next we are basmets ha main iske baat Hmm. Well, these are the desmids. Actually, these desmids is the indicator species of the fresh water forms. I have told that where the pH value is 5.4 to 6.8, that means the water condition is the fresh water form, and in these fresh water forms, desmids growing plenty. So these are the filamentous desmids. Okay. Member of blue green algae, calotrix. These are the green algae. Pass it on. These are blue green forms. These are again diatoms. These are the nostoc. And particularly, these nostocs has a uh, yeah, heterosis, and it has a capacity to absorb atmospheric nitrogen and release to the soil. For the, it, it, it also increase. The fertility of the soil. So these are the many genses, sir, or the diverse group of algae. So line diagram is also needed, sir. So sometime, I mean, no doubt we have a very good camera, and we are in CNS, we are using a Nikon microscope. But in some time. the old conventional things like camera lucida diagram in image mirror things we are there so it is available and we are preparing the drawing also we have the yuglena phosphora so these are the member of yuglenoids phosphorus so we are maintaining in cryptogamic section in the liquid forms as well in the herbarium forms particularly those sir as the macro algae we are preparing the herbarium so all things are properly maintained so here i will say if you categorize the whole study the algae in india so pre independence and after independence for the sake of convenience actually in pre independence uh, dr k p biswas earlier he was a superintendent of indian botanic garden and between 1924 to 1947 he made a number of contribution in the fresh water forms 
एंड आफ्टर इंडिपेंडेंस सो के एस श्रीनिवासन एंड आफ्टर इंडिपेंडेंस रियली इन द फील्ड ऑफ एल वी बी एस आई गेट ए स्ट्रॉन्ग मोमेंटम मोमेंटम एंड वी आर थैंकफुल टू द पब्लिकेशन डिविजन सो फोर वॉल्यूम ऑफ चेकलिस्ट ऑफ इंडियन एल वी हैज बीन पब्लिश एंड इन द डिस्ट्रिक्ट फ्लोरा सो एलगल फ्लोरा ऑफ देहरादून एलगल फ्लोरा ऑफ देहरादून पब्लिश एंड एज फॉर कंसर्निंग द स्टेट थिंग्स so jharkhand flora is on the pipeline very shortly it will come up so these are the contributions of bsi so from back to the jharkhand so harvarian seed so in the we are preserved in form of the harvarian seed the macro algae karan material here Here the C X Columbus microscope is using. So before we found so uh, C X forty one microscope, and these are the very very basic things to collect algae from nature. So Kerala Center uh, in the these are the same N D R I Lucknow Indian Museum Kolkata. Earlier actually Dr. Sri Nivasan was posted there. and still is valuable algal collection is available i have seen sir but it is most of the collections are in the form of marine in kosheri islands and gulf of manar he has collected like anything they are maintaining sir sir he was also our collection so these are the some important uh, books actually most of the books are published by I A R I New Delhi. So actually, Dr. M S Randhawa, that time, but specifically M S Randhawa is the I S officer, and he has a very keen interest towards algae, and he make a program to write a monograph on algae, and under his leadership, so these books are, I mean, published, and these books are, I mean, very few you know to survive. A very low cost. Sir. Even then, now rate is not revised. Twenty-five rupees, thirty rupees, forty rupees. So these books, algal books, are available in IARI cell counter. So finally, I say, my Johar, thank you. Actually, this is my Jharkhand language, sir. <laughs> thank you. Uh, one last question. Ah, uh, yes, sir. This. Uh, Have you ever thought of using these that uh, scanning electron microscope images of diatoms mm -hmm. for this uh, as a uh, slide scope for printing in the book or uh, in a like using in a textiles or this thing no as a for designing it will be very beautiful very because, beautiful but because I have, anyone has done it is. Or you try to bring up all that for yes, sir, collection yes, sir, images, very good idea, and sir. that can be uh, commercialized for printing, yes, sir, of printing. on the design yes, of yes, textiles and other things. This is very good. Uh, I, your data uh, coming for us is very interesting. You make it and show me. Well, yes, sir. Hello, madam. Yes, 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 superficial growth of bark of olive trees tani pot proposed lichen as one of the genera of plant entities the foremost taxonomic account under genus lichen comprising 80 species was published under the 24th class of cryptogamy algae in species plantarum by linnaeus eric acarius a swedish botanist preferred as father of lichenology coined several terms for the structures peculiar to lichens and described many new genera and new species these are some of the important points about lichens lichens are nature's most remarkable alliance and one of the 
dominant organisms in ecosystems covering as much as 8 percentage of the earth's surface they are the dominant autotrophs in the polar and south polar regions of the world in recent years their importance has been considerably improved as they are the most significant bio indicators of air pollution and ecosystem health largest number of lichens are ascomyces and almost half of the ascomyces are lichenized in addition there are a few lichenized basidiomyces lichens are represented by 20000 species in the world and 2981 species in india if you see the lichen studies in india linnaeus included one species in his species plantarum under genus lichenus lichen fusiformis today the species is known as rosella mondagini erica carius later added four more species from india rice 1825 added five species belanger 40 species including six species new to science later mondagini 1842 37 species these are the other european lichenologists who added more species from india based on the collections of other plant explorers if you see the lichen studies by indian nationals s r kasyap h choudhury and g l chopra of university of punjab are the foremost indian nationals made collections from the himalayas particularly kashmir darjeeling and sikkim these collections were identified by a l smith and a jal brekner the first and foremost work on lichens by an indian national is lichens of the himalayas part 1 lichens of darjeeling and sikkim by g l chopra in the year 1934 dealt with the detailed descriptions of 80 species in 38 genera and 20 families post independence lichenological research in india the first attempt on lichen flora of india was made by dr kalipada viswas the then superintendent of royal botanic garden calcutta now he organizes botanical survey of india this was 1947 in his publication title the lichen flora of india with assistance from dd avasthi enumerated 678 species of lichens from india ceylon and burma under 116 genera and 40 families out of which 440 447 were from india dr k viswas 1947 who inspired and guided dr d d avasthi in his initial stage of career at botanical survey of india to opt lichenology as his career later d d avasthi established a well developed school of lichenology at lucknow university lucknow 12 phd's were awarded in lichenology under his supervision now he is referred as father of indian lichenology the establishment of cryptogamic unit at headquarters of botanical survey of india with the establishment of cryptogamic unit at headquarters of botanical survey of india in 1961 the lichen studies were initiated by c g darne and k n roy chaudhry who made collections from west bengal the unit became more active after the induction of dr k p singh the second student of dr d d avasthi lagno university center as a regular staff member of botanical survey of india later he served at shillong and allahabad k p singh made explorations in northeastern states of the country odisha madhya pradesh and tamil nadu he established lichen herbaria at shillong and allahabad also enriched the herbarium of kerala these are the bsa researchers who worked on lichens gp singh is the first student of dr kp singh and served at shillong gangtok and allahabad p bujar barwa a pinakio p k dishi jagdish ram swarnalada pushpi singh pooja gupta siljo joseph sk gupta they were associated with dr kp singh and gp singh on various research projects on lichens bsa team studied the states of arunachal pradesh assam Manipur, Meghalaya, Mizoram, Nagaland, Sikkim, West Bengal, Odisha, Rajasthan, and Andaman and Nicobar Islands. This is at national level. Polyphyllous lichens of India, lichen families Graphidaceae, Rosaceae, and Pyrimidaceae in India. These are the publications at national level. Indian lichens and annotated checklist. Additions to the checklist of Indian lichens after 2020. Polyphyllous lichens of India. Taxonomic creation of the lichen genus Ophigrapha sensuleto in India. 
this is the indian lichens and adapted cichlids by kp singh and gp singh compresses 2303 species in 305 genera and 74 families this is polypolis lichens of india 136 species in 38 genera and 15 families this is taxonomic revision of the lichen genus Ophigrapha sensilato in India, 40 species in seven genera. These are the state level or regional level publications, Nilgiri Hills, Eastern Himalayan region, Manipur, Mahalan, Sikkim, West Bengal, Assam, Rajasthan, Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Over 350 research papers were published in national and foreign journals. Lichen flora of Nagaland is the first lichen flora of the country, comprises 346 species in 86 genera and 38 families. This is lichen flora of Assam, 300 species in 83 genera and 26 families. This is macro lichens of Sikkim. This is lichen flora of Sundarbans Biosphere Reserve. If you see the discoveries, BSA team discovered and published two new genera, Hipsora and Avasiella. This is Hipsora indica, this is Avasiella indica. Over 120 species discovered as new to science, over 400 species reported as new records for India. Several additions to the states and geographical regions. If you see the herbarium holdings, tallies having over 8,000 specimens, over 18,000 at Shillong, 2,000 at, 2000 at Gangtok, 10,000 at Allahabad, 4,600 at Port Blair, as a whole, over 42,000 specimens. Other lichen research centers, Lagno University, Lagno, a well-developed school of lichenology was established by Dr. D. D. Avasi at Lagno University, Lagno. Dr. Avasi and his students made significant contributions and worked on floristic and revolutionary aspects, published five books and over 100 research papers. Next center is National Botanical Research Institute, Lagno. Here, the Lichenology Lab was established by Dr. Ajay Singh, Dr. D.K. Ukrabi, Dr. Sanjeeva Naiha, and their associates worked on fluorescent, revisionary, ecological, bioprospection, and pollution monitoring aspects. Over 80,000 lichen specimens available there. They published six books and over 500 research papers. Next center is Agarkar Research Institute, Pune. Here, the Lichenology Laboratory was established by Dr. P.G. Patwar, Dr. Urmila Makija, and her associates worked on floristic, revisionary, and bioprospection aspects. Over 30,000 30, lichen specimens from Western Ghats, Northeast India, and Andaman and Nicobar Islands available in that center. Next center is M.S. Swaminathan Research Foundation, Chennai. Here, the Lichenology Laboratory was established by Dr. G.N. Hariharan who worked on floristic, ecological, and bioprospection aspects. If you see the current status of lichen diversity in India, total number of species, 2,981, total number of genera, 468, total number of families, 84. If you see the distribution of lichens in different lichenogeographical regions, Eastern Himalayan region and Northeast India shows the highest numbers with 1,586, followed by Western Ghats, 1446, Western Himalayan region, 1805, Andaman and Nicobar Islands, 552, Gangetic Plains, 483, Central India, 473, Eastern Ghats and Deccan Plateau, 337, Western Rai region, 115 species. If you see the group form analysis, 2053 species are clusters, 728 species are folios, 224 species are fruticos. Habitat analysis shows 2,335 species grows on bark called Carticolus, 600 on rock called Saxicolus, 396 on soil called Tericolus, 176 on living leaves called Polygolus, and 55 on mosses and bryophytes called Masicolus. These are the 10 dominant families. Graphidaceae highly diversified with 55 genera and 542 species, followed by Parmeliaceae, Arthoniaceae, Calisiaceae, Telocystaceae, so on. 
these are the 10 dominant genera graph shows the highest numbers with 119 species followed by pyrenilla lecanora corina cladonia so on this is the current status of lichens in different states of india uttarakhand shows the highest numbers with 998 species followed by tamil nadu 888 species arunachal pradesh 735 species west bengal himachal pradesh 690 species so on the says haryana and delhi are not having any reports on lichens future prospects if you see the eastern himalayan region the region is well studied by bsa team in this region mizoram tripura cold desert of sikkim are yet to be explored well and these are the gap areas in this region the western himalayan region this region is well studied by national botanical research institute cold desert areas of leh and ladakh and sanskar valley are the gap areas here the western ghats are concerned the state of maharashtra is well explored by alarka research institute the states of karnataka kerala tamil nadu lakshadweep dadra and nagar haveli systematic studies need to be carried out in the gangetic plains plains of west bengal bihar jharkhand uttar pradesh delhi and haryana need to be studied well the central india the state of chhattisgarh to be studied well eastern ghats and deccan plateau all the three states andhra pradesh telangana odisha needs to be studied well the western rai region the state of gujarat to be studied well andaman and nicobar islands are well studied and well documented recorded species in india is 2981 estimated species 4500 to 5500 systematic study of unexplored and underexplored states of the country to be carried out revision of families and genera as per the recent concepts to be carried out sterile types are to be described and recorded using molecular tool as lichens show highest diversity in the tropics with the clusters growth forms the western ghats and eastern ghats of peninsular india need to be explored thoroughly to assess the lichen biodiversity of the country a detail need to be prepared these are the images of some polypolis lichens lichens growing on leaves these are some growth clusters growth forms these are folios growth forms these are fruticose growth forms this is a basidio lichen this is the only basidio lichen reported from india from great nicobar island thank you thank you sir for the interactive session uh, dr rashmi dubey how do you deliver the lecture sorry for the inconvenience of my Okay, okay. Thank you so much. Thank you for your patience. And I would like to tell sorry to all. I don't know because some some technical issues. Uh, I was facing the problem. So now I will start the presentation. The topic of my presentation is emerging world of microfungi in botanical survey of India. So uh, this is the out contribution made by botanical survey of India. What are the milestones we have achieved? What are the projects undertaken? Objectives followed and publication from botanical survey of India. And what are our future visions and conclusions? So, uh, firstly, I would like to highlight the contributions which are made by Botanical Survey of India towards expanding the frontiers of knowledge of microfungi in India. As we all know, that fungi they are very uh, cryptic, and under described and hyper diverse organisms. And uh, uh, and then on and above. Uh, 12 to 13 million species of fungi are being estimated and in uh, India is uh, just making the research and they are helping in updating the fungal catalog of the world. So these are the microfungi experts from Botanical Survey of India, late Dr. B.V. Koshogada, scientist. He has worked on million layers of India. Volume 1 and Volume 2 was published from Botanical Survey of India. and. Uh, one of our colleague, Dr. Ashish uh, Venkatesh Prabhu Gaukar, he has worked on microfungi associated endemic and threatened plants of Meghalaya. And right now, I am working on the microfungi of Maharashtra, Karnataka, and Goa. So, first, uh, trace the things what achievements we have done in Western Regional Center and what work we are doing. 
So I would like to highlight the contributions made by our circle. So the milestones which we have achieved. I am audible. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So the uh, milestones what we have achieved in developing the basic infrastructure facilities for microfungal research. So in 2010, joined Botanical Survey of India. In 2011, I was working on a Nikon microscope and was doing morphological studies. So me and my microscope were the companions. In 2013, we have achieved some uh, scanning electron microscope and we have started doing the same studies on different microfungi. And in 2015, we have achieved the micrological laboratory which we are having the cultural facilities and which was inaugurated by the then director of botanical survey of india and in 2018 with the help of our department and from external funding projects from sub dsc we have established the molecular lab in western regional center of uh, botanical survey of india so we have undertaken the projects in a different juris uh, in jurisdiction of wrc that is follicular fungi of maharashtra Microfungi of BRT Wildlife Sanctuary, which was under Flora of India. Then again, taxonomic studies of microfungi of Sanjay Gandhi National Park. Uh, fourth projects, I have also worked as a microfungal expert in uh, NMHS funded projects of Great Indian Himalayan uh, Project, that is biodiversity assessment through long term monitoring plots in Indian Himalayas landscape. And again, uh, we have taken uh, external funding projects that is morphological and molecular characterization of terrestrial little fungi, and now we are working on bambusicolus fungi of Goa. So these were the these are the mandates of our research work. That is, as per the mandates of Botanical Survey of India, we are doing the survey and documentation of microfungi, whether it is little fungi, follicolus fungi, soil fungi, aquatic fungi from de uh, different terrestrial eco ecological area of Maharashtra. And we are trying to enrich the uh, cultural facilities on different uh, growth medium, uh, morphological identification of fungal species. Then we are doing the molecular sequencing of interesting new and rare uh, taxa for its authentic identification and studies of fungal diversity in product, protected areas by statistical approaches and cataloging and conserving the fungal uh, germ plus. So this is the map which is pre uh, prepared by QGI studies. Uh, it uh, clearly depicts the areas which we have already covered. Uh, mostly we have worked in the northern western, uh, western parts of uh, um, in uh, Maharashtra state. And uh, in Karnataka, we have uh, done the microfungal studies of BRT Wildlife Sanctuary. And uh, in uh, external funding projects, we have done the later fungal studies of northern western parts. So these are the methodology. So our main is, uh, aim is to identify the fungi and increase the taxonomic tools. So first we are uh, doing the morphological characterization, which is based on colony characters, microscopic characters, protein bodies and spores. Although the second steps we are not following and BSI, but I thought of showing because it's a um, combined um, tool to identify a fungi. That is the second step of physiological and biochemical analysis. The third step, of course, we are doing the molecular tools and uh, doing the barcoding of fungi and using the IDS region of uh, fungi as a, um, as a marker. And uh, again, we have just started working on multi-gene sequencing. And now we are planning to give some transcriptonomic studies also, so as a part of advanced molecular studies. So this is a... Uh, uh, pictorial picture how we are moving falls to fungi. We are going to the field and just uh, uh, doing morphological studies and step sterilization process, particle filtration methods according to the standard protocols we are following. And now I will come to the molecular techniques what we are uh, doing on, in our lab. So uh, we are just amplifying the uh, ITS regions and if we are not getting the result then LSU then of course SSU and if we are not getting the results from IDS reason then we are using the secondary uh, barcodes like TEF and RPB1 or RPB2. So how does the barcoding works? After uh, fungal um, collections we are bringing it to the culture, extracting the DNA, doing the amplification of a segment, DNA segment that is by PCR. Then we used to go, go, uh, go for sequencing that we are doing by outsourcing. When we are receiving the chromatogram files, we are submitting it in NCBI 
and uh, they are comparing the sequence and generating the barcode so this is a very uh, short uh, protocol so this is a preservation of fungal specimens or cultures at bsi wrc pune uh, which is the very important aspects of fungi we have to preserve and conserve the uh, fungi so these are the achievements of polycolus fungi i will just go in short how many field tours we have taken in the first project 11 field tours and and have studied 332 species in this second the micro fungi of brt wildlife sanctuary karnataka here we have taken five field tours and uh, in all we have studied the 215 species and uh, 166 species and uh, we have reported uh, two new species and one new genus uh, this is the taxonomic status of micro fungi sanjay gandhi national park uh, here we have just tried to complete the all substrates uh, of fungi as later fungi polycolus fungi soil fungi and uh, water fung uh, fungal species and here we have conducted the molecular phylogeny of 39 species and have recorded seven new species and uh, uh, 16 new records to fungi of india these are the glimpses of sanjay national uh, uh, gandhi national park uh, these are the activities in the field i will just skip the slides uh, of course the external funding projects which is on morphology and molecular characterization of terrestrial litter fungi of northern western parts of india uh, report has already been submitted to sir and here also we have taken seven uh, field tours and uh, near about 5000 square kilometers of area were covered and here we have done of course molecular phylogeny of 42 species and have published one new genus and three new species and seven new records to india these are the areas of northern western hearts and now the ongoing project is of bamboo sicolus uh, fungi of goa we are working on this project and this is these are the achievements uh, till now 153 bamboo sicolus fungi has been studied and we have conducted the molecular identification and phylogenetic analysis of 24 species and these are the phylogenetic tree and we are we have done the ids of uh, ectomium globosum uh, new bentonia subglossa and one species of course uh, we are working on the multi gene uh, uh, phylogeny of colodiscula species hope it may be a new species so uh, so this is the cumulative research work what bsi wrc pune has done we have completed six projects fungal species documented and described uh, 1656 research papers published uh, by myself after joining the bsi that is 62 species and number of genera published four number of fungal species published 22 and the new fungi to india 31 uh, fungal taxa and the new fungi to maharashtra is 114 and new host record is 118 and these are the project reports we have submitted to our headquarters uh, bsi headquarters of all the projects and this is a cumulative graph which shows uh, the publication of uh, taxa different taxa uh, after 2011 so 22 uh, new species and uh, four uh, genera we have published uh, after joining the bsi so it's a contribution of botanical survey of india in the world of microfungi i am highlighting my uh, botanical survey of india here so these are some publications uh international publications of new species uh, kamalomyces uh, mahabaleshwarensis again this is gusiomyces bambusicola these are some international publications i would like to highlight as a contribution of bsi uh columella belgrensis then uh, sporodesmelia belgrensis stigma coyanensis uh elytrospora mumiensis very recently published in phytotexa then again elytrospora indica published in mycoscience uh dictospora mathrensis uh then this uh, paper was published recently in 2021 and this is the new genus which was published in george journal so these are a uh, few of my publications i am highlighting here and besides taxonomy we are also working on the statistical analysis of fungal diversity because now the key point is to assess the fungal diversity so besides taxonomy we are planning and we have already done the statistical analysis of brt wildlife sanctuary and sanjay gandhi national park and the publications they are in process and they have been they have been accepted also and uh, 
before that we have already published two papers uh, one is in indian phytopathology recently only i got this uh, paper published in the month of feb only uh, that is inventory and data analysis of leaf inhibiting fungi of protected areas of northern western uh, northern maharashtra india and statistical analysis of polypolis fungi diversity of konkan region so these uh, besides my publication i would also highlight would uh, like to highlight the work of dr hosha godar sir um, he has worked uh, very nicely uh, in botanical survey of india and has published materials of india volume 1 and volume 2 so beside this uh, i have also represented bsi in international conferences although physically i was not able to attend the conference but my both the papers were accepted in international mycological conference to represent bsi uh, i have uh, and these are published in their proceedings and re uh, represented bsi in various national conferences and delivered uh, a lead lectures in wider lectures in uh, national conferences and achieved the award uh, best women scientist award and represented bsi in all india botanical conference of indian botanical society which was held in 2017 so we are working on uh, capacity building programs as one of the mandate of botanical survey of india we are training msc girls station students uh green state development programs also then uh, psd then mc dissertations on microfungi and now i will uh, i would like to uh, record the forthcoming actions what we are doing we have started the digitization of microfungal herbarium specimens housed at bsi wrc pune so this is one of the innovative work in india because in other institutes they are of course they are doing the digitization of microfungi but they are just uh, uh, carry on overing the symptoms which are visible on the host specimens they are not doing uh, the digitization of microfungi which are visible uh, in the slides so under this section the metadata of all our jo um, annulation plant projects has been completed and the digitization of 390 six fungal species are completed and 200s are remaining so these are our uh, future uh, vision of course accelerating the mycological studies in our explored areas and resolving the taxonomic issues of fungal species by multi gene phylogenetic analysis development of culture independent methods uh, like uh, meta genomics and transcriptomics and uh, bsi Uh, we hope to see bsi as a national repository of fungal culture collection center and strengthening the mycological studies in, uh, in india and these are the vision of uh, botanical survey of india so conclusion my conclusion botanical survey of india uh, can play a very important role in saving saving this fungal kingdom uh, capacity building programs for conservation of fungal diversity professional training and development of mycological expertise to be developed to ensure that there is a sufficient capacity for the future and we can promote education and awareness about fungal diversity and some uh, at national levels some higher authorities has to take the step that ensure fungi are included in each countries and state national and state biodiversity strategies and action plan and uh, in intergovernmental science policies also fungi uh, should be included so thank you so much thank you so much good evening to all of you respected directors senior scientists colleagues the students fellows and all welcome you all in the world of cyanoprokaryota my topic of the talk is cyanoprokaryota the present status and future vision as we know the cyanoprokaryotes are photosynthetic organism convert the solar energy into chemical energy by using the sunlight carbon dioxide water and minerals the first primitive form of the life called the cyanoprokaryotes originated 3.5 billion years ago the cyanoprokaryotes performing photosynthesis originated during 3 billion years ago The cyanoprokaryotes has been uniquely positioned in the evolutionary hierarchy of the earlier living world predominantly even during pre-cambrian era. The cyanoprokaryotes are nature's first foundational mother and father for causing the photosynthesis. Cyanoprokaryotes are the founder of aquatic food chain. In short we can say that cyanoprokaryotes are 
प्रोकैरियोटिक यूबिकुटस ऑटोट्रॉपिक माइक्रोस्कोपिक प्राइमरी प्रोड्यूसर्स एंड ऑफ कोर्स दे शोइंग द प्रोकैरियोटिक नेचर दैट्स व्हाई दे आर क्लासिफाइंग इन द प्रोकैरियोटिक किंगडम दैट इज मोनेरा द साइनो प्रोकैरियोट्स कैन फाउंड एवरीवेयर uh and they are more tolerant even they can grow in such an environment there uh, there where no other vegetation can grow and the, they are the fresh water marine abound on the rock soil and in the cold lakes also and underneath 5 meter of the ice pack in craconite pools also the the craconite pools formed by the microorganism on the uh, lakes or in the ice also of course in thermal spring and all other any other much um, object then all over the world the 7500 species of the cyanoprokaryotes have been reported and in india 1232 reported by the bsi the first cyanoprokaryotes reported from india that is calothrix indica from assam by montagni at 1849 Presently, about 290 draft genomes and 85 fully sequenced genomes are available online in the Sinobase database. The Sinecu Sistis was the first one whose genome was fully sequenced in 1996. Uh, they are referred in the literature by the various names commonly known as blue green algae, Cyzophyta, Cyzophyta by the Cohen 1853, Mixophyta, Mixophyta by the Stenberg. Gar 1860, Cyanophyta and Cyanophyta by Smith 1938, and blue green bacteria, Cyanobacteria and Cyanobacteriophyta, and Cyanoprokaryota by Comrade and Anagnostiades 1998. The Cyanoprokaryotes have lot of potential and as a resource for biofuel production, and there are so many species that have been used nowadays, but this Sineco Cucus elongators are commonly used nowadays for the biofuel production. And they are of course a source of various commercial products. And even the pigment present on the Sinoprokaryotes, that is carotenoid and phycobini proteins largely used in the bio industry and have high commercial value. and some other carotenoids are also used as a food supplement spirulina is a rich source of the riboflavin thiamine beta carotene vitamin b12 etc and the so this is spirulina species have all 20 amino acid which is required for the human body it's a very important species and nowadays it is available in the market uh, in the form of capsules then used and tablets also the sacrum uh, sacrum is the known as the cyanobacterial gel and it this, this is extracted from the species of the echinothes sacrum and that can be used as a moisturizing agent and nowadays is commonly used as of course the nutrition food supplement and bio fertilizer soil binding and the so, uh, nitrification and uh, the soil salinity weeds growth decays increase the soil biomass and possess the unique attribute of nitrogen fixation in the paddy field also and these are the species commonly involved in the fixing of the nitrogen and biomolecules and uh, of course they are they are very important and some of the species like uh, nostoc elipsosporum formidium tenu oscillatoria tenu is also uh, on the uh, these species are uh, having a very good medicinal property such as the antimicrobial antibacterial antiviral antifungal anti tumor anti malaria and immunosuppressant and anti hiv activities also and these are the environmental implication the cyanobacteria are also potential candidate for uh, removing the uh, contaminant from the soil and water and these are the species involved in this and now coming to the scientific project is the contribution of the um, of the bsi in this study the first was project was the preparation of checklist was of the cyanophyce of india taxonomic studies of cyanophyce of india i will take only those project which are related with the cyanoprokaryotic study only then the epiphytic algal flora of a jcp ibg and microalgal studies in different lakes and of course this antarctica project in the preparation of checklist of cyanophyce of india all together 
1,213 species have been uh, recorded, and uh, the 945 uh, species, 208 variety, and 87 forms have been recorded. And in this checklist, one family, five genus, 206 species, 96 variety, 49 forms are incorporated. And it has been updated uh, from 1849 and after Desika Chari 1959, this was published by the BSI. It is a big contribution of the BSI. And here you can see in this is um, uh, data, the maximum species are reported, which is from the order Nostrocares. And here, uh, if we see the state and union territory wise, the maximum studies have been reported from Uttar Pradesh, followed by Karnataka, Maharashtra and West Bengal. And this book was released by the then Secretary Ministry of Environment Forest, V. Raj Gopalan, uh, uh, in the Biodi International Biodiversity Day. And this book is now frequently referred in the algae base, which is the global algal base of taxonomic nomenclature and distribution. And this is a big contribution of the BSI. And it is reported everywhere. Very commonly, the algae base it is reported. And uh, the, the, in one meeting I met with the uh, Professor Anand, he was very much excited that after Desika Chari, what the BSI has done. So I have shown uh, this book and he said that I want this book. So I have given my copy to Professor Anand. Now he is no more. And another project, the taxonomic studies of Sino Pisi of India. We surveyed Malda district, 55 water bodies and samples were collected. Altogether, three order five families, 22 genera, and 105 species have been recorded. And out of 105 species, 27 new record photographs of collection of the cyanoprokaryotic samples. And this is the water bloom cyanophysian forms in Bardovatola pond of Malda district of West Bengal. And so, like a DM25 digital microscope, which is using for the um, identification, taking photograph and identification of the species by using the, some uh, two softwares. And these are some of you of the photo micrographs of uh, this project. As I told, 93 species, 9 variety and 3 forms uh, uh, have been reported from this uh, district. This is the book. Uh, published by the Botanical Survey of India. Now coming to the EPVT Calgal studies of AJC Bose Indian Botany Garden, Howrah. We collected uh, the uh, algal or the cyanoprokaryote samples from uh, all over uh, the area. EPVT samples were uh, it was available. So here you can see that the samples are collected from the Ludovia Maldivica. You can see here the algal or the dinocoperiots patches and you can see you can uh, here you can uh, easily view or differentiate the uh, cyanoprokaryotic patches and the chlorophyce algal patches here and uh, apart from this the microalgal patches were also observed from the pebbles, boulders and stones and the sculpture of the triton was done and the upper two uh, petalis, you can see the culture of the Tetan uh, of the Duluvia Maldivica, and lower is the soil uh, culture from nearby, taken sample nearby from Duluvia Maldivica. And here you can see out of six classes, the maximum species have been reported from the uh, Sinophyce. Here you can see the maximum species are observed uh, from the Sinophyce. And uh, there are uh, uh, three species which is reported uh, from these plants, the Formidium tenu, Cytonema uh, oscillatum and Oscillatoria tenu, containing the secondary matter of light, uh, sulfo, um, sulfolipid uh, compound and the phytoelizin and the antimicrobial compound and which are having the antiviral, antifungicidal and antibacterial activity may be provided the support to this treatment for uh, uh, that's why it's uh, there in, from 126 year old plant which is available in our garden in very good condition. These are few of the photo micrographs of the algae uh, the, the and here you can see the patches on the great banyan tree 
collected the samples and these uh, some of the photo micrographs of the uh, cyanoprokaryotes observed uh, from the uh, get banyanji and here uh, we have uh, also taken the sample from the mangrove plants uh, exodium distincum and you can see in the uh, here uh, in the roots uh, you can see uh, the uh, algal patches are there and these are the cyanoprokaryotes observed from the mangrove plants and uh, this is the rosebud building the samples were also taken from the rosebud building and these are the cyanoprokaryotes um, species observed from the rosebud building area and now giving us only from the gate banyan tree 20 species have been re uh, recorded and out of 20 species nine were cyanoprokaryotes and two eukaryotes from lobelia maldivica 47 species from a single tree which is a world record when i visited to delhi tour then uh, in this year some of the uh, scientists discussed with me and told to Uh, that i want to publish this work and so that work was reported in the uh, science reporter also they, uh, they are telling that you plus uh, please give me the details so that i want to publish this in our science reporter so that uh, the people or students who are giving the complete examination also will be benefited and out of uh, uh, 37 species 21 cyanoprokaryotes economic distinct from 27 species and out of 27 9 cyanoprokaryotes species and 5 eukaryotes rubber building 16 uh, species cyanoprokaryotic species 12 out of 16 12 uh, cyanoprokaryotic species were observed and 2 eukaryotes now coming to the microalgal monitoring of the Uh, water quality of Leram Lake of Ajisibus Indian Botany Garden. Our here we also initiate the study by using the grander technology and using the um, this on the trial basis. The grander technology is on the name of John Grander, an Austrian naturalist, created a method of re-energizing the water bodies. and improve the quality of the water and regenerate the sewage material improve the aquatic environment so uh, this type of three units are installed in the leram lake at different places and uh, after uh, before uh, uh, this installation and after that the species were observed and we are found the uh, difference but because this lake is too, too large so the uh, very slight difference has been observed and these are some of the photo micrographs uh, of cyanoprokaryotes from leram lake under microscopic study and the second project of the priyan lake and the king lake here you can see the area uh, from where this is the jora pipe area from where the water uh, is coming the sewage water is coming from the outside and polluting our uh, lakes and this is uh, this is the jora pipe area and uh, this next side is the priyan lake you can see here the water uh, and uh, this is the king lake and the samples were collected from us by using the phytoplankton uh, net and uh, after that we have got the uh, this multi function water uh, proof meter and for for the, uh, the uh, we can do the water analysis these are few of the photo micrographs from this lake and in uh, leram lake all together 128 species have been recorded and from tian lake and king lake more than 200 species have been uh, uh, reported and out of which six new record and see new record but this is not from the uh, cyano prokaryotes from other classes of the algae and now Uh, we have taken the project sadi lake project and samples were taken from the four different places monthly and you can see here the um, uh, cyanoprokaryotic samples on the plankton net and here the we are taking the uh, water analysis uh, um, parameter we are studying by taking the reading and here you can see that uh, if you want to check that this uh, this is working properly or not uh, so that the ce will be the half of the tds 
here you can see in all the reading the, the C TDS is half of the uh, CE and the DO parameter is also little bit fluctuating in the um, uh, summer months. These are few of the photomicrographs of uh, Sardil Lake. Now coming to the Antarctica project, it was also a big achievement of the BSI. Uh, before that, all the expedition uh, visited from the BSI, uh, the Samakar Oasis. This was the first project for the Larsiman Hill approved uh, for the elder studies. As such, without any changes from the NCUR Goa. And uh, this is the uh, location map of uh, this area. Here you can see the left side the Brokenis Peninsula and the right side uh, is the Stormies Peninsula. We covered this project was for the two Austral summer, but we uh, collected almost all the samples in the one Austral summer and uh, except this Stormies Peninsula because the Stormies Peninsula is, comes under the Asapa, Antarctica, especially protected area. Apart from this, the samples were also collected from the other places. And uh, we covered five uh, peninsula and uh, seven islands. These are the name of the islands and peninsula. And here you can see the maximum species have been recorded from the broken East peninsula. And these are some of the field photographs of waterlogged area of Antarctica. And this is the uh, cyanoprokaryotic sample on waterlogged area on the rock. And this you can see the sperm. Uh, also, you can see here uh, the, the samples here. I have a question to uh, conclude within two minutes as we are running out of time. Yes, it will be concluded on two minutes. And this is uh, uh, the samples collected from the feather uh, of the bird. And this is the sample you can see under the eyes. These are the cyanobiosian patches uh, within the eyes. These are some of the beautiful lakes of the uh, Fisher Island of Antarctica. And these are the carbonite holes from where we also uh, collected the samples. This is the lab uh, in Larsiman Hill area, Antarctica, from where the sample uh, was processed. These are few of the uh, photomicrographs of the samples, and all together, 80 species have been recorded uh, from this uh, expedition, uh, and which is the highest number in the BSI. Not more than 25 or 30 species have been recorded in any expedition from the BSI. And you will be happy to know that uh, in uh, out of 80 species, 52 species of the Sinopisian forms of the Sinoprocarriers. And we have uh, 140 publications, including 70 only on the Sinoprocarriers and 5 books to publish and three in the pipeline, one in the, I think, as per publication section of BSI in the press, and one in the publication section, or is under revision. Now, the future plan is the establishment of the phycology lab with the isolation and culture facility pattern of the diversity of the soil, uh, cyanoprocaryotes and algae, antiviral uh, cyanoprocaryotes and algae, and its bioactive compound, and submitted, prepared and submitted the project at BSI headquarters on development of National Center for Sinoprocaryotes, Algae, Fungi and Plants Biodiversity Genomics. Thank you. So our Indian coast is more than uh, 7,500 kilometers including two islands, uh, two uh, uh, islands, that is uh, Andaman Nico Islands and Lachadiv. So all together, all the entire Indian coastline as well as these two islands, you know, we covered more than 7,500 kilometers. In 7,500 kilometers, so far we have covered 70% of the places, so far we have covered the uh, algal collections. Out of that, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, Karnataka, 
Goa and Andhra Pradesh and uh, now the presently um, West Bengal. These are the states we entirely covered. In Andaman parts, only uh, Mahatma Gandhi Marine National Park, then Bandu uh, area, and they were uh, Viper Island, Chidiya Tapu, and North Bay and Ross Island. And um, um, you are Neil Island and Avalak. These are the places we covered. And remaining, almost in Andaman itself, we are having gap 70% of the place you have to cover. In Lachatiu, coming to the Lachatiu, Lachatiu so far you are not touched, I think, in as, uh, as per the uh, BSI concern. So now, yeah, I think everyone knows about the uh, algae. So I don't need to explain about the algae. I am coming to the marine macro part of uh, marine macro algae uh, introductions. It is uh, marine macro algae adapted to survive in the ma marine and marine surrounding area that is uh, estuarine waters. Uh, multicellular to and uh, the microscopic to multicellular structure it is available in the all over Indian coastal region as well as the world bank. Uh, usually epiphytic and growing on the uh, solid substrate. Habitats and habitats of the seaweed depending on the ecological factors. Differentiated into the three parts, that is whole parts, stripe and fan. The whole part is for the hanger of the plant, stripe is erect the plant and the fronts are uh, for photosynthetic purpose and the storage of the food materials. Uh, based on the uh, pigments and reserved food materials and the reproduction such as, we are uh, divided into uh, three groups, that is chlorophyce, phyophyce and rhodophyce. And uh, reproduction is vegetative, asexual and uh, asexual reproduction. Reserved food materials in the marine macro algae are uh, starch, picoxanthin, and phycoerythrin and fluorine swatches and all in the marine macro algae, the starch food materials. The, uh, in the chlorophyce, pigments, chlorophyll A and B, reserved food swatch, and uh, examples, uh, Calarpa, Idothia, and Alva, like this, more than 112 uh, species are available in Indian coastal region. Worldwide, it is more than 2,000 species are available. In brown algae, Pigments, chlorophyll A and C, uh, picoxanthin, reserved food materials, manital and laminarian. Example, Ferina, Engariella, uh, Sargassum, uh, like this, so many species are available. In the world, it is more than 1,800 species. In India, it is 111 species so far, uh, support 11 species so far, we have recorded. In red sea fish, pigments, chlorophyll A and D, carotenoids, uh, phycoerythrin and phycocyanin, reserved food materials, chlorotin starch. Uh, example, your uh, hypnia, gracilaria, uh, griffithesia, and halmia, like that, uh, 440 species are available in our Indian coastal region. Worldwide, it is more than 7,500 species are available. These are the such uh, so flow chart about uh, uh, seaweeds available in worldwide and India. I told you already the green seaweeds 1,800 in worldwide, red seaweeds uh, 7,200, uh, and brown seaweed 2,000. In India, it is uh, brown, green is in uh, 212. Uh, red uh, to uh, 442 and brown algae 211 species available, all is 806 species available in our Indian coastal region. The earlier uh, workers of all over the world, that is the uh, early history of uh, algae in the world wide. Ancient Romans named it as a uh, ficus, uh, that is uh, Roman people's, and Chinese it is called as Tasso, and uh, Hawaiian people's it is Limu. In uh, 2012, uh, sorry, in the 12th, 12th century itself, the people uh, consumed the algae, and before uh, three, uh, 30, uh, uh, 300, sorry, 3000 century itself, they have started for the eating of the marine macro algae. The hamby of the first collection by our uh, foreigners from our Indian coastal region, that is Amphiroa by Herman in uh, 1672. The systematic knowledge has been grown after the Innovation of microscope in the middle of the 17th century. Linnaeus only given the algal name in his place, Swiss plant, a general plant around. He only started calling as algae. The earlier figures, some other name they have called, but in uh, 1754, Linnaeus called algae in his uh, general plant around. Later on, so many people they have started their work and the present algae given by uh, juices. He only the person called it as a algae. Uh, Lam Rocks, then uh, C. Uh, C. A. Agar, and H. A. Harvey, the modern uh, uh, phycologist. Uh, then uh, E. F. Fridge, he is a person, he has made a very good uh, book that is called, that is in two volume, uh, Structure and Reproduction of Algae. 
in 1935 and 45 he has published two volumes of book that only still we are following that is our uh, main part that is whether it is uh, green sorry fresh water algae or uh, marine water algae or is micro or macro water it may be we are following the uh, fe fritsch uh, book that is called structure and reproduction of uh, algae yes uh, uh, took more than uh, 20 years to publish this book our indian phytologist m o payagar who is the father of indian um algology and this was dikshit anand uh, anand mishra uh, rn singh and this is jaisingh achari and narayan and his, um, k s srinivasan who has worked as a scientist in patan sarva of india uh, rs ratnan and uh, uh, hd kumar bharadwaj ms radha uh, j n mishra uh, b n uh, prasad he worked a lot in andaman equivalence as freshwater algae for freshwater algae and v krishnamurthy who has surveyed the entire uh, Uh, Indian coastline and uh, other islands also, and he has published two. Uh, uh, that means uh, two groups. That is green algae and uh, brown algae. He has uh, given uh, two volumes of brown algae and one volume of uh, green algae. And recent uh, years, he has published two volumes of red algae. In that, he has given all description everything. But the only problem is now the collections. The collection means. Uh, Uh, all over the uh, indian coastal region uh, as per the uh, bsa scenario only uh, in gujarat only part of the place we have covered because uh, 2020 had been there and only part of the uh, places only have, i could cover then maharashtra only our uh, phd scholar uh, sonali bindrakar cs covered only the malwan coastal region then uh, in our study myself and uh, dr sudhir kumar yadav we have surveyed goa karnataka uh, kerala tamil nadu And one of my scholar, myself, we covered Andaman River, sorry, this Andhra Pradesh, and we left out uh, Orissa. This Orissa is so far we are not touched, uh, and uh, this are uh, presently Sunil Kumar Yadav started his collection in West Bengal. So that means uh, out of nine states, we have covered uh, seven states fully, and uh, one state that means in um, uh, this one, Gujarat and uh, Maharashtra and Orissa. This is uh, Orissa is fully not covered. Uh, that means not touched. Uh, But this is Orissa, uh, sorry, this is Gujarat and uh, Maharashtra. Uh, for that means thirty percent of the place we have covered so far. The remaining place has to be had to be uh, survey and we have to document the uh, marine mineral uh, resources. The contributors of the Indian researchers, the initial starting from Yamal Payagar, he has uh, initially started in uh, 1960, uh, 27 edition. He published a very good uh, uh, book on um, uh, uh, this uh, flora of. Uh, Kusra Island. This is the first uh, publication from our Indian uh, coastal region. After that, Mishra he has published uh, Fair Fish of India. Srinivasan, everyone knows the fight of India. I can say Indian marine algae. Two volumes. That is in nineteen sixty nine and seventy three. He has published two volumes. Very good drawings. Then Chinnabato. He has uh, surveyed uh, so many places. That is in Andhra Pradesh and um, your uh, Tamil Nadu coastal region. Then Lachadiv. So he has published uh, so many uh, papers, and this is actually sir, you very well you know that is Roda Paisi Part One and Two. They have written very nicely. Then P C Silva, nineteen sixty nine. He has compiled a lot of literature and brought some of you are Sri Lanka and uh, these other places, all uh, other places also he has covered. But here we have to check out what are the species available in our Indian coastal region that has been. Then Krishnan Sir has published. Already I told you that is green algae as well as a brown algae. That is in two volumes, total three volumes. Green algae one volume, brown algae two volumes. Uh, then uh, Shahu et al. They have published uh, uh, series of Indian coastal region. But this also only a few pages only they have surveyed and they have brought a very good book. But they have uh, compiled with others work also here. Then was on Jayadi when I was in Central uh, uh, Marine Chemical Chemical Research Institute. That time they have compiled that uh, all literatures. They brought out an eight hundred body worth species that time. Then Jha et al. After that, the colorful picture of uh, only the Gulf of Kutch area and remaining part only they have surveyed and they have given one hundred ninety uh, taxa, ninety taxa. Then after that, uh, uh, Peter Nawar and Gupta they have compiled all the literature. They brought out a checklist of Indian marine algae, uh, comprised of eight hundred sixty five species. They composed myself and. Uh, Hello, Mitra. We have surveyed. Uh, that means in uh, Gulf of Kutch area, 
uh, and they sent the person to the BSC SRC Coimbatore. There we identified, and we have uh, totally 151 species were there in that. So we have brought out a very good uh, pictorial guide. So that is useful for the identification very nicely. After that, myself and uh, Sumit Kumar Yadav and uh, G S Murthy, we have uh, covered the entire coast line of uh, Kerala coast, and we. Uh, totally 147 species we have recorded in a very particular area, but earlier only 80 species they have recorded the earlier peoples, uh, that is uh, CSM, uh, CSM and CSM peoples, they have surveyed, they have done only 80 species, but our survey, that means Patel Survey of India, because our survey is in all season, because they want only the economically important seaweeds, but our side, the entire area we have to cover in different seasons, in uh, different localities. So that's why we could uh, collect more species and uh, that is, that's why uh, you see the 80 species and we have recorded 147 species. That means we thorough surveyed and we have given uh, all the species what are recorded there. You know, that, and we have uh, very good uh, herbarium also in central, uh, CS, sorry, in MHA. We have almost 12,000 uh, specimens we have uh, uh, pressed and we are, at present we are having uh, 12,000 herbarium seeds available in uh, that is in a southern region center, Payamutu. So, everyone knows the Indian coastal length and breadth, already told you, covered by Arabian Sea in the west coast and the Bay of Bengal in the east coast in a, a southern region Indian Ocean. Now, only 80%, but it gives you 200 to uh, 20 to 20 percent of that. Uh, this Andaman, Agarbal uh, Alliance, and Lachit, you know, it is giving uh, more species diversity. But in Indian coastal region, uh, this uh, Maha, this one, um, um, Gulf of Manar and Gulf of Kutch, these are the places one has to visit and you have to collect the samples because these are the places, these are the places you lot of uh, uh, diversity, that means diversity is more in these two places and Andaman Nicobar so now it is more than 244 species because that, uh, with the literatures, one of our uh, well-known person, that is his name is Kartikayan, he is working in uh, uh, Pondicherry uh, University. So he has collected the literature and studied. But our uh, collections, uh, it is source only uh, 150 species, but in the literature, that means uh, some other collections and other peoples they have recorded. Uh, so that they have compared and the 200 part of piece they have given. But in original collection, we could uh, collect only 150 plus only we can uh, able to identify in that. So these are some uh, status of the seaweeds reported in Indian coastal regions. West Bengal it is only 14 only and uh, I think now the Sushrit Mariana is uh, taking over and he may be uh, adding more uh, species and Orissa only 21 or so far uh, recorded but when we are starting our collection definitely it will be cross more than 50 species and Andhra Pradesh, our Andhra Pradesh it is 80 earlier but our collection it is showing 134 species. Tamil uh, earlier it is uh, 421 with, with the literature only, not uh, specimens, but uh, I, uh, I have collected the specimens and I have identified 212, uh, 222 species. Then uh, Kerala, we have given 144, 147 and Karnataka, our collection, 108 species, earlier only 70 species. In Goa, our only marine ecology 98, but all together they have uh, 144 species, Perira uh, and Almeida, that means micro, macro and freshwater, all together they have uh, given 145. In Gujarat, 198. Only Kachi itself. I joined with uh, the Green Foundation people. 151 species we have recorded. In Andaman Nicobar, uh, 244. But our side, 112 species. And Lachadiv, 111. But uh, that has to be uh, fully covered by DSI. Then Dave and Raman, only in nine, uh, the 70 species were there. Then remaining, uh, sorry, 90 species. Remaining place, these are the Places we have covered, the green cover area entirely covered, that the brown area, so that means the brown area we have to get to be covered. But in Andaman Nicobar Islands, only 30% of the area covered, but Lachadip so far we say not uh, touching. So that is, that's why we have to uh, cover the entire places and we have to bring out all the placements and we have to identify, then we have to uh, full-fledged floor of marine mammal floor of India, we have to bring out. Because now we are uh, writing with the other sources, but once you are collecting all the photographs and uh, sorry, the specimens and photographs, once you are interpreting with the floor of a management floor of India, it will be very nice and it will be useful for the future people, so for future researchers. So, once you are for this uh, collection flow chart, first you have to study the pro program and you have to go for collection, then preservation, uh, microscope study, then uh, description, then herbarium uh, consultation, then the uh, reference of uh, 
online resources then you have to go for identification then you have to make a flora so this uh, these are the uh, uh, items you have to follow one by one so these are the cultural materials then collection you have to go like this only the collection melanotrophic flora the melanotrophic collection is very very difficult so it is not that easy for our uh, Uh, angels also there is tertiary plants, but this marine plant is very very little because waves are any time it will come high and take out to the sea. So it is very uh, uh, you have to take uh, precautions for the collections and all. So these are the collection methods you have to go for collections. Then then because the only the problem is here for the marine plant for marine plant only we have to press in a field itself. Otherwise it is very difficult because within a day it will decay because that much degraded specimens. So there is a in field itself we have to. Correct. We have to wash it, and then also we have to make a barium, and we have to change the clothes daily, daily, and we have to get dry very uh, nicely, and we have to prepare a barium. And two men, two methods we have preparing. One is wet method, another one is dry method. Dry method is your hydrolysis, and wet method is liquid method. For that is our laboratory purpose. We have to do it that way. So, uh, so dry method I already told you this wet method. Four percent formalin, alcohol one percent, then sea water remaining ninety percent filtered sea water. So with this only we have the liquid method we are preparing. So these are the uh, characters you have to take for your identification of marine micro algae. Then in the Gulf of Tonga, there is uh, uh, this uh, Gujarat coast only. The longest coast in our Indian coast there is more than 160 uh, 6,000 kilometers. 1,600, 1,600 kilometers. Sorry. Okay. Then this is the next area, Gujarat coast. So Gujarat coast, so many places there. There uh, is Jamnagar and uh, um, uh, Narar coast region. And you are uh, this one, Bokta, Dwarka, uh, Kol Bandar. And um, uh, <coughs> uh, one there, these are the places, very good places. You have to collect the specimens, and it is really very wonderful place for the seaweed collections. Then in uh, Maharashtra coast region, so many places are there. Uh, Malwani is very nice place for the seaweed collections, and uh, Ratnagiri and other places are very good for the seaweed collections. When you are coming to the Goa coast region, two districts, eh, and another district and southern districts, in this one, uh, so many places are there, very good collections. Then this is uh, Kerala plus uh, Kannada fossils in the Karwar some other places now. So there are very good uh, collections we will get it. Eh? And in this uh, in the in this area is uh, good for the collections. That means in uh, uh, Kannada fossil uh, uh, is nice place for the uh, civil collections. Sir, 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 director is uh, want to conclude your speech. Yeah, okay. Uh, sir, uh, okay, sir. These are the uh, uh, Kerala fossil region. So we thoroughly uh, collected the Kerala civils. And this is a Tamil Nadu coastal region. We have covered the entire Tamil Nadu coastal. Here I have collected uh, more than two hundred and twenty-two uh, species. Uh, so uh, here also we get so many uh, additions also. And uh, this is our uh, Andhra coastal region. We have collected one hundred and thirty-four species in uh, uh, Andhra coastal region. So what else we have to be uh, do? Then this Bengal now Sudhir Maria Dave is doing. So we will we will increasing. So these are the species available in Indian coastal region. So <coughs> But same as I am showing all these species, so these red algae. So these are the places I told you already. Sections of uh, massive diversity of marine micro algae from uh, west, uh, Oka, Dwarka, Veerawal, uh, this um, this Karwar, uh, <coughs> and then this Alapi, uh, Kuyon, uh, Valencium, then Kanya Kumari, Chuchikoyin, uh, Mandavam, my Gulf of Manar area. So this Mandavam and all the rest of it. Then uh, uh, Pine the Kalimar. the mahabali from chennai uh, pulikat lake visakhapatnam this uh, uh, chilka lake and your uh, other places so you get a plenty of all that means in india or india coastal region these are the places in andaman islands and lachit also very good uh, uh, seal populations and the diversity is there sir already i given the percentage of the marine micro in indian coastal region the one percent is in uh, west bengal another one percent is in orissa andhra pradesh is 22% Uh, then Tamil Nadu is that side. Tamil Nadu is Tamil Nadu is twenty two percent. Andhra Pradesh seven percent. Eight percent Kerala and six percent Karnataka. Seven percent Goa. Thirteen percent Maharashtra. Ten percent Gujarat. Sorry, Pandey is two percent. Thirteen percent Andaman Eco Islands and six percent Lakshadweep and four percent Dayu. And in uh, this is Gujarat is almost it is. Uh, At twenty percent here, it is showing ten percent, but it is only the Gulf of Kutch only added. But if the entire coastal region is added, no, it is twenty percent. The all over Indian uh, coastal regions. This is the percentage of the marine micro algae occurring in the Indian coastal region. Uh, Numerical uh, account of the dominant species. So alba, ketomarpa, codium, kalapa, uh, halimida, and uh, kalapa, uh, kalapa, 
it is a green algae when you are coming to the brown algae dictyota banana sargassum terpenia these are dominant species when you are coming to the uh, red algae uh, this is lagora hypnia this one hypnia aluminia uh, grassleria ceramium lorenz these are the uh, dominant species available in the coastal regions and then endemic species are available in the coastal regions and 25 species are endemic so these are uh, फार्मी and the biofuel extraction and food industries pharmaceutical companies and other purpose we are using for uh, using our uh, civil uh, civil as a um, uh, raw material and we are extracting lot of chemicals as well as uh, um, we were pharmaceuticals and um, other products we are getting from the marine microalgae and the threats also there for marine microalgae lot of threats are there with the pollution climate change aquatic uh, uh, cultivation the uh, this one and uh, then you were um, uh, fishery uh, uh, pollution and all other things giving and uh, tourism and uh, construction of the buildings are in coastal uh, area it is giving lot of habitat uh, to the uh, marine microalgae then how to conserve these are the conservation you have to go for uh, cultivation and uh, laboratory studies and uh, uh, production of the uh, some places so in that way we have to conserve conserve the marine microal uh, habitats So these are cultivation status and all. Our Indian coastal region. So these are um, uh, byproducts from uh, getting from the uh, marine microalgae. These are the techniques how to uh, extract the marine microalgae uh, byproducts. Then completed projects from our uh, BSI uh, marine microalgae. This is the civil service Magadhma Marine National Park, South Andaman. Civil service Siria Tapu North Bay, Waipar Islands, South Andaman. Civil service Tamil Nadu, some some Nadu states, and the civil service Kerala. South East Coast of uh, India, then civil service of Karnataka, civil service of Goa, uh, marine microalgae of uh, India is going on now, and then this algal uh, project, uh, Andhra Pradesh uh, is going on. So already we have published a uh, lot of papers uh, in uh, in our uh, research work the last twenty uh, uh, years now. We have brought more than fifty uh, papers all over the Indian coastal region, and the publications uh, already uh, so as per the BSA publication uh, by uh, Vital India that is Vital South. Uh, two volumes sir has given very good uh, uh, color paper sir this drawings uh, okay sir you have sir yes published two volumes that is uh, 60 and uh, 973 then after that two three volumes of uh, all of india uh, pratibha gupta and uh, rk gupta and uh, rao sir they have published uh, myself and uh, sudhir kumar yadav civil uh, service of kerala coastal region we have published then after that uh, some uh, identification manual also i have, I have published uh, uh for this uh hypothesis uh, project uh, and scovin also we have published uh, on the marine microalgae flora of uh, yes, a marine microalgae uh, uh this andhra pradesh so i have conducted a workshop two workshop uh, on marine microalgae flora of uh, uh workshop on marine microalgae flora uh, marine microalgae algae the, that is more than uh, all over india we have collected the more than 50 candidates we have given very good training a correction uh, identification how to prepare a herbaria how to cultivate the seeds all we have taken Uh, to the marine microbes of Manar, we have training. And we visited so many institutions uh, for extraction purpose. Uh, so it is very nice uh, program. And everyone was uh, interested to uh, participate in again and again. And that means in different colleges. Uh, so they want uh, uh, the training program. So in future, if you are giving, definitely they will come and attend. Uh, then they will get the identification and uh, other uh, aspects also of the marine microalgae. then uh, future uh, scope of bsi uh, only 70% of the questions are covered so far and 30% has yet to be covered and initially studies has to be taken on the molecular approaches must be extended for the uh, doubtful taxa of marine microalgae attention on the endemic seaweeds taxa of india uh, promote uh, promotion of cultivation and conservation of economically important seaweeds which will avoid the over exploitation of seaweeds uh, from natural habitats very uh, tough data as uh, uh, The creation of database and the flora of marine mammals is very very important. GSI, uh, GSI, uh, sorry, uh, mapping study is very very important for the entire Indian coastal region. GSI mapping study and it take awareness program uh, on the marine mammal diversity and it how it is uh, giving a uh, 
uh, uh, uh, this uh, uh, conserving the uh, that means accumulating the uh, uh, how it is helpful to the ecological parameters. So that we have to uh, give awareness to the public uh, and we have to uh, educate to the peoples and bio profiling of the marine microalgae has to be uh, covered. So with this I am uh, concluding because time comes, uh, this one only I have uh, <laughs> Okay. Okay. I am concluding my session like this. With this, we have come to an end of today's technical session. Thank you so much for the kind cooperation. With this, we have come to the end. Thank you so much for the kind cooperation. With this, we have come to the end. With this, we have come to the end. It is requested to uh, join tomorrow at sharp 10:30 a.m. for the second international webinar. Thank you, everyone.